Hey folks, the um, adventure that you're about to embark on is a five hour long double header webinar, two and a half hours over two days that I did for Blackmagic on the A10 Mini and pieces of its ecosystem. There's chapter markers below, but if you find something specific that you think should be bookmarked, then please let me know in a comment with the timestamp and I'll add it to the official chapter list. This is the second time I've done this long format webinar for Blackmagic. The first one, also linked below, has some overlap, but also some additional pieces that aren't in this one, such as Chroma King. So if you have the time, of course, watch both, but start here. Listen, one other thing before we get started. I'm trying something new on this channel. Well new, depending on when you're watching this. And there's no guarantee that it'll stick, but here's the deal. I don't know about you, but I really dislike being interrupted by ads when watching YouTube videos. But you know, a guy's got to make a living. So here's what I propose. Starting with this video, I'm turning off ads entirely. No ads on this video at all. What I ask in return if you feel like you gained something from my channel is to become a channel member. I've enabled several tiers starting at just 99 cents. If my content is worth a buck a month to you, please subscribe. If it's not, that's cool. You can still watch it just like everyone else. But if you like my content and you feel like not seeing ads, then maybe that's worth a buck or more. There's other tiers as well, if you feel so inclined. Okay, that's enough of that. I'll remind you that this was a live webinar with live Q&A and it wasn't always seamless. You'll see some mistakes, some misfires and some technical glitches, but you know, hey, that's live, baby. All right, here's five hours of Blackmagic ATEM goodness. Let's get into it. All right, everybody, welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to a Blackmagic webinar on the ATEM. I am your host, Photo Joseph. And before we get too far into this, let's just make sure that everything is loud and clear. Gary, who's on the line with me, if you want to let me know that we are 5x5 five five or 9x9 nine nine or 12x40 or whatever it's supposed to be. Whoa, suddenly you got very loud in my ear. All right, let me turn that down. I don't know how that happened. But excellent. Good. We are good to go. Fantastic. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending today. So this is the, uh, this is the basic plan. We've got a two-day webinar. There's going to be two hours with some wiggle room today. We've booked three hours on the calendar, but it's marketed as two. And so we'll just see. I just want to make sure we had enough room for Q&A and all that good stuff if we go a little bit late. And then we'll be repeating tomorrow. Tomorrow's not a repeat, though. Just of the time. Tomorrow is a whole separate piece. So let us let me go through some quick little slides to run through the agenda so you know what to expect, what's going to be in store for you for the next couple of days. And then we're just going to jump into the meat of this. So with that said, let's see if I got my slide set up right. I, the setup for this is... It's kind of whack. It's it's pretty cool. Um, and I think at the end, I'll kind of go through the whole thing that went into building all this because it is it's fun what you can do live. And basically everything here is black magic hardware, you know, not the computers, obviously. But um, but yeah. All right. Well, let's just get into my little slides here showing up the side by side. Here we go of what's going on. So um, ATEM workshop by Photo Joseph. That's me. You can see the date at the bottom. So if you're watching this later, this is when it was recorded. Uh, today is Thursday, October 21st. All right, here's the format of the show, the plan of attack. I want your questions. I absolutely want your questions throughout it. You're in a Zoom webinar. There are two different modules that you can use. There is a Q&A module and a chat module. If you have questions for me, drop them into the Q&A module. Gary, who has joined us from Blackmagic and is on the line, he will be coming on to, uh, to ask me your questions. So he'll be kind of going through those and maybe refining them, maybe aggregating them. So maybe your question exactly won't get asked the way it was, but if a few people ask roughly the same question, he'll reformat that and present that to me. So we'll be going to Gary for questions uh, throughout the webinar, throughout the presentation today. If you just have chit chat, you guys want to talk amongst yourselves, by all means, please do use the chat module for that. Um, there will be occasional water breaks, potentially. It's only two hours. Last time we did this, it was four plus. We'll see how it goes today. But if I break out of here for a minute, that's okay. You'll know. Um, the agenda for today, first off, introduction to ATEM. So I want to say as well that there's going to be, if you saw the one that I did in June, I think it was, that was four plus hours all just straight through the kind of marathon adventure, that one, um, I'm going to be repeating some of that, but I'm also going to be doing some of the things I didn't have time for then and taking a few slightly different approaches to a few things. So 
Some of this will be repeated if you have seen that June webinar, and some of it will not. But regardless, I'm going to be starting off with the basics, explaining what the hardware is and how it works and so on. So that's going to be the starting point. Then we'll go into setup and switching basics. I'm just going to show you, we're going to be using primarily the ATEM Mini Extreme ISO here, and I'm going to show you how to do some basic configuration, how to set things up, how to set your inputs, um, how to switch cameras, that sort of thing. We will have audio basics. We'll be going into audio basics. I didn't really touch on audio much at all last time. So we'll be spending a little bit more time in there looking, uh, talking about audio. We're going to talk a little bit about multi-screen options. I'm not going to go super deep into this one because that is something I covered quite a bit in the other one. Plus, I've done quite a few videos on this on my YouTube channel. But we will, of course, get into some of the basics of that. We're also going to go into macros a little bit. Again, not go super crazy deep because it's, I mean, you could have a four hour webinar just on macros. So we're not going to go super crazy there, but we are going to talk about macros as well. And we're also going to talk about camera control, which is a pretty cool thing that you can do with the, uh, with the Blackmagic hardware if you have the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema cameras. So we'll take a look at some of that, uh, some of that capability on here. And that's day one. That's today. Tomorrow, we'll be getting into ISO recording and B-RAW recording. So this means if you have multiple Blackmagic Pocket Cinema cameras, how you can record B-RAW in those while simultaneously recording the ISO stream from the Blackmagic, uh, from the ATEM itself. So we'll be going into all that and we'll even show you in Resolve how to make that connection back to the source in B-RAW. That's tomorrow's agenda. We will be, so tomorrow's gonna be a lot of kind of external pieces. Tomorrow we'll also talk about the Hyperdex, both used as recording and playback modules and how those can tie into the ATEM ecosystem. We will talk about the ATEM streaming bridge, which is actually how Gary is calling into me today. He is streaming his signal to me over the streaming bridge, and I'm pulling that into my ATEM. We'll be talking about that. We'll talk about the web presenter HD and 4K, which Curiously, you don't actually need if you're using any of the ATEM models that have built-in encoding on them, but it is an interesting component to talk about uh, for different types of workflows that you might want to use, so we'll, we'll be getting into that as well. Also, third-party stuff tomorrow, I'm going to talk about BitFocus Companion, which is a free open source service, software service that runs on your computer that allows you to control all kinds of things, including the ATEM. And with that, you can do some really awesome stuff as far as controlling multiple things, even multiple ATEMs, multiple hardware at once with a single button touch. So I'm gonna be talking about that and that's actually how I'm running all the switching for today's show is through that and the Elgato Stream Deck. I've got one sitting right here. All of my buttons on this are running through Companion and are all programmed to do all the different things that I need them to do. So we'll be talking about that tomorrow. And then we'll also be, tomorrow be talking about Mimo Live, which is a third-party app that runs on your Mac. And it allows you to do all kinds of switching and stuff on its own. But the way that I'm using it is that I'm using it to generate titles, do screen sharing, do all kinds of cool things from that, and then sending that signal out over the Ultra Studio 4K Mini, which actually the coolest thing about that is I can do what's called a dual stream SDI, where I get both a um, a picture, a fill, and a, a mat. So I get things like this. I can bring up where we've got, well, now it's on text on top of it, but I've got a little logo that pops up on the screen that is being run by that through the dual SDI link setup. So that is that agenda. All right, with that said, let me, um, let's get out of this, go back to this view. Let me give you a very brief tour of the setup today, and then we're going to start going into the ATEM itself. So uh, let's see here, get this all set. So we've got the A camera, this wide camera that we're on right now. I'm, going to be, I'm doing all the switching myself, and so I may end up not doing a lot of switching to some of these angles because, you know, this is the main one. We've got a tight one there if I get bored and just want to switch camera angles there. I also have an overhead camera, which is going to be important for showing some of the stuff that's happening down here. I've got a close-up camera so we can see the back of the ATEM and anything I want to hold down here and show you up close. We'll do that. And then I've got a side view, which doesn't show much right now because this stuff is deliberately turned off. We're going to be coming back to that as we go. Um, and then we're going to, we have got my computer hooked up and there's a bunch of other things plugged in as well. But that is how all that goes. So we are going to be starting off with the introduction to the ATEM itself. And for, for that, the way I'm going to start this is by explaining the lineup, the different ATEM hardware devices that you have the option to get into. And, and then we're going to get into a tour of the actual hardware itself. So let me get my slides up here. Um, here we go. And this is, this is just the Blackmagic website. Um, just to show you the five current ATEM minis. 
Now, note I specifically pointed out these are the ATEM minis because there's a whole other ATEM lineup as well. We're, we're working with the ATEM minis today on camera. I'm actually running one of the larger ATEMs in the background that's kind of behind the scenes of all this. But everything that we talk about today, well, maybe not everything, but most things we talk about today uh, will work across all the ATEMs. However, we are specifically going to be working with one of the ATEM minis. So we've got the ATEM Mini, Mini Pro, Mini Pro ISO, Extreme, and the Extreme ISO. So just to kind of um, to go through the lineup, so at $300, this is the most base model. This is the one that started it all. And I will, I will say that this was, when this came out, it was revolutionary. At this price point, nothing existed at this $300 price point that allowed you to do the switching and has scalers built in. If you go back two plus years ago now and you watch the original video that I did on this, my mind was like completely blown the whole time because we had scalers on each input. And what this means is that you can feed in different sizes and frame rates of video into the ATEM and the ATEM will scale them accordingly to whatever you need. So you can choose in the ATEM whether you're doing a 1080 show at uh, 24 frames per second or 30 and so on. And so you can change that in the hardware. But the fact that you can have them scaled, have all the inputs scaled, that was huge. And I recognize that for today, you're looking at it, you're like, okay, so it just scales, whatever, no big deal, right? You have to understand that prior to that, you could spend well over $500 on a single scaler. And this had four of them built in. It was only $300. So this was a real shift in the industry when this happened. And then Blackmagic just kept on adding things after that. So the next step was the ATEM Mini Pro. And what this added was the ability to live stream from the ATEM itself. So you could actually stream to YouTube, Facebook, whatever, from the hardware itself. It added the ability to record your show with an attached USB drive, and it gave you something called multi-view. And multi-view is when you see all the different inputs into your camera at once. So that was an absolutely huge step up. And then the next step up was the ISO, the ATEM Mini Pro ISO, which only really added one thing, but it was an absolutely huge thing to add, and that was the ability to record all of your inputs simultaneously. And that's what we have today, this ATEM uh, Mini Extreme ISO, uh, the bigger version of this, but you have the ability to, to record all of your inputs at once. Not only record all your inputs and your program, by the way, your program is the actual show that the audience sees, but you also got a get a XML file that opens up in DaVinci Resolve that has all of your camera angles on it. And this is something we're going to be looking at tomorrow, but that was added with that, uh, with that ISO version. And then Blackmagic went and upped the game again, and they added two more to the lineup, the ATEM Mini Extreme and the Extreme ISO. They, first of all, added more inputs, so it doubled from four to eight inputs, but then it also, and the difference between these two being this one records the ISO streams and this one does not, it's really the only difference between them. Um, but not only did you get more inputs, you gained quite a few features, but one of the most important ones is something called SuperSource. And SuperSource is the ability to position multiple elements on screen wherever you want. Without it, you're limited to a picture-in-picture, -picture, which you can get pretty creative with how you do a picture-in-picture, -picture, but with SuperSource, you could have multiple inputs at once, four inputs at once that you can position anywhere on screen, plus a backplate uh, that you can have in the background that you can have in there as well. So it's really five things on screen at once. And then you can actually add upstream keys on top of that if you want to get really crazy. But all of that is possible in the extreme. So if you think about a program like, you know, Gary, don't worry about switching on your audio, but I'm just going to switch over to you for a moment here. Like here I have a layout where it's me and Gary on screen. This is super source. And you'll see that my position has moved off to the side and it's cropped and it's got a little border and we're bringing Gary in as well. And that is built through super source. So that's something that got added to the extreme. So there's the basic lineup of those models. And then if you scroll down farther on this webpage, then you get into the really big boys. So the ATEM 1ME, 2ME, and 4ME. This 2ME is what I'm running on right now. This is my main production uh, system. It is a 4K capable. It's got, a, what is it, 20 inputs in it. It's, you know, awesome. And then you got the Constellation, which is even bigger, that has... Uh, what is it, 40? I guess it's 40 inputs. If that's 20, this one must be 40 inputs. And it can handle 8K video. So if you're doing 8K productions. And then you got things like these boards that can control them, which is, I mean, can you imagine sitting in front of this thing? It's uh, like my dad used to say, it looks like Darth Vader's bathroom. What are you going to do with all these buttons? But it's pretty impressive to have this kind of control. And then, you know, if you just want to go super big, you can go for the full-on 4ME advanced panel. I mean, seriously, I think I'd have a heart attack sitting in front of that. But this is, this is the ATEM lineup. So it starts, and this is the you know, crazy impressive part, it starts at $300. Yes, okay, fine. The Constellation 8K is $10,000, and the 
the Formi Advanced Panel is another $19,000, but it starts down here at a little baby price of 300 bucks. So that is, like, all of that is just crazy awesome that you have this. And as you upgrade, the fun part is about these, if you do buy a smaller one and you upgrade, you don't necessarily have to get rid of the old ones, you can tie them together. So literally today's presentation is being run through so I got an ATEM Mini on my desk. I got an ATEM Mini in the rack. I got an ATEM 2ME in the rack. So those are the three that I normally, for everyday production, am using. And then, of course, we have the fourth one, the ATEM Mini Extreme ISO that I'm sitting on the desk here. So there's there are definitely ways to tie them all together that get um, that get pretty cool. Okay, so there's kind of the overview of, of what they are, uh, of, of the lineup. Um, let's go into this one specifically and talk about the different inputs on it. We're going to start with what you feed into it. So looking at the back here, the uh, row you can see there are one through eight of the inputs themselves or the HDMI inputs. So let's just kind of talk about that for a moment, stepping back a little bit, a overall picture of what this hardware is. I would imagine anybody watching this at this point knows what the whole point of all this is, but just to be sure we're all on the same page, the idea behind the ATEM at its core is that it is a switcher, a live video switcher. You feed in live video inputs from cameras, from computers, from wireless inputs, from anything you want, anything that has an HDMI out can be fed into however many inputs you have. So on a small one, four, on this one, eight, on the really big ones, 20 or 40. You're feeding in that input, and then you're switching. I want to see camera one, camera two, camera three, camera four. You're just switching between all those inputs. That's what the ATEM is at its core. On top of that, it's things like audio control and the picture-in-picture -picture and the scaling and the super source and all that other stuff. But at its core, that is basically what it is. It is a switcher. So you feed in one input, feed in two inputs, feed in three inputs, and switch between them. That's what we get out of this. Okay, so with that said... Now, looking at these inputs, this one has eight of them that you can feed in and switch to. The ATEM Mini Extreme, let's just start all the way over here. Um, if we look at the left-hand side, you can see, that's my left, you can see there's a headphone jack and two microphone inputs on there. So let's talk about that for a moment. The headphone jack was also something that was added to the Extreme, does not exist on the smaller ones. The headphone jack allows you to monitor your program program being what is going out to the audience. We, when we get into the audio setup, we'll talk a little bit more about it because you can actually solo any individual input. But the idea here is that you can hear what's on air. At this point, you're not talking about using it as you yourself on air. This is more like I'm running a live show. I'm not on air. I'm running the show that's over there. Plug in the headphones and I can hear everything that's happening to ensure that my audience is hearing what I expect them to hear. The quality is good. They're getting the right inputs, et cetera, et cetera. So having that headphone jack is super important. Now, I will say that on the smaller ATEMs that don't have a headphone jack, it doesn't mean you're working silently. What it means is that you have to plug your headphones into the monitor. We have an HDMI output and we're going to come to that. You would have to monitor the audio through that monitor. I hate that we use both words for the, the same word for two things, but you would monitor the audio on the video monitor. How's that sound? Um, through that, if you don't have the extreme with the headphone jack. Then there's the two microphone inputs. Um, we can see those as two little microphone inputs there. Those allow you to bring in just audio. So every single video input has audio with it. So every HDMI input can have audio coming in with it. However, if you want separate audio, maybe that's coming from a mixing board, maybe you just want to plug in a mic directly into there, you can do that. Now, I will tell you, just in case we forget to talk about this later, if you, let's say that you plug in a microphone directly into there, and then you've got your camera elsewhere, right? The audio coming in is coming in in real time. The, if you're using a uh, an analog lavalier, or I'm sorry, an analog, say, shotgun mic that is wired, it's XLR, into some mixing board and then into here, that audio is real-time, 100% real-time. If you add an analog wireless microphone, it too is real-time. If you add a digital wireless microphone, it is ever so slightly delayed. Not enough that it would be a problem, but it is going to be ever so slightly delayed. So you've got essentially real-time or just barely, barely off real-time audio coming in. Your video, however, is not real-time. Video is never coming in real time over HDMI. A lot of, any camera that has an HDMI output is not outputting the video in real time. There is time to process that video to get it out for the HDMI port. Now, Blackmagic cameras, fortunately, have the lowest latency of any that I've ever seen. They are virtually real time. They're close enough to real time that you can get away with it. 
but they're not. And this is important to understand if you listen to your own dialogue going through a a black magic camera coming in through here, you will hear it ever so slightly out of phase with your own voice because it is ever so slightly delayed. So if you're using a black magic camera, you probably don't have to worry about it, but if you're using any other HDMI camera that has a longer delay, it could be a couple of frames, it could be four frames, it could be seven frames, just depends on the camera. If you bring that video into the ATEM and your audio comes in in real time, they will be out of sync. And so you have to bring them into sync and you have the ability to do that. And we will show that when we get into the audio setup. But the easiest way to do it is to simply run your audio through the camera with the video. So that way the video and the audio are set in sync by the camera and sent out together. That is the easiest way to keep everything in sync. But I wanted to point that out because if you are bringing in audio directly onto the microphone inputs, you will have to adjust sync. You can either do it in the ATEM or if you're using a big mixing board, most mixing boards have that capability. In fact, the way that I'm doing this production right now, so I'm wearing a lavalier, a wireless lavalier microphone. It's plugged into a mix pre over in my rack, which has then got some noise processing happening to it. And then it sends an output through another mixer don't ask, but um, it's just the way it's set up, through another mixer and eventually into the ATEM where it gets picked up by here. I have to add a delay somewhere in there. I'm actually doing it in the mix pre. I think it's 133 milliseconds. I think that's the timing that I've programmed into the mix pre to get the delay so it's in sync and hopefully everything looks like it's in sync to you. So that's, that is one way of handling it. So I'm getting kind of advanced there, but that is you know one way to do that. Okay, back to the hardware itself. So the was the headphone input, uh, headphone output, the mic inputs, the eight video inputs, and then you'll see here two HDMI outs, one and two. This is another thing that was added to the extreme is a second HDMI output. The smaller ones, let me actually grab a smaller one here. Let's go back to this view. The smaller one here, you can see this has four inputs and one HDMI output. And then you can also see there's no headphone jack on there. This is, by the way, the, this is the ATEM, oops, uh, there it is. This is the ATEM Mini Pro ISO, so the um, the top of the line of the smaller one. So you can see it's a pretty significant size difference in there. Um, all right, so back to this. Um, I felt like something just changed. Um, so the HDMI output on the little one can be, well, actually on both of them, you can set the outputs to be whatever you want. You can set it to be the multi-view, which you're gonna see in a moment. That's where you see all of your inputs at once. You can set it to be the program, which is what the audience is seeing, or you can set it to be any one of the inputs. So if you just want a close-up of camera two, you can tell it to output camera two. With just one input, this is perfectly fine if you are doing a show where you're live streaming from the ATEM, so the audience is getting your program out over the internet connection, and then you're looking at the multi-view on the monitor. If, however, you're doing more like a local production, I'm doing, I'm live switching, let's say, at a house of worship, and I've got, I'm doing live switching, and it's for the breakout room or the overflow room, whatever, and I want to have the multi-view in front of me, but then I want to run an HDMI cable out to a projector or something in the other room, you didn't have that capability with the smaller ones with only one output. With the larger ATEMs with the dual HDMI outputs, you can choose to have multi-view on one monitor, on one output, and program on the other. And you can switch it up however you want. So that's where those two come in very, very handy indeed. Then we've got two USB ports. So again, two USB ports, whereas on the smaller ATEM, you have one USB port. So USB port can be used to do two things. It can be used to either be a USB output into your computer, meaning that your computer thinks that the ATEM is a webcam. And this is how you use an ATEM to switch video for a Zoom call, a Skype call, something like that, which is roughly what we're doing here. My setup's a bit different, but this is roughly what we're doing here. This is a Zoom webinar. You are seeing the input from an ATEM. Again, a little bit different than the USB, but that is effectively what it would be. Um, the other thing that you can do with the USB port is you can use it to record your show. We talked about that a little bit earlier. So you would plug in something like a little Samsung drive. Uh, this is a little, these little solid state guys are perfect for this. So you plug this into the USB port and now you've got a recording of the program. If you have an ISO model, you have the ISOs with all of the switching data and all that. The thing is, you can't use the USB port for both things simultaneously. You can either be sending USB data out to your computer, or it can be sending video out, video file, video data, whatever, out to the connected drive. It can't do both at the same time, which is why on this model, 
we now have two USB ports where they go, two USB ports. So you can have one of them plugged into your computer and one of them plugged into a drive. Next to that, you'll see an Ethernet port. It says ATEM control and then power. The ATEM control, now this is really, really important. This is how you get your, your device on the network, first of all. So this is how you can control it from any computer on the network. Now, you can just go USB into your computer and then run the ATEM software on your computer and control the ATEM. But you can only run it on that one computer. By adding it to the network, I can now access that ATEM from any computer on the local network. You can even, and I've done this, you can even set up a VPN so that someone can VPN into your location, launch the software on their end, and control the ATEM remotely via VPN connection, even though they're, looking, they're running the software locally on their system. Super cool, way advanced workflow than what we're talking about this, uh, today or tomorrow, but that is something that's totally possible. So that is really cool. That means that you could have one person in software controlling sound while somebody else is in software controlling, let's say, graphics. So really, really powerful that you can do that. Plus, if you are live streaming from the hardware itself, then of course that ethernet connection gives you access to the internet so that you can live stream. So all of these from the, um, from the extreme, I'm sorry, from the ATEM Mini Pro model on up have the ability to live stream from the hardware itself that requires a hardware ethernet connection. And I point that out, it requires a hardware connection. There is no Wi-Fi built into these. And I'm sure plenty of people have said, come on guys, build Wi-Fi in. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've never asked why because I think I know the answer to this. It's bad. Wi-Fi, no bueno. You don't want Wi-Fi in a live streaming situation, so why even give you the option? Because what would happen, and I know this from working with tech companies for years, if, uh, if you give the user the ability to do Wi-Fi and they have problems with the Wi-Fi, who are they gonna call? Blackmagic and say, my streaming doesn't work. We're using Wi-Fi? Yeah, well, that's why. Well, why'd you put it in there? So there you go. So there's no Wi-Fi option. You have to go hardwire. I think I can see Gary laughing down there. Uh, you, you just, you've got to go hardwire on this. So that's why it's set up that way. Okay, so there's the inputs. Now let's talk about the, the actual buttons. This, there's a lot of buttons. Let's go to the small one first, actually. Um, if I can set this on here without pushing any buttons on the ATEM itself. There we go. So you have a row of, and this one four, and on the bigger one, eight buttons to switch your camera angle. They're nice and big and easy to hit. And you can see here, they light up red when they're on air. And that allows you to very easily uh, and very quickly switch to which camera is running. Then you have, we'll just do the big one. Then you have a bunch of other buttons that do all kinds of fun things. So these buttons, and I realize this isn't a super close up, so you can't see really closely on here, but um, these are all about audio. You can switch which audio is on. So I can have, let's say, audio simultaneously from all three of these inputs. You have something called audio follows video, where the audio comes on only when you switch to that input. As you see, I switched to the input three and the audio follow video comes on. Then you have, if you're using camera control, you have control over the cameras themselves. And each of these banks of buttons are duplicated for each input. So these buttons here are the same as these here, same as these here, and so on. Then across the top, you've got microphone input controls, so levels in and out, on and off. So if I want audio from mic one or mic two on or off, I can do that. I can adjust their levels on here. And then your headphones, you can mute your headphones. You can adjust the volume on your headphones in here. These all have to do with the picture in picture, the DVEs, all this other stuff, media players and so on that you can load up. Um, there's a ton in here to get into. And while it's awesome to have all this control on here, I think that for most users, as you get into using some of these more advanced settings, it's easier to build a macro to do what needs to happen so that with one button it loads up the right graphic, loads the lower third, does all the things, you know, switches to the right camera angle, does all that with one touch. But you have the absolute ability to be here running a show and go, right, okay, we're, gonna, we're switching, we're going to load up Media Player 2, we're going to do this, put this DVE, set it all up, ready to go, and then take it live. So you can do all of that from the hardware itself here, which is pretty great. If you think about the older I shouldn't say older, the larger ATEMs. We go back to this real quick uh, here. If you, think, if you look at these, these have buttons on the front of them, but these are not meant, these buttons are not for live switching. These are more for controlling the different in and outs on the hardware, but are not meant for live switching. You have to do the switching in software. And once you start clicking things in software, you realize pretty quickly that having a tactile thing to touch becomes a real advantage. So that's where this is a wonderful thing. That's why there are these these huge boards so you can have that big tactile feedback even when you're using these kind of mixers, uh, these kind of uh, audio, uh, video switchers, sorry. And, uh, and having the tactile button is great, 
But as you get more and more advanced, you kind of go back to software where you start adding in all the macros and then eventually add things like the Stream Deck here, which I think, can you see this in my overhead shot? Uh, yeah, you can see my Stream Deck here that I'm, where I'm doing all my switching on. And I know you can't read the buttons on there, but like there's the, you know, the wide shot, the tight shot, that's the over and so on. And so I can see the buttons here and each one of these is triggering some series of, of uh, either macros or commands that are doing multiple things at once with one button. So, fun stuff you can do. And then, let's see here, you have some various picture-picture controls here. The ability to trigger your first six macros from the hardware, which is really, really nice. This is the only, the Extreme is the only hardware that has this. So you have this ability to just go, all right, I need macro number four, and you hit it, and it triggers that macro. That is super, super handy. Then you've got controls over your transitions. So these are our transition types, transition timing. And so if I wanted to go from you know, camera one to camera two, uh, I'd set it put into preview mode. We'll get into that in a bit. And I can choose, you know, set it to wipe and then hit auto and it does the wipe. Oh, I want it to be a two second wipe and you, as a diagonal and you set that and then hit it and it does the transition. So you have control over all of that here. Again, this is really about doing a live show where you're kind of deciding on the fly what to do as opposed to I know I'm always switching from camera A to B to C back to A and I've just got those one inputs ready to go. So it's, you know, different approaches to things. And then finally, this row of buttons here gives you, this controls the output. It says video out. It's the output on video output one, number one, and it allows you to choose what's going out, which is most commonly going to be the multi-view. But then if you go, oh, I want to see, uh, you know, input five, whatever, you can pull that up really quickly. So let's actually start the hardware demo with that. I'm going to start by hooking up a monitor to be multi-view. So I've got, here it is, from the cables. I've got this cable here. I'm going to plug this into, uh, let's see here, this is going to go into lean over and find this thing. There it is, into input one. Okay, I'm not going to, well, I'll just plug that in. As I'm plugging that in, find it, there it is. Let me go to my side shot, and as I plug that in, monitor's probably powered itself off. Let's see. There, there it goes. So now I'm seeing the multi-view from here. So that is what is being powered there. I've actually set up a thing so that I can route this out to you directly, so you can see that directly. What you're actually looking at there, this is kind of one of those cool uses of the dual HDMI outputs, is this little guy right here. This is a Blackmagic converter, SDI to HDMI converter, vice versa. So this is coming out of the second monitor, the second HDMI output, going into this converted to SDI. You see the red SDI cable there. And then that is running into my main switcher where I can switch to it like this. So that gives me the ability to show you that up close. So that's where I'm, how I'm using that second one today. But if we look back to the side view, I also have a big monitor over here so I can see exactly what's going on. You can see there's not a whole lot going on here yet. I don't have anything plugged into it yet. I've got a couple of graphics loaded up and we see some status info here, but that's it. So let's actually, since we're here, why don't we go back to this view and talk about what we are looking at. So across the bottom, there's two media players. Those are graphics that are already loaded. Then you have where it says ISO stop. That is the recording status. So if I'm recording, we'd see that there. And then on the right, we see the streaming status, currently not running, but that is the status of streaming. Then just above that, and I can't point to things because I don't have mouse, it's, you're looking at video out, but if you look at the one that has all those meters on it, nothing's actually bouncing on them because it doesn't have any audio input, but that's where we'd see that. Then you can see cameras one through, um, looks like I kind of messed up my lab, but one, two, three, four, and then it goes back to one, two, and five. Well, whatever, we can fix that. Um, and then a program, so you see the actual program out so you can see what the audience is seeing. That's what multi-view does for you. And of course, we can configure that however you like. Since noted by the fact that I said I messed up setting it up. So we'll go in and we'll, we'll fix that in a moment. So that multi-view is super, super important. So with that said, now let's go ahead and plug in a camera. So we're talking like base, base level setup here. I'm going to use this guy right here. This is the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera uh, 4K. Um, I've got a, let's go back to my overhead view here. So I've got a, um, uh, Panasonic Lumix 10 to 25 millimeter lens on here. Nice, fast lens. This is great. It's 10 to 25 zoom. This is great for stuff like this close up because I've got a super wide angle field of view. And it's plugged into power right now. You don't have to do that to use it. Obviously, it has battery. But I will say anytime you're doing anything live, do yourself a favor. Don't use batteries. Do not use batteries anywhere that you can avoid it. So in this setup right now, the only batteries that I'm relying on are on my wireless packs for my microphone and my monitor. These are the only batteries that I'm on. And 
taking the battery concern out of your live stream is such a relief. It's just, it's so nice to not have to worry about batteries. So this camera, these cameras come with their own power supply, which is super awesome. So just plug it in and, and off you go. Okay, so with that said, let's get this plugged in. Grab an HDMI cable here and plug that in, go to input one and plug this into the camera. So if we look, I'll, I'll bring up a close up shot here. If we look at, I should do it this way. If you look at the, there it is. Oop, can I get that into view? I got this cable in the way. If you look at the side on here, okay, barely can see that. Um, get my hand out of the way so it focuses on the camera. You can see that HDMI input right, right there. You know how hard it is to look at one camera, reach around and try and grab something which is coming from a different angle, like left becomes right. And anyway, uh, you think I'd be used to it by now, but no. So I plug this in and as soon as I do, let's go to the multi-view, you can see now, the view from that. So voila, so there we've got it. We can also see that we're getting audio from here. So you're not hearing the audio from the camera yet. You're hearing my microphone still, which means it might actually be out of sync. Um, but you can see camera one and you can see on the camera one input, the one on the middle left side, you can see the audio meters on there. You can see that those audio meters are bouncing so you know it is getting audio. Okay, so with that said, let me just set this thing up so that I can do stuff with it without holding it. So I'm just, I'm real fancy here, I'm balancing it on a piece of gaff tape. Um, what is that black spot? Oh, I've enabled a, a multi-view. Oops, let's turn that off. Okay. Um, all right. So let's see here. Um, yeah, let's switch over to this. So we are looking at, actually there's something else on there. I don't even know what's running. Give me just a moment here to figure out why I've got some other thing on the screen right now. See here, look, if I go to the extreme, you can see that black spot in there. I'm trying to figure out which, everything else is off. Um, yep, I'm going into software to figure out what is running because I cannot figure that out. Well, this is a great opportunity for me to show you the software interface. So let me fire that up over here and then I'll switch to this screen. And here we go. This is the software version of the hardware. I can do all the same switching in here between camera one, camera two, and so on. So for example, uh, you can see right now, this is set to program as camera one. If I go to the overhead view, you can see it's on camera one there, right? That's lit up. Let me go back to the, oops, back to the software view. And then I will switch this in software to camera four. And then if I go back to the overhead view, you can see that that has changed to camera four. So it's the same control. I'll hit three on here. And now when I go back to the Mac, we see that camera three is running on there. So this is the same control. You touch anything here, it happens in hardware. You touch it in hardware and it happens in here. There's the key that was up on air that was giving me that black spot over the camera. So now I've turned that off. Okay, so let's go back to the multi-view view. And I'm going to now switch actually over so that you're hearing, if I get this right, right. You should, if I did this right, be hearing audio through the camera right now. So it's not gonna be anywhere near as good, but this is just the audio on the camera itself. Uh, Gary, do me a favor, give me a thumbs up that we're actually doing this right. You're hearing me from the camera. Excellent, okay, good. So you're hearing me through there. I have turned off the good microphone, so that's all you're hearing. Now, I don't wanna do a bunch of the show this way because it's not gonna be very good quality, but I do wanna show you, let's get, let's see here, let me go. Hey, this happens to me. I don't know what I say. If I'm at my desk and I go, mm-hmm, and I'm on the phone, Siri goes, yes. Like, I wasn't talking to you. I don't understand. Anyway, so let's, let's go into the software again and back here. And under audio controls, and I'm going to show this to you in the software, even though we have control over the hardware, just because it's a little bit easier to follow what's going on via the webinar. But you can see on here, this is camera one input. This is the input that was right here. That's the microphone coming in off of there. If I, let's go back to this, if I tap on the camera, you can see the peaks on there. That is that microphone. So if I'm doing a show where I want audio from the camera's microphone, you really don't ever want to do that, but if you had to, then that's all you need, right? I got my camera hooked up, it's got a built-in mic, and we're good to go, right? It, it's, it's audio. Clearly, you want to do better than that, so you would get some other type of audio. So either you put on a shotgun mic, some kind of a boom mic, a lavalier, whether it's a wired lav into the camera or a wireless, however you want to do it. But you get that better quality audio into the camera, feeding into that input, and now we have full control over 
the audio in here. So we'll, we're going to come back into audio in a little bit and talk more about what you can do in here. But here's that same, uh, oops, same on and off. So I can just turn that audio on and off and we see that it's red up here when it's on air. Red, by the way, is on air. I realize it's kind of a, it's tradition, right? Red means on air. And I guess it's that way to say kind of danger don't be careful, don't mess with it because the whole world can see what you're doing kind of a thing. I always think of red as, you know, stop, right? Like red's bad, green is good. Whereas here, red is on air. So that's good because it's on air, but it's also bad because don't mess with it. I, I, I don't know the whole history of the logic behind the colors, but red is on air. So whenever you see red in a switcher, it is on air. Just know that. So going back to the software, we can see that this this audio input is on air. Now you're not hearing it because of the way I've routed things after this, but that is audio on air. And then I have a lot of other audio controls in here, um, including that AFV, that audio follows video. So you'll see here I had enabled it um, for, can I zoom in? Oh, I can. I had uh, enabled AFV audio follows video on the hardware. And if we look at the top of this, you see it's got the little yellow on there that tells me that it's, it's armed, it's ready for on air. And I'm gonna hit camera three on the switcher and then now that camera three is on, oh look, it did a wipe over to camera three. Oh no, you didn't see that. Uh, now camera three is on and it is on air and I go back to camera one and then after the transition, it goes to standby again. So that is AFV or audio follows video at work. So you have all that kind of control from the software. Again, we're gonna get more into the software in a moment. Um, let me check my notes real quick and make sure I didn't forget anything here that I wanna talk about. Um, buttons, get my you know, notes are good. Um, Okay, and let me talk just a little bit more about the software and then we'll get more into switching stuff. So let's go back to this. So you have your audio control in here. If I go back to the main switcher, your input control, your, uh, your upstream and downstream keys are all controlled from here. If you wanna do transitions by hand, you can grab this knob and slide back and forth. Normally, if you're doing a transition, you would set up like it was set to a wipe, it's set to two second rate. And so then when I hit um, hit auto, it does that transition, and it takes two seconds for that to happen. Normally, you set these things up and do it that way, but you can take this up, and you can actually go you know, back and forth on a transition if you wanted to you know, play DJ with your video switching. Downstream keys are all the different overlays. You have upstream keys and downstream keys. Those, these are what allow you to bring in different layers into the video. We'll talk more about this later on. And then all the other control in here, color generators, super source, because I am working with the bigger A10. Let's go ahead and zoom into that. Of the four upstream keys that you have on the ATEM Extreme, transition control. So if you want to get deeper into your transition control, you can, you can do that from here. Um, and then downstream keys, more keys, and a fade to black command, which you have. Back up to the top here, we got our media players. I don't have anything connected right now, but you do have the ability to control hyperdecks from here. And then output. This is a really important aspect of all of this. So if I'm live streaming, that is all set up here. I want to live stream to YouTube and I'll use the primary server and then I just copy and paste the key to my live show in here and choose the streaming quality and off you go. So this, all of this is run through here. There's even restream.io built in. All this is controlled from here. Recording, if you're recording your stream, this is all controlled from here as well, which, uh, what is it called that you're recording to? Uh, the files you're recording, what are you gonna name them? You can choose to see the display status of your recording on your monitor. Um, you can trigger recording in all cameras if you are using the Blackmagic cameras. And you can choose to disable the ISO recording if you don't want it to record all those separate streams. You can turn that off if you wanted to. So that's all set up in here. You, can, you can't capture video without an external capture card. It's just the software that's set up. You can capture a still, however. So if I wanted to capture a still of one of the, of whatever's live on air, I could do that um, and then time code. So then let's see here. Media pool, this is where we see all the media that has been added to the switcher. So you can see a couple graphics that I've added and you can have up to 20 graphics stored in here at once. And then over here, you've got whichever two are primed and ready to go on air, media player one and media player two. And so you can just drag and drop these in, or you can control this with macros as well. And you can choose to load up a particular graphic in there and have it ready to go. Audio, we went through briefly. And then camera control, this only really is relevant if you are using a camera with control, a Blackmagic camera. So let's talk about that next. Just double check, that's where I really wanna go next. Um, so we kind of went through, look at my notes here, we kind of went through the first two things I, I suppose I meant to go to this slide at some point. 
um, to say setting and switch up, show setup and switching basics. We kind of have covered all of this already, but uh, but that's okay. Let me make sure I didn't miss anything. Yeah, I think I pretty much covered all that. So yeah, so let's go. Next up is um, the cameras. Yeah, let's talk, let's talk about the cameras themselves and the camera control that we have. How are we on time? My watch doesn't turn on anymore when I raise my wrist half the time. Oh, we're doing good. Okay, so let's talk about the camera control. So this is something that is unique to having the pocket cinema cameras. You have, um, you can use any camera with an HDMI output in this setup, right? Anything with HDMI can feed into the ATEM and off you go. But if you're using the Blackmagic cameras, you have control over focus, over um, the exposure, over the color, the uh, you can even see which one is on air through something called a tally light. So here, let me show you that to start. You get this. Let's go. You can see the red on there, right? So that means that that camera is on air. I'll switch to input. Oh, still got the audio on. There we go. Um, switch to input two. It's off air. Switch back to input one, and it comes back on air. So we can choose. We can see from here which camera is on or off air, which is really, really awesome. So imagine a live scenario, live streaming setup. Make sure the cables are not blocking anything. A live setup where you've got, uh, say, an interview, and you've got multiple people on camera, and you've got, of course, multiple cameras. The talent can always see which camera is on air because of that red light, the tally light. So that's something that you get automatically on these cameras. You don't have to add an external tally light. You don't have to add an external tally light system. Everything is controlled over the HDMI port, and the camera knows when it's on air or off air, and you see it ready to go. Okay, so that's the first thing that you get out of it. But let's go into the actual camera control here. So let's see, I can, I'm gonna have to kind of switch back and forth to show you these things. But here's, here's the type of control that we have. Let me zoom into this. So I can set the lift gamma and gain, which is basically your shadow midtones and highlights. I can change the exposure on those and I can even change the color on them. So I can dial in a very specific color look. Let me just reset that. If I scroll down here, I can change the aperture of the lens. And I'm, I'm seeing, and I will show this to you on like a live video in just a moment, but um, I can change the aperture of the lens here. I can change focus. I can drag this to change focus if I have a manual focus. And if I had a powered zoom lens, I could even control the zoom of that lens on here. This is a really cool function to be able to do. It's definitely getting into higher end gear. I mean, you do have some inexpensive lenses. Uh, I thought I had one. Oh, there it is. So like this is a, uh, overhead, there we go. This is a lens from uh, Olympus. It has a power zoom capability on it, so I can do it by hand. See, there's, well, I guess it doesn't telescope, but anyway, I'm zooming by hand, and if I pull it up into this position, you can't really tell there, but it, it's in like a rocking motion right now. That means it's a power zoom. And when I connect this to the camera, I can actually control the zoom of the lens through there. Now, this is a cheap version of it. This is a very slow lens. What is this thing? This is a Olympus 12 to 50 millimeter f 3.5 to 6.3. So it's a really slow lens, meaning very poor low light gathering capability, not the greatest for studio use, but you know, you can use it, right? You can spend a lot more money and get into some really big fancy lenses that have motor control on them. In fact, I did a video on this not that recently. Uh, I have this whole series of tips called the ATEM Mini Tips that are on my YouTube channel. And there's one about power zoom control. I happen to have in the studio for another project a big Canon, I don't remember the model or anything, but this huge Canon power zoom lens. And it was awesome to be able to, to run that through here. I was using the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K, which has the Canon EF mount on it, and I was able to control that power zoom from the software. Really, really cool to be able to do that. So that's something to you know think about for really big productions. You have that capability. But all that control can happen in the software. Okay, so back to the software. Again, this is how you control it, but let me show you what it actually looks like. So let's go back to this view. And so we've got that view on there. And I'm going to, in fact, here's what I'll do as well. I'm gonna go up to my outputs and set output to to camera one, there we go. So now you're seeing that camera bigger and now I'm gonna go in and change the color. Just like you saw me doing in the software, I'm doing the same thing. Here I'm changing the color on the lift. Here I'll change the exposure, I'll make it darker, make it brighter. I'm opening and closing the aperture in there. I can trigger autofocus in here. Um, I can do all of this stuff from the camera software control. Let me reset all of that. 
reset all back to normal. There we go. And I'll set the output back to and here. This is what I'm doing uh, back to this. I'm changing. So this is the output from the ATEM output number two, which is the one that's going into my bigger switching system. And if I switch this over to multi view, as soon as I do that, let's see here, I'm going to switch back so you can see it. I click that and I click that and there it is. So now we've got the multi view set up in there. Uh, so that level of software control is fantastic. And because it's done through the software, this means you can create macros to do all of this stuff. You can create macros to switch color views, to change exposure. Let's say that you have some type of a setup where you know that it's going to get brighter, it's going to get darker. Maybe, um, maybe a play. That's a good example. You're doing some kind of a live streaming, a theater production. And there's times where they've got all the lights on, kind of normal light, but then there's some really dark, moody scenes and it gets really, really dark. Well, that's fine for the audience. It all looks dark and moody, but then live, you're like, I can't see what, like, through the camera, I can't see what's happening. I want to change the exposure. Well, so in setup, you go through, you have your lighting guy bring up your different lighting cues, and then you go in and you build macros. Okay, this is, you know, daytime scene. This is my night scene. And you set up exposure shifts for the cameras so that you can toggle all of those. And that's, that's really, really powerful stuff to be able to do that. So one of many reasons that the Blackmagic cameras are optimal for this. I really do, really, that, that, having that level of control on it is really, really special and cool. Okay, um, and then recording stuff, we're gonna get into that tomorrow. All right, I do believe that's everything I wanted to cover there. Let's go, let's talk about audio a little bit more because audio is a really cool part of this. And this is something that was added to the ATEM, ooh, when did it add? Was it the Extreme? Maybe it was later, I don't remember. Maybe it got retroactively added. Anyway, on all of the higher end models for sure, maybe it's even on the lower end model now, you have a very impressive amount of audio control. So let's take a look what that looks like. Let's go over here to this, go back to the audio tab. And at first glance, you have, let's go put bring camera one back on air. Um, I guess I can get out of the auto transition mode. Here we go. And we have over here, audio, there it is, the ability to change the levels. So we've got just simple little gain fader. So if you are, um, you know, you're doing a show and suddenly you set all your audio levels great, but then suddenly the actor is talking a little bit quieter or they're talking a bit louder and you want to be able to adjust that. You have a quick knob that you can quickly grab and go, yeah, bring that down, bring it up a little bit. So that's what that slider is for. But you should ideally set up your levels before that on the main gain. So that would be up here at the top. So you see the gain is set to zero right now, but as I up and drag that back and forth, I can change the gain level. So audio... You know, I'm going to get into a huge thing on audio, but audio is one of those things where there's so many stages of where it can go wrong. Um, in many ways, I feel like audio is a lot harder than video. If we think about my wireless setup right now and how many hops it's going through before it gets to you. So I'm wearing a lavalier, wearing wireless lav. Um, this one, this particular one, I'm using a Sennheiser AVX. This one does not have gain control on the receiver pack, which takes one step out of it. But a lot of packs do. And so I would sit here with my transmitter pack. I said receiver, sorry. With my transmitter pack, I would be adjusting the levels on there, having my talent talk and adjust the levels until they're right. So we've got, you know, not, you want it as loud as it can possibly be without peaking. Okay, so we get that right. And then I go to my receiver and the receiver probably has a gain control for its output. So it's, it's output gain, if you will, but it's receiving a signal. And now what is it sending out to the camera or whatever you're connecting it to? So then you got to set that gain correctly. And then that's plugging into a camera, a mixer, something else. In my case, it's plugging into a mix pre. So on the mix pre, I have gain control. So I've got to set that just right. But I have to start here, right? I have to start with me, go all the way through the chain. And then I set the receiver and then I set the the item that is getting the, the audio from the receiver. So in my case, the mix pre. And then in my case, I'm routing that into another audio mixer because, just because it's my studio, uh, it's going into another audio mixer where I have another opportunity to change the game. I don't on this case, but I can from there. It's just at zero. And then that gets fed into the ATEM. And then on the ATEM right here, I have a gain level control here. So I got to get this just right. And then there's the fader for that last minute. Oh crap, they're talking too quiet or too loud adjustment on there. So there's a lot of levels, a lot of pieces in there. And I make this point just because it is complex. Audio can get very messy. And if you're having audio trouble, your levels are too high, too low. By the time you can hear them, it's distorting. Uh, it's distorting even when it's down low. You know, some problem like that, start at the source. 
Start at the beginning and you work your, work your way through the chain. You can't start at the end and work back. Start at the source, me, blah, 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 my source, and work my way through the chain. Uh, if you have, let's say that I was, I had somewhere along the chain, I had it turned too far down. Then by the time I got here to the ATEM, I crank it up to make up the difference. Well, now I've got this noise floor, all this, this garbage in the background that I'm hearing that I shouldn't be hearing on there. So when you have problems like that, start at the source and work your way through the chain. Video's easier, it really is. Uh, okay, so that's the basic stuff. But then you get these little guys right here, equalizer and dynamic. So I open up the EQ. So here, I'm gonna actually enable this. Let's see here, if I, if I do this. Yep, no, yep, there, okay. So now you're hearing me through this. Yes, and not this. Not hearing, uh, ooh, do we not, we, very low, okay. So, no, it's not you. Let me take the levels up and, okay, so I'm watching the levels on here. It is low. I'm gonna take the levels up all the way because I'm using, and I'm gonna get a little bit closer, because I'm using the microphone now on this camera, right, where you're listening to me through here. I probably should have set up a separate wireless mic for this to make it work better, but let me now go into the software and let's see if I got this right. Um, I guess I didn't set it up so that I can do that. Okay, I'm going to go back and forth here. I'm just, just going, going to, to let me switch, switch back, back to the main audio, audio here so we don't really mess things up. Um, I'm, I'm going to go, go back and forth between them. them. There we go. There we go. No echo now. So um, I'm going to go back and forth between the two just because I can't. It's too hard to do them both at the same time and show it to you. But let me just show you the controls that you have. So back to this view here, we've got dynamics and equalizer. I'll start with the equalizer. And from here, I can you know, boost the bass in my voice. So I can do things like this. I can change the treble, you know, find the, the uh, whatever, the, the frequency that is bothersome or needs enhancing. I have this control in here. I have you know, full multiband EQ in here. So you can really change the sound dynamics in there. Then you've got under dynamics, you have these... Uh, the expander and the gate, which will allow you to knock out a lot of the background noise. So if you've got a large amount of background sounds, you can actually reduce that or eliminate it using the expander or the gate. Effectively, what this does is it was, it's listening to for levels of or above a certain threshold, and it will cut off everything below that. Now, you do have to be cautious with it because you could have something where it's a really loud background environment. And if you gate it so that it goes totally silent when the person is not talking, when they start talking, suddenly you hear all this background noise. And then when they stop, it's pure silent. And that just sounds weird. Like you notice the background noise more when it suddenly comes in, as opposed to finding a threshold where the background noise is there, but it's just lower in sound. It's not totally prominent. It's lower. And your brain gets used to that and your brain cancels that out and then you just hear the dialogue. You don't think about the background noise. But if the background noise is just full on, on and off, you're going to hear it and it's going to be very distracting. So setting all this up is a really important part of, of doing good audio. And obviously the best solution is to have super clean audio environment, but clearly that's not real. That's not normal, right? Most environments, there is some kind of background noise. The amount of background noise that's happening in my studio right now is ridiculous. These, because I have this huge server rack over here, but that's why I'm running my audio through the Mix Pre with this thing called Noise Assist on it that does a magical job of removing background audio. And, uh, and that's being done in hardware. And you can do similar things on here. Now, I, the reason that I'm not doing this in the ATEM itself for this show is because the ATEM that I have, the 2ME, doesn't have any of this audio control. This is all much newer. It's in the newer hardware. My main ATEM, the big 2ME, doesn't have any of this, so I have to do it externally. So once again, something that makes these smaller ATEMs an insane value for the amount of technology that's packed into here, you no longer have to have an external $500, $1,000, $2,000 audio board that does the equalizing, does the noise gating and expanding and so on. And then there's also compression in here. So you can enable the compressor. The compressor is going to allow you to keep your levels more constant. So any lower levels, it'll raise up. Any higher ones, it'll bring down. So it tries, tries to keep everything within a specific range. Um, lots, lots of great stuff you can do. And then, then there's a limiter, finally, for knocking out those really high peaks. So there's all these different pieces in there can be used. And this is all on every single input. Every input has its own settings. So let me turn on something on here. And then you'll see, um, here we go, let's change, let's say I change something in here and uh, I'm trying to make the UI change a little bit. 
I guess it doesn't really matter. Um, you see up here are these indicators of how it's set. So each one of these has its own little representation of what is being set on there. You know, pull that up, pull this down, and you see that represented up here. So you know at a glance what each one is getting. Um, I mentioned the headphones earlier. So if we look over here, oh, sorry, before I go into that, one more thing. Each one of these has its own level controls, right? All these individual things. And then you have your master, which is a master output that you can raise or lower. This is going to raise or lower everything. You, the sliders themselves don't change, but this is taking all of your audio mixed and making that louder or quieter. Then you also have a master dynamics and EQ on that as well. Typically, you're going to want to do everything individually, right? But if for whatever reason, suddenly the whole thing just needs to get a little quieter or louder, you have, you have the ability to adjust that here. That's what that is. So now let's go down to this headphone control. I mentioned the headphones. And the funny thing is this UI, this headphones UI, has been in the software and forever. Um, but almost no ATEMs have a headphone jack on them. But now the ATEM Extreme does. And so now we've got the ability to monitor from the hardware itself, like I explained earlier, and going back into the software, I can adjust the levels on here. I can also do that in hardware. So like if I turn this up all the way and then on the hardware itself, so these are my, I know you can't really see the buttons that clearly, but these are my headphone controls. I have up and down a mute and a reset button. So let's go back into the software and I'm going to push the hardware buttons to make this quieter or make it louder. I'm going to hit the mute button and you see it mute on there and I hit the reset and it puts it back to its default position. So you have that same control in software as you do in hardware. Now, I also mentioned that through the headphones, the my main idea is that you are hearing the program. You're hearing what is going out to the live audience. But if you ever want to monitor a single channel, let's say you're trying to figure out where some weird noise is coming from, or you want to make sure that the levels are good for the guy on camera three before you bring him to air, anything like that, you can solo, meaning just your one channel, you can solo any input. So that happens over here. Scroll down, you can see this little headphone button under each one of these. You click that and it is now in solo mode. And so you're now soloing and just listening to that one. And you can switch between all the different ones on here or you just turn it off and now you're listening to everything again. So you have that total control in there. All right, that's all of that. I think we're good there. Um, Gary, give me a thumbs up if we have any questions we wanna jump into before I get into some other stuff. We do, awesome. All right, I'm gonna bring you on, actually, I'm going to take a very, nah, I'm looking good. Just, who needs breaks? Let's just go into it. Um, where's Gary? Here's Gary. All righty. You should be on air. You should be audible to the audience. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing, doing fine. I'm just, uh, uh, I got to figure out my monitoring. Did I throw you? Do you want, do you want me, you want to give me a moment? Well, I'm hearing myself twice, but I'll try to get past that. Uh, so, because we didn't yesterday when I did this, and I, I'm doing the same thing, I th Oh, it's think. because we weren't actually live yesterday when we did the webinar. That's probably ah, why. Ah, okay. okay. I'll try to ignore that. Um, so, the first thing I want to ask about is there are many users that are complaining about the um, the image quality of this transmission and it looks really good to me in HD and I don't know if I'm getting a special feed or not I don't think I am um, uh, a lot of people are saying that it's soft and there's compression artifacts do you have any um, insight on that I don't and I'm looking at I've got a um, I've got a little Facebook portal over here that's running it and it looks pretty good here um, yeah, I don't know what to say. I, mean, I won't Zoom deny that this is probably happening. I, I know that um, I can read the button labels on your switcher, so I don't know why it's uh, doing that. Let me, I'm going to make sure. Um, I can hear you. Go ahead and read the, the, first, real, the first question. I'm going to go take a look at the Zoom settings and make sure that it is actually sending HD. So, But I can still hear you. Okay. Um, some of the questions I'm going to save for tomorrow when you actually talk about the uh, specific product area that you're going to be, uh, that the question's about. Okay. Um, the, let me see. One question is, do you have a graphic of your signal and workflow that you could provide either maybe later or something like that? So I don't have one set up, and it's funny because when it comes to my studio setup, people ask that a lot. 
The reason that I don't have it set up is because I change it all the time. It is constantly changing. I rerouted a ton of stuff just to do today's show, right? I've got things set up here that aren't normally set up uh, because I'm bringing Gary in and demoing a switcher, which is very meta, right? You're showing the hardware that you're simultaneously using. So I have a lot of kind of complex stuff set up in here that's not normally set up, but my system is pretty ridiculous to begin with and it changes constantly. So I really don't, I'm sorry to say. Um, it's, I can give you, at its core, I have the ATEM2ME, that's the big switcher, that's in a rack, and everything routes through that. I've got cameras in other rooms that are routing through it. This switcher is routing into it. My computer here is routing into it. Everything is routing into that. That is at the core, and then I'm sending that out to a um, an HDMI to USB converter to bring it into Zoom, which is actually being handled in the other room. So that's kind of the very basic part of it. But beyond that, I'm sorry, I just I don't because it's just too complex and it changes all the time. Sorry. Sure. So um, what are the specific streaming settings used for this webinar? Um, are you directly from the ATEM or to a software app? Okay, so for this webinar, we're using Zoom. And Zoom has Zoom is quite limited. It will only allow us to push out a 720 by 1280 signal, and um, and even that it was hard to get Zoom to do. It's the only way to get full HD out of Zoom is to be like you know Google, basically. I don't know who gets the full 1080p, but nobody does. And so we're limited to that resolution. Now, what I'm actually sending to Zoom. So I mentioned that from my ATEM2ME, everything's being switched on there. One of the SDI outputs, the program outputs like this has two HDMI program outs. The big one has multiple outputs. I'm taking one of those SDI outputs and running it into my office. In my office, I have a um, SDI to USB converter. It's a company called Inogeny. It's a little SDI to USB that is plugged into my computer. And so my computer in the office sees the Inogeny as just a webcam. And so I go into Zoom and I say, look at the Inogeny. Just like you would go into Zoom and say, look at the ATEM, because of my routing, it's looking at the Inogeny instead, but that is what is pulling into Zoom. So I'm feeding Zoom a 1080p signal, but Zoom is only broadcasting 720p. So uh, that's, and then all the audio is obviously coming over that SDI as well. So that's, that's effectively how that's working. Okay, uh, which pocket camera do you have there? That was asked and I forgot when you said it. This is the Pocket Cinema Camera 4K. I believe that's the full model on this one. Uh, yeah, Cin Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera. So that's the you know PCC or BMPCC is kind of how it's abbreviated. Uh, this is the 4K model. And then over here, I've got the 6K. And I will be using both of these tomorrow when I do the ISO demo. The 6K, so BMPCC, Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera, 6K, not the Pro, the Pro I don't have here. So that's the 4K and the 6K. The 6K has the EF mount, so there's a Canon lens on here, and the uh, the 4K has a Micro Four Thirds mount, so I've got that Panasonic 10 to 25 millimeter lens on there. So those, those are the cameras that I've got in here. But everything you've seen so far has been through the 4K. So um, uh, this was answered, I think, but I think it um, is important to reiterate. Um, is it possible to use the ATEM as webcam via Ethernet and record at the same time via USB? Okay, so to use it as a webcam over Ethernet. So there's two, those are two separate things. So to use the camera as a, uh, use the ATEM as a webcam, meaning that Zoom, Skype, FaceTime, you know, pick your, your meeting app, sees the ATEM as a webcam, that requires USB, not Ethernet. The Ethernet connection is for streaming to a service like YouTube or Facebook Live. So those are two very separate types of services, and I think that's an important distinction that, that some people get confused. You've got your streaming platform, which is like YouTube, Facebook, and so on. These are not meetings. You don't join my stream as a meeting and chat to me and so on. It's a one-to-many. I am streaming my video signal out to YouTube, out to Facebook, out to Restream.io, whatever. That is done over Ethernet. That is a data stream that goes directly from the ATEM out to the Ether. As a, a chat service, like Skype, like uh, FaceTime, like Zoom, these are two-way video conferencing apps, like we'll call it that at its core, and that is done over the USB signal. So two completely different types of apps and services. So you can, 
you can use, you can stream to Facebook or YouTube and record to USB simultaneously. You cannot, without having two USB ports, you cannot record while also going into Zoom or go to webinar or any of those as a USB connection. To do that, you need two USB connections, which is what the Extreme has. So hopefully that answers that question. I have um, just some observations because I'm still reading the chat and everything. And I, I think I may understand part of the, um, the questions here and the quality of the video. If you were watching uh, some of Blackmagic's um, uh, feeds, like the ones that Grant does and some of the others, they're using uh, YouTube um, and not Zoom. And I'm wondering if the differences that the people are seeing are the fact that we're using Zoom and that um, some of the other things are using um, uh, things like YouTube. Yeah, that probably has a lot to do with it. And just FYI, I am recording this in full HD, which will get re-uploaded to my YouTube channel, uh, should be next week. So you will be able to go back and rewatch that, just like the previous one is up there as well, and that's in full HD. So, yeah, sorry, it's just nothing we can do about that. Believe me, before we did the first one a few months ago, we were fighting tooth and nail just to get straight HD, because without it, uh, you know, it'd be un unwatchable. Uh, you know, the video of me is fine like this, but as soon as I go to the screen or something, if it's too low resolution, it's just not good. So, sorry about that. I will, uh, when I'm in software, I'll continue to zoom in because I know that makes a big difference. But yeah, that is, unfortunately, it's just a zoom limitation. Uh, if anybody out there watching works for Zoom, call me. We got to get this thing upgraded to full HD. <laughs> so the Ethernet cable on the ATEM Mini when you're streaming, um, where do you recommend that you connect? Uh, the question is, is it directly connected to the modem? I know some people connect to computers. Do you have observations on that? Sure, that's a great question. Okay, so the, the Ethernet out of this means that it can plug into your network, which means however you have everything else on your network plugged in. If you, let's talk about the most simple setup. You can actually go Ethernet from here directly into your computer, but then you're not gonna get internet on here. It'll give you a connection to it, and you can do the same thing you could do over USB, but you're not gonna get internet. I suppose if you wanted to get tricky about it, you could pull a Wi-Fi signal into your computer and then route that Wi-Fi signal through the Ethernet into it to kind of cheat around the no Wi-Fi support, but I wouldn't recommend doing that. Uh, that's definitely not the way to go. You Normally, you would plug that Ethernet into your network switch or network hub. So if you've got, again, kind of starting at the most basic level, you've got you know Comcast or Spectrum or whatever, and you've got a USB modem in your house, that USB modem, might only have one Ethernet out port, but it probably has a couple. Um, or if you've got a wireless setup in your house, which you know most people would have, your wireless setup has an Ethernet in, so it's going from the modem into that Ethernet in, and then that wireless setup might have additional Ethernet outputs. I'm just gonna have at least one, and some of them will have multiples. Anybody who's going into a bigger network and needs more plugs, that's where you add something called a switch, a network switch, and these can be as simple as like a Netgear four port switch or like 20 bucks or 30 bucks on Amazon, super, super cheap. And so it's just giving you multiple inputs. Then you get up into 20 and 40 port managed switches that can get into the thousands of dollars. But at the end of the day, they're all doing the same thing. They're giving multiple connections to your local network. And so these things have something called DHCP built into them, a DHCP uh, client. And so what happens is you just plug this into your network and the network goes, your router, that would be your the, uh, the Wi-Fi router most likely, goes, oh, there's a new device on the network. Um, I'm going to give it an IP address. I'll give it an address so that it's unique on that network. You can possibly go into your router software and do a fixed IP and assign it an IP address. Like in my network, I have so much stuff in here that everything has a assigned IP address where I always know what's what. But all you really, you just plug it into your hub or plug it into your switch and it's going to automatically just get a right address and get online. It's designed to be really easy. You don't have to go into the software. Going back to the, let's call it the old days, when I first got my ATEM 2ME, it took me forever to figure out how, because I'd never worked with it before, how to get it on the network because I had to go in and manually assign an IP address to it, which meant I had to go into my router and take the MAC address from the hardware and go into my router and say, this MAC address gets this IP address and assign it. So that was kind of a, a pain in the beginning to set up. Now with DHCP, I just literally plug it in and it's online. 
Um, so for most people, if you have, I would say most home environments are going to have a modem coming in from their ISP. That modem is outputting into a Wi-Fi hub, or it might be an all-in-one modem and Wi-Fi hub. There's going to be a spare Ethernet port on there, so you plug into that. If, there, if you've already used it for something else, then you need to add a switch, a little four port, a little eight port switch, and off you go. And Ethernet cables, you can run really long, so you can have them you know, all over your house, all over your office, and so on. So hopefully that answers that question. It's, it's one of those things that's very specific, so it has, it's very specific to your setup, but that's kind of at its core how it works. Hopefully that helps. I want to offer a couple of things about uh, the connectivity of the ATEM because uh, it was uh, asking a couple of questions. But basically, um, some people do report problems trying to stream from the ATEM. They can't connect. Um, the, the end result is the on-air light flashes and they see the cache build up and that's an indication not connected. Um, the couple of things to check. Uh, the ATEM uses the Google DNS of 8888. Uh, we have no way of changing that at the moment. So it's possible that maybe your network is not able to see that uh, DNS. So what I recommend is uh, with a computer uh, command line um, type ping space 8.8.8.8 and see if you get a response. Um, if you don't get a response, then the ATEM mini won't work either. Uh, if you do get a response, then it would sound like the ATEM Mini should see the DNS. And the other thing that happens is um, uh, sometimes when you uh, uh, turn on the Mini uh, or initially connect it to a router, it may not actually acquire an IP address. So if you take the ATEM setup utility USB connect to the ATEM and verify that the ATEM has acquired uh, uh, an IP address. It, it has a number other than 0.0.0.0 because it certainly won't work under that condition. Um, those are the two things that I see happen the most um, that's worth checking out. You don't have uh, connectivity. I'm glad you mentioned that I didn't show the ATEM setup software. So um, I've loaded up on my screen when we're done with the q and I'll jump into that and I'll, I'll give a little tour of that as well. Okay, um, uh, a good one. On the pocket camera, can you set the camera ID in the camera menu? Um, I think you can. I know you had to do that with the Okay, so I can, so um, yeah, I can answer ahead, that if you want. Yeah, go ahead. So basically the pocket camera is self-identified through the HDMI. So there is no identification for the pocket cameras because they are connected to the HDMI, which is connected directly, uh, and I'll qualify that, connected directly to the ATEM switcher to the specific port that it's obviously plugged into, one, two, three, four to eight. Um, in the event that you're actually using the bi-directional microconverter um, 3G to connect either the pocket camera or something else, then it might be necessary to set the camera ID in the microconverter. So the microconverter um, has its own ID by default is one and uh, from the factory. Uh, quite often, uh, under many scenarios, you plug it in and it just works because of the way, uh, the way things work, um, it, it will know. But if that microconverter is connected to one of the SDI ATEMs, it's going to need a camera ID um, because the pocket camera itself does not know that. So I hope that helps with that answer. That's cool, thanks. I didn't, I wasn't sure how that worked. I remember grabbing my old, um, this is the old version, the SDI version of the studio camera. So this is the Blackmagic studio camera. And um, there's a newer version of this now, which is super cool. But this has a big screen on it, whatever. But this it has dual SDI uh, ports on it. So it's an SDI in and an SDI out. And to gain the level of camera control that you have today over HDMI, you had to run dual SDI cables to your ATEM switcher and then assign the camera ID in here to which port it was on. So there's a lot of setup involved. But like Gary said, now with HDMI, it all happens basically automatically, which is really cool. So another question, um, is there a way to make the tally light, uh, I guess referring to the pocket camera, uh, more visible? Anything that you've um, come across or any ideas that you might have? No, I mean, it's pretty bright. The only way it would be blocked is if you had a really big lens on it. There's, I know there's third party tally light systems that you can buy and integrate in, but um, I mean, as far as the light itself on it, it's just it's just on or off. I'm not sure what else to do about that. Sorry. And then uh, one question about the stills in the ATEM Mini. 
Um, I'll, I'll probably answer it uh, in my question here, but the question is the original mini version does not store the stills, but the rest of the mini models do. So some people have the original one. Um, the ability to store stills requires specific hardware in the mini to do that. and added after the first model and then the the firmware was updated to include that but the original mini um, just doesn't have the hardware to um, support that yeah let me i'll just show that real quickly here if we go back to the computer if i go up to the file menu there is this thing called save startup state and that is going to basically say everything everything about the ATEM, including the media here gets saved so that when you power the um, power the hardware off and then back on again, it is restored back to that state. Like Gary said, the original, the very first one, didn't have the hardware to do that, but um, I believe it's every one after that, so the ATEM Mini Pro and up has that capability. But you do need to do that save startup state to make sure you lock it in. And what about the save the startup state that um, may not always be obvious, uh, when you push the button to save the startup state, please wait at least 20 seconds, maybe 30 seconds for everything to be written to the non-volatile memory because it's not an instant process and it's not uh, actually there until it goes through the drill of, um, of actually saving all of the, the things it has to save. So uh, don't push save the startup state and unplug the mini. You, you'll find that it wasn't uh, actually saved. And there's no progress bar that indicates what's happening. There's a progress indicator when you save out the XML file. That you'll see a progress on, but when you hit save startup state, there's no progress. So, yeah, just have a little patience, and then off you go. I'll, um, for one more question, and then we can go on. Um, is the compressor audio in the uh, ATEM the same as the one in Resolve, if you know the answer? Um, otherwise, I might be able to help. Yeah, I, I actually don't know. Go ahead. I, I obviously we don't know if the um, the bits and bytes are identically the same, but the the Fairlight processing in the ATEMs, uh, which started with the the Television Studio Pro 4K and and every ATEM after that, um, is pretty much the same algorithm as uh, used in Resolve. You'll find the knobs you know look the same, the GUI looks pretty much the same, and everything. So we can safely say the algorithm is is. Pretty close, if not exactly the same, but you know whether or not there's uh, uh, bits and bytes that are different, it would be hard for us to actually, but it should be very close. Okay, very good. Um, excellent, thank you. Are there any other questions or was that the last one for now? There will be some more a little bit later, but uh, we'll uh, let you go on. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much, Gary. Thank you everybody for the questions. And once again, if you have questions as we go, drop them into the Q&A window in the Zoom webinar. And Gary, as you saw, will aggregate and, um, and pull those questions together. And if it's a question that's best answered tomorrow, because I'm going to be working with that tomorrow, then he'll save that for tomorrow as well. Uh, all right. So next up, I want to talk a little bit about the picture in picture capabilities I don't and super source capabilities. We're not going to go crazy into this, but I'm going to show you some of those things. Now, I'm actually going to bring in another input. Right now, I've only got this one camera hooked up. So I'm going to take an iPad and let me show you how this is going to get connected. Look at the wires in the right place. So this is, so, well, I guess I should start with the iPad has USB-C output. That, that's the only connection the iPad has is USB. And obviously the ATEM's got HDMI input. So we need to go from USB to HDMI. So that's what this little guy here is. This is the Apple, you see it's USB on one end and then the other end has, uh, has HDMI. It has another USB, another USB input for getting power in. And then it's got a standard USB input, which can be super handy. You can you know, use that to hook up an external drive or any other number of things. But this HDMI adapter is the key. This is the one from Apple. There's one from a company called Belkin that works very well as well. And it is uh, only the, the HDMI output. It doesn't have the USB ports on it, doesn't, so you can't charge and so on. If you're just using the iPad by itself, when you only have the one port, then you really do want to make sure you have that ability to charge. I uh, Here I've got it set up where it's on the uh, smart keyboard or whatever this thing's called. This has its own power input. So I once, as long as this is on here, it is getting power and I don't have to, um, I don't have to worry about the, the battery draining on there if I'm using just a straight HDMI only adapter. Anyway, so with that said, let me plug this into here and plug this into the iPad. 
And then this input is going to go into input two. So let's see here. I will, let me bring up the multi view and you'll see it's, so warning when you plug this in, when you first plug it in, what will often happens is the picture comes up and then it goes away for a moment. And it, I guess the iPad is doing some kind of thinking and I don't know what it's doing, but it takes a moment and then it comes back. That's typically what you see. Uh, we'll see if that happens this time. So I'm going to bring up the multi view so you see it. I'm going to plug this into input two and you can hear there now it's in. And let's see what happens. There it's up and we'll see if it goes away and then comes back again. Um, now you'll see up in the, uh, it's not coming, it's not going away, cool. You can see up in the top right corner, there's a little, there, well now it's gone. There was a little indicator telling us that we had that on, uh, that it was connected, but obviously we see it connected there. Now a very important part, let's bring this up big on here. A very important part of this is that you're not filling the screen. Notice that there's not only pillar boxes, the black bars on the sides, but there's also a little bit of black on the top and bottom. That is just how the iPad outputs the video to the switcher. It is scaling out to 1920 by 1080. That's what this needs, but that's just how it fits in. It's obviously not going to go to the sides because this is not a 16 by 9 ratio screen. It's a 4-3 aspect ratio screen, but unfortunately you get those top bars on the top and bottom as well. So that's unfortunate, but let me pull up a picture here. Um, let me find something that's just a photo that's uh, not awful or personal. <laughs> there we go, food. Mm. I don't know about you guys, but um, I'm already getting hungry for lunch. Okay, so I am, let me do back to this view. Let me pull up the multi-view again. There we go. So you can see right now we're looking at the interface, right? I'm going to tap a picture and notice it switches over. Now it's full screen. Now we see it all the way to the top. And if I pinch into the photo, it will fill the screen. Uh, so that is what happens when you go full screen output. Basically you hit play on a still photo or video coming off the iPad, which tells you that the iPad is actually a really good video player for your show. So if you're doing an event where you've got video that you want to play up, like a you know interstitial, a commercial, a pre-roll, whatever, the iPad is a great way to do that because you can scroll through the video in the regular, um, in this view, you can scroll through the video, you know, in this view, pull the video that you want, and then as soon as you tap on it to bring it full screen, it actually fills the screen on there. So you can go full screen and you'd have to like go full screen and hit stop really quick. So it's kind of queued up and ready to go. But then you switch to that on your ATEM and you hit play on the iPad and it plays through. So that is a really, really great way to get video into here, pre, pre, um, pre done video. You can do this with a computer, of course, as well. So I could have a computer hooked up that is mirroring and, um, and then I just go full screen on the video and that plays through. Very similar type of experience. Or you could set up a computer with a dual screen setup. So you're looking at your monitor here, but then the ATEM itself is effectively a second screen to the computer. But then you have to drag that video over to that second screen and make it go full screen. So I mean, it just depends on your setup, but I'm just telling you that if you are going to incorporate video into your presentation, an iPad is a really, really clean way to do that. It works really, really well. Okay, so with that said, um, uh, oh, so the cropping on there, that you can crop that out if you wanted to and scale it up a little bit. So if you wanted to get rid of those bars on there. But anyway, so right now, I'll go back to the home screen on here. So let's go back to this view. There we go. Oh, and I guess I should reposition this camera, I set it off to the side so that it kind of sort of sees me. Oh, I suppose I should bring that back up as well. There we go. And uh, let me focus that. I guess I'll hit the focus button. Is that going to work? All right, hold down, hold it down for a few seconds. There we go. And then it runs in autofocus. Perfect. There we go. Now we're in focus. Okay. So um, I want to do a little bit of picture in picture kind of work. So I'm going to switch over to the software. Oh, look, the iPad just went out. Anyway, um, I'm going to switch over to the software screen and show you what we can do in here for picture in picture. So let's go back to the switcher. And actually, let's start with the most basic, which is going to be on the hardware itself. So on the hardware, we have, and again, I know you can't really see these buttons super clearly, but this right here says picture in picture. And there's an off and on and then positions for them. So I'm going to turn that on. And let's go to nothing's kind of reset. Nothing really looks right in here right now, but that's okay. Um, I'm going to set that on and go back to the multi view. And so you can see now the picture in picture up there in the little screen. And as I hit these preset buttons, it puts it into different places in different preset positions. Um, <laughs> give, give me a second here, folks. I've got, I've got a UPS delivery. I'll be right back. 
Uh, we're good? Thanks. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> it's a working studio. What are you going to do? Um, all right, go back to that. So you can see the position of that moving around. And there's even a kind of a two-up picture-in-picture, uh, -picture, which is basically a super source kind of setup. So you have these simple setups. And these four corners, let's see, one, two, three, four, like that, those you can do on any of the ATEMs. And obviously, you know, we want to have a different picture in there. So let's go ahead and set that up. I'm going to go into the software. And um, let me get this set up here, and then I'll pull this back over. Where are we? Um, upstream key. Am I looking at the right one? There we go. Here, upstream key, there it is, switch back to this. So you can see that key is on here, there's the on air. If I hit the off button on the hardware, it turns off there, so that's not me on the mouse, that is the hardware, turn that on or off. And then this is key one, this is upstream key one, so I look over here at upstream key one, and it tells me what input it's using. Right now it's to camera one, so that's why you're seeing this strange, uh, you know, picture in picture of me inside of my own video. So that's obviously not what we want. So let's go back over to the software. And I would change that. And I would say, let's show camera two on the on the uh, picture in picture. So now if I go back to the multi view, we should see my iPad there in the corner. So that might make sense or probably makes more sense to go the other direction. So I would go ahead and bring up the iPad as the full thing. Let's turn on the multi view. And then I'm going to go back into the software and switch that multi view. Uh, sorry, not multi view, switch the uh, picture in picture to input one, the iPad went black. That's why I'm, that's, I mean, I remember what the problem with this iPad was. Um, it keeps doing that. There we go. Um, so now I've got a picture in picture where I've got me in the corner here. Again, I can position it in any corner um, or this is actually a little side one preset that's kind of nice. And um, I've got my, my slides, my whatever I'm doing on the background there. So that's a way to handle that picture in picture. So there's, that's just kind of the built-in preset, but you do have an immense amount of control in software. Now, this is a really important part of how all of this works. The buttons that are on here, whether you're talking about the extreme or the buttons on the, the ATEM, many of the smaller ones, um, these presets here, so let me, let me do a close-up shot on this. Let's see if I can get this into frame. There we go. These preset buttons, those four little corners there, those will put the video into that position no matter where you have it set. It is literally a hardwired put it here. And the important thing to know is that if you go in and you meticulously reposition the, the wherever you want it, you can turn it on and off and that's fine. But if you hit one of those presets, it is going to push that back and there's no undo. You'd have to go in and manually reposition everything again. So this is where macros become really, really handy. You want to be able to record any unique layout as a macro so that you can call it back up. Um, before we get into macros though, I just, I will show you how we would go about repositioning that. So let's go back to, let's see here. Um, I'm gonna go back to this view and you'll see under here, I've got a, so there's my, uh, my upstream key one again. So just to recap, there's upstream keys, upstream key one. Let's zoom into this a bit. Fill source is set to camera one and you can see the position and the sizing on here. Now I can go in here and I can type in a number so I can say, you know, make this, uh, make this position nine and that would be moved. Let's go back to this view. In fact, here I'm going to, give me a second, I'm gonna set it so that you're seeing just the output. Let's go back to my output for output two, set that to program, boom, there you go. Okay, so now you're seeing that output. Now I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna change that back to eight where it was to start with and there you see how that has moved in there. But I can, I can also, instead of typing in numbers, you've got these little, you've got these little uh, steppers in here, but you can also click on the letter, like the x-axis letter there, and move that. So that's gonna give you a much more dynamic way to move things around. So we've got, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this while you're looking at it, but I wanna show you the controls. You have position and size controls, and you can unlink them so you can distort it, but clearly that's not something you would normally do. Um, and then you've got a mass control, so you can crop it, you can add a shadow, and you can add a border. And let's see, there's, there's even other stuff we can do in here, but those are the main ones. So let's do this. I'm going to scroll up to here. I guess you don't have to see that close. I'm gonna switch back to this view. There we go. And now I'm gonna start making changes to this. I'm gonna look at the right camera. Now I'm gonna start making changes to it. So I'll go into the position, and I'm just using the little X that I showed you. I click on the X and drag it. So there's the position, there's the Y position. Um, I'll, the size is linked, so I can scale that. Oops, I just unlinked the size. So the size is linked, I can scale that, or if for some reason I needed to distort it, 
I can do that and then change the size like so. So I have all of that, and again, just click and drag in here to position it wherever you want. If I enable masking, this is going to add a border, so I can crop into the border on here. Uh, sorry, a crop, I, don't know, I didn't mean border. I'm cropping into that, and again, I can type in numbers, so I'll just type in like 10 on the bottom border, and it crops that up, or reset that back to zero. I can add a drop shadow, not the greatest shadow in the world, but it's a shadow. So you can't really change the softness of the shadow, but I can change the position of it, and I can change the, um, well, I guess just the position, actually. Yeah, in and out or any angles. There's a little little draggy slider position that where you want. It's not the greatest shadow, but it's a shadow. And then there's border. So I showed you border. If I toggle the border off, it goes off. But with the border on, I can set that to any color. So let's go to like a, a little red, red color border in here or something. Um, and there we've got the ability to change the border color. You can also change the width on that. You can add beveling and do all kinds of funky things to that. Typically, though, you know, you're know, going to keep it simple. And I think this is a really important aspect of this. Keep it simple. Don't get fancy with your borders. Just a nice, simple border. If we go back to, um, don't worry, Gary, I'm not going to put your audio on. Uh, but if I go back to Gary and me, you can see we're up there. We've got a little animated background playing, and there's a white border around us. Just simple, clean. You know, Keep it simple. Right? Um, okay, let's go back to... This. So I've got the border control in there. I'm going to turn off the border and uh, the fill source again is chosen from here, whichever camera I want it to be. So that's all very simple setup. All right, that's a simple picture and picture. And if I go back, in fact, let's go back to here. If I want to turn that on and off, I can use the button on the ATEM to turn it on or off. But as soon as I hit one of those corner buttons, it goes back into that corner and there's no one doing that. So let's talk about how, oh, actually, we're going, to do macros. We're going to come back to macros. Let's talk about how to save that as a macro, but I want to go into super source next because super source is where we get into a much more powerful way to do our, our layouts in here. So let's turn that off. Let me go back to the software. Wrong one. Um, actually, I should probably. Multi-screen options, macros. I guess we're still multi-screen options. My slides are all over the place. Let's just ignore the slides. There's no slides. There are no slides here. I'll edit that out later. Okay. Um, super source. So let me explain, I explained it briefly earlier, but let me explain a little bit more what SuperSource is. So what we were just looking at was the picture in picture. It is, um, it is an upstream key. There's things called upstream keys and downstream keys. It's where they are in the flow. Upstream keys are typically used for things like picture in picture, multi pieces, multi screen layouts like this, um, simple multi screen layouts. The downstream key is typically, it's the last thing in the chain. It would typically be used for like a, a lower third, perhaps, or a network bug, a little corporate logo sitting in the corner. And that's on top of everything, no matter what else is happening underneath it. So there's your kind of differentiation between the upstream and the downstream keys. The downstream key has a lot less control. The upstream, you can do all kinds of stuff with it. So there's your kind of basics. Super source is the ability to do a complete custom layout of up to four inputs at once, positioning them wherever on screen, cropped how you want, scaled how you want, positioned how you want, and then the background behind them can be a still graphic or um, another one of the inputs. So that's that's where SuperSource comes in, and that's what you saw when whenever we bring up me and Gary, that is a SuperSource layout. So SuperSource is unique to the ATEM Mini Extreme and up. So let me show you, I shouldn't even say end up, because when you get into the big ATEMs, it's not on the 1ME, it is on the 2ME. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a great feature to have on here. Anyway, so let's go into looking at how that works. Go back to the computer. And first of all, you have this button here called SuperSource. When I turn that on, that enables SuperSource. So SuperSource is effectively an input just like any of these others. Do I want camera one, camera two, camera three, or do I want SuperSource to be up? So SuperSource overrides all of this. And then I go over to the SuperSource menu, and let's zoom in close here. And you have on here a series of presets. So these are the little simple preset layouts, and, but you can completely customize these. So let's go back to this view. And you're looking at the super source now. I'm going to bring up the first super source layout. And you can see that it has set four, um, four pictures, four blocks, with a background that is apparently one of the graphics. I can go to another super, another layout, another layout, or another layout there. And so that represents, go back to the computer, that represents, why is Siri waking up again? Honestly, um, that is was these four presets here that we were just looking at. Okay, so let's, I think it's a good idea to start with one of them that's kind of close to what you want and then adjust from there. Or, you know, you can start completely from scratch. It's totally up to you. But let's, we'll start with the four. Let's say I want to build a two-up super source, just like I've got with Gary and I. All right, I want to build that. 
Um, so I want two equally sized side-by-side -side pieces. So if I look at my presets, the, uh, I could you know, start with this one or I could start with this one and get rid of the other one. So we'll go ahead and start with this one. And so again, if we go back to the view, you're seeing, that's what you're seeing right now. All right, let's go ahead and start making some changes to it. So I have four different boxes of video. Those are the four boxes you just saw. Each one of these can individually be turned on and off. So I'm gonna turn off box three and box four. And so now what we've got is that. That is now the current super source layout. So I've just turned off those other boxes. All right, let's go back into this and I'll go back into box one and I'm gonna set the source for box one to be camera one. So now if we go in there, there's me, hello. So there's me in camera one. And then I'll set the source for box two to be camera two. Camera two is currently the iPad. And in fact, what I'm gonna do is pull up a picture on the iPad so that it actually fills the screen. Um, there we go. Um, so, oh, that's interesting. No, there we go. Um, sorry, where is, there we go. There we go. So there's the iPad. It is getting to be lunchtime. Can you tell? So there's the current setup. Okay, so now I want to get customizing my setup a little bit more. So I have my position sliders and the size sliders, just like we saw for the upstream key. So what I'll do is I'm going to play with these. Let's start with box one. I'm going to play with these but I'm gonna do it while you're looking at that. So I'm gonna take my position for size one and move that, let's move that down. Um, and I'm actually gonna scale it up. So I said that I wanted to kind of mimic what I had set up with Gary, so I'll scale that up. But now of course that means I have to crop it. So I'll enable crop on here and then I'll go to my left and right and we'll start typing in numbers as 10. Yep, that's probably much. Let's go for like eight, there we go. And so I'm gonna do the same on the right hand side eight and there we go so now i've got a crop okay so there we've got the first side let's just call it done the first side of that picture and picture maybe i want to add a border to it as well so let's add um, add a border to do that we go back into here to add a border we have this whole other thing called the art page so what is the fill source for the background um also we have borders there we go so i can also enable borders in here so i'm going to go ahead and oh wait, that's wrong um Sorry, let me zoom out of this so I can see what I'm doing. Um, that's not the border for that. I am, that's the border for the input. I think that is, all right, sorry, that's the border for the background. Where's the border for this? Why am I, where's my border for that? Okay, I'm completely lying to you. I'm not quite sure why I can't find the border for that. We'll just come back to that another time. So the background is the, uh, the art rather is the background. So it's set to media player one right now. So if we go back to this, there we go. And I switch it to actually here before I do that, let me show you here, media player. So there's media player one, this gray one is media player two. So what I'm gonna do is switch this from media player one to media player two. So go back to this, back to this view, switch it to media player two, and there's that new background. Okay, so now I've got this set up for, um, for the left side, for one side. I want the same settings on the other side. So let's go back over here. There's this copy option. I can say copy the settings from box one and let's copy them over to box two. I hit copy and now box two is set up just like box one, which means of course that it's, we're only seeing one because the other one's behind it, but all the settings in there, all I need to do is move it to the other side. So I go back to this and we look at, let me zoom back into this. We look at box two. We see it's the exact same settings. See if I go between box one and two, it's the exact same settings. What I'll do is take the the X position and I'll just get rid of the negative. And so before I hit return, let's go back to this, I hit return and boom, it moves it over to the other side. So now I've got that identical layout. So that little copy option is super, super handy. Okay, so now I've set up a basic super source. That's about as deep as I wanna get into as far as different multi-up layouts, because it's just, there's a million options from here, but that is effectively the basics. But I do want to talk about the macros and the importance of using a macro to save this layout. And that is going to be the last thing we do today. So I'm gonna do this and we'll come back to more Q and A's and then we're gonna wrap it for today. So the, let, me, let me explain kind of high level what a macro is and then I'll show you how to build one. So a macro is a series of saved commands. It is a, it's just an XML file, we'll actually look at that. But it's a series of saved commands that are recorded by you doing something to the software or the hardware. So on a very simple level, I wanna to switch to input one. So I start recording a macro, I hit input one, 
that gets recorded into the macro. I stop recording, and that is all that macro does is it switches to input one. I want to build a macro that positions the picture in picture uh, or the super source in this case in this particular layout. So I need to go in and record every action that is needed to put the super source that way. And this is the really important part of this. And I've had this debate with many people about, oh, macros should work a different way. But here's the thing to understand. When you are recording a macro, it is recording, as I said, what you do. It is not recording the state of the ATEM, meaning it is not doing like a snapshot of restore it into this position. There is certainly an argument that says, hey, it would be a lot easier if I could say record this state and it just everything that's in the ATEM restores back to this position. And if you think about it from a very simple perspective of I want a picture in picture layout like this and then I want another one like that, it makes sense, right? I totally get it. The thing is that there are so many commands in here that, that are possible in here, that if you were to record the state of everything all at once, not only would it end up being a massive macro, it would be an absolutely huge command that would take quite a while to execute, it would potentially override things that you don't want it to override given the current scenario that you're using it. Sounds a little bit confusing, but let me set it up like this. So let's say that um, I'm doing a simple show, right? I've got camera A, camera B, I've got audio on camera A, and I've got audio from B. B is my, uh, my computer playing videos, whatever. Okay, so now I wanna build a picture-in-picture -picture layout. And I have, when I set it up, I had it set it up where I had audio in on A and B, and it was all good to go. Okay, so now that's, that's the way it's set up. I've saved my, I, which I can't do, I've saved this mysterious macro that just saves the whole state of everything. So I got picture-in-picture, -picture, two audio inputs. Okay, cool, so I got my picture-in-picture. -picture. So now I'm doing a live show, I'm talking away. I've got some video playing on, on, my, on my computer that's playing, that it's looping around, whatever, and I don't want the audio from that. I just want to bring up that picture-in-picture -picture layout. So I hit picture-in-picture, -picture, restore, right, my macro, this mysterious macro, and it restores everything, but it suddenly brought in that audio. I, I didn't want that audio but it brought it in because I would have said, I would have saved everything at once if I could have saved that. That's not what I want. On a more complex level, let's say that I have a macro that brings up a, um, enables a, um, an upstream key to bring in a lower third. So I can have a macro that just brings up that key, that just turns on that key, or I can have a macro that turns that on and loads a specific graphic. Well, if I have a, um, if I build a macro that turns it on, and let's say it does some other things as well, so it's not just you know one button, but I, it turns it on, does some other things as well. If I had it, if I had it um, bring up a specific file name, a specific lower third, I would have to have a separate macro for every single potential guest, as opposed to a command that says bring up the lower third, and before, right before I do that, I drag in guest number 32's name. So I drag that in, and then I hit the macro that fires up a bunch of WYSIBANG things and brings up that lower third. It brings up the lower third that I've pulled in. If it saved everything, then I would have to save absolutely everything about the ATEM every time. And this may not, I may not be explaining this the best way possible, but effectively, if you were to force yourself to save everything, it would be really limited to what you could do on a larger scenario. So with all that in mind, what this ultimately means, it's a little bit complex when you're building a big complex macro, but you literally have to tell the ATEM every single thing that you want it to do. And if you don't tell it to do it, it's not gonna do it. If you don't tell it to enable something, it's not going to enable it. So here's what that comes down to. When you're building something like a super source like this, I need to go in and tell it every little position, scale, uh, drop shadow, whatever. And the only way to tell it to do it is to tickle it, to basically make a change and change it back so that it records that into the macro. So here, now I'm gonna show you how we actually go about doing this. And I apologize if that's not the best scenario. It's kind of a complex concept, but hopefully that made some sense. All right, let me go back to the computer. And as I said, I want to create a macro to enable the super source with the way that I've just laid it out. So I'm going to first bring up the macro editor. Command Shift M brings up the little macro window. And I'll go to create, and I'm gonna take a blank one here, and I'm gonna click plus, and I'll just call this demo. I was it called the super source demo, super source demo. Okay, hit record. Now at this point, I, you know, actually here, let me do this, let me stop that. Let me record over this one. We'll call this one click demo, record, switch to camera one, stop recording. Okay, so that is literally a one line script. That's all it does, it just switches to camera one. Now I'm gonna build a more complex one, then when we look at the XML, I'll show you the difference. 
Okay, so let's go now to a new one, record, new one, record and say super source demo, hit record. All right, so I need to do a bunch of stuff. I need to enable super source. That has to be done, I have to turn that on. Then I have to toggle or tickle every single box element or element that could be a part of it. So let's start with box one. I want it to be on, so I turn it off and back on again. That act of turning it off and back on again has just told the software to write, turn it on. It doesn't write, turn off and back on again. It only writes the last state, uh, unless you do something else and then come back, in which case it will record those. But in a case like this, it's only gonna record the final state of that. Okay, so there we go. So I've turned that on. I want this to be camera one, so I'm gonna switch it away and back to camera one. Position, I want to be there, so I'm just gonna click in here and I'm gonna use the up, down arrows on my keyboard to tickle that. Tickle that, tickle that. Crop, I want that on, so I turn it off and back on. I want the top to be zero. I need to make sure that I actually tickle it. If I don't, then it's going to have whatever the previous state of the crop was. So again, I tickle that, tickle that, tickle that, and tickle that. Okay, so now I've set up box one the way I want it. Now I need to go to box two and do the same thing. Enable it, make sure that is set to camera two, and tickle, 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 and there. Okay, so that's all set now. Box three, I don't want box three on. See, if I don't specifically turn off box three right now, then if I had some other layout that was using box three and I go, now bring up this layout, if I don't tell it to turn off box three, the box three could still be left behind. So again, why it's important to make sure that you toggle, toggle everything that could be affected by this macro. All right, so box three, I want that off, and box four, I want that off. And that is now everything that I need to do for, oh, no, sorry, I lied. I gotta set my, my background art. I want my background art to be Media Player 2, so I'm gonna switch this and toggle it back to Media Player 2. And, you know, just to be safe, I'm gonna make sure that that is set to the background. Okay, so that is everything, I hope. Sometimes you do these things, and then you're like, oh, I missed something. So now I've, I've oops, sorry, I didn't, didn't mean to do that. I should have had this back up here. So the last thing I had done there, sorry about that, was I had toggled that, Media Player 1 and 2, and I switched that from the foreground to the background while I was recording. And then I hit stop, and we've got that recorded now. Okay, so now that is ready to go. Um, let's go into the run position. It's set to recall and run, which means it's just one click to do it. So now if I, let me move this over here, if I hit one click demo, you see it switches this. If I hit super source demo, it switches back to this, but everything here changed. So let's go into here and I will reset the super source, right? So it's totally reset back to the, let's do this one here, right? You can see the numbers in here, everything is different. I run super source demo and everything is set. Let's go back to box one, reset this back to box one. You see all the settings in here. I hit super source demo and everything gets changed the way it needs to be. So this is running that entire script at once. So if I, let's actually show this to you in action like so, I'm gonna use that preset, so I just set back to that default preset, and then I'm gonna to switch to, say, camera two input, and now I'll hit that super source demo button, and boom, in one effect, it does it. Now, you might have seen, there was a little bit of a flicker in there. Did you see that? Watch, let's do this again. Go back to camera two, and Let's see, actually, I'm going to redo the layout. There we go. Back to camera two. And now hit the super source demo button. There. So you see how it, it, there's that little flicker in there? Do you know why it flickered? I'll tell you why it flickered. It flickered because I enabled super source first in the command, and then I executed all those changes. So the software is going to run the command in order, in line by line. It's just code, right? So it's going to first enable super source and then do all those things. So what I really want is for all of those things to happen first and then for super source to get enabled. But I don't want to have to redo the whole thing. Well, this is where editing the XML comes in. This is where we can actually edit the code, which is pretty cool. This is definitely a bit arcane and complex, but I promise you, once you start to wrap your head around this, it's actually pretty straightforward to do. So here we go. I'm going to go in here and save this out. So um, go to the save as command. And I'm going to, um, let's go put this live demo. I'm gonna call it that and hit save. Now, what do I want to save? You have all these options of what can get saved into this XML file. Your, your layouts, your super source positions, all kinds of stuff, which is a really powerful way to set up a, a backup of everything 
or to have multiple setups. Let's say that you use your hardware to stream uh, live stream weddings and you also use it to do, I don't know, dance parties. <clears throat> you might have totally different layouts for those. So what I can do is set up my layout as I want it for weddings and then I can save out a wedding XML file, settings file, and then I can do the one that I do for, for what did I say, DJ, whatever, other events save that as a separate XML file. And then when I go to a different type of event, I just call that up and everything, everything about the ATEM is restored to that way. Super cool, right? So I've got all that, but right now I don't need all of that. All I care about right now is the macros. I don't need pages and pages of code that I'm gonna have to sort through. So what I'll do instead is just say select none and then enable macros. Now it's only gonna save the macros into that file. I hit save and now I'm gonna launch BB Edit because BB Edit is my software of choice for doing this editing. Let me close the previous one, hit open, and live demo, there it is. You'll notice as well that it automatically appends a date and timestamp to the moment that you saved it, which is super, super awesome. So you can have multiple states as you go. So that's set up, live demo, click open, and there's the code. And anybody who's not used to looking at this stuff goes, what the actual, what are you, come on, man, this isn't easy. I, I, I get it. Take a little bit of time with it, and it starts to make sense. It's Written in English, <laughs> the names actually do make sense. You read the names and you go, oh, okay, now I get what it's doing. Um, but it just takes a little time to get used to. Anyway, here's the way this all works. Here's the reason I like using BB Edit, by the way. It automatically does this color coding. This is not part of the file. This is BB Edit. It automatically does the color coding and indents things so you can really easily see what's happening. So if I close everything and hold down the option key and toggle all that close and open it up again, We'll see we have all the macros in here. I open that up, there's all the macros by name, and I open up one of these, and there's all the macro code. Okay, so there's that one-click demo that I did. I open that, and here it is. There's the code. Program input, so that's your input, right? So program meaning it's what's on air, not the preview pane, but the program pane. So program, input, what input, right? And then the number, uh, program input, and input is camera one. So if I wanted to change this to camera two, let's say that I had written this big complex script, but I triggered the wrong input, or I decided later, you know what, I'd rather have my main camera on input three, um, but I still wanna use the same script, I can go in here and modify the, uh, modify the XML and just change that in there, right? Really, really handy. So I can change that. So that's that one thing in there, that's it. That's one line that does that. But now let's look at the more complex one, the super source demo. Okay, so program input was set to super source. Remember I said that the super source is basically just treated as an input? Well, that's the very first line of code in here. So that's why I get that flicker because it turns that on and then changes everything. So here you can see all the different things that it changes. So source, uh, box enable, that's source, um, uh, the super source, box enable, and then enable box index zero. This is one of those, okay, here's one of those things that definitely gets confusing. The inputs are one through eight and they're labeled as camera inputs one through eight. A lot of the stuff in the ATEM starts at zero instead of starting at one. So position one is number zero, position two is number one, position three is number th two. It's, don't get me started. Um, but it's something you need to be aware of. So it, it, again, you get used to it. Um, anyway, so box index, that first box is index zero. And on box zero, it's gonna get camera one. And then here's the position, the X and Y positions for it, and all those lines in there, everything that I toggled is all here. Okay, so all that is set. But remember I said that I want to have it switch the super source at the end. So what I'm gonna do is just go and take that whole line of text, I'll zoom out just a little bit, and I'm gonna hit Command X to cut that. I'm gonna go down here to the very bottom and paste that in and now it's happening at the very end. So I've just moved that to the end. Now, there are, if you're doing this, there are, uh, there, it's, there's a possibility that you will still see a little flicker in there. Because what happens is certain actions take time for the ATEM to actually complete. And by time, we're talking frames of time, frames of, of video time, like very short, but they might take time. The commands are executed in one long string, but it basically as quickly as it can execute it. So what this means is that, let's say that you're executing through this long stream of commands, and here's a command like reposition that is gonna take more than one frame of video to execute. And then it keeps on running other commands, and then you've got your bring it on air. So if you bring it on air first, and then you execute the commands, you see that change. We don't want that. So you bring it on air afterwards. So you execute all the commands, and then you bring it on air. But Wait a minute, I just saw a weird, like not the full flicker, but I saw something happen. Because this command here that takes time 
didn't have time to finish before you brought it on air. So you can actually add what's called a sleep, a macro sleep to it, and it just pauses the macro. It says, macro, hold up, wait a moment before executing the next line, and that macro sleep is measured in frames. And so you can put a macro sleep of one frame, two frames, whatever, and quite often a single frame sleep will solve that flicker problem. So just one of those troubleshooting things, if you're doing that, the first way to avoid the flicker is by moving the, bring that thing onto air to the end. And the second way to avoid it, if that isn't enough, is to add that sleep at the very end. Um, I'll show you how to record the sleep. Actually, I probably have one in here. Let's see here. If I do a find in here and I search for sleep, um, I guess I don't have one in here. So I'll show you how to record a sleep in a moment. Anyway, so I saved that to the end. I moved it to the end. All right, so now I'm going to save this file. I'm going to do a save as. And this is just my own little technique for doing these. Um, I'm going to change the date and time stamp on here so it is 58, and I'm not going to add seconds at the end. The fact that it doesn't have seconds at the end is my own personal indicator that I did this. I could, I could put like my initials on there if I wanted to, but I know now that I have actually touched this as opposed to one that was automatically generated. You do whatever you want. You can add your name to it if you want to. It doesn't matter. Um, anyway, so I do that, and, but I do change the time so that it keeps things in order, and then I save that. All right, and now let's go back to the ATEM, and we go to the restore menu, hit restore. That brings up a save dialog somewhere. There it is. And there's the one that I just touched. So I'll hit restore. It's going to bring up just like the, the save dialog. It brings up this option to choose what you want it to restore. The only thing it can restore is macros because that's all that's there. But if I had a full XML si uh, package here, but I didn't want anything but the macros to restore, I could select none and then say just restore the macros. So that's up and then I hit restore. There is a progress, it's already finished, but there's a little progress down there. You, you might've seen it, it shows the completion level, and that's it. So now I bring up my macros, and um, there's my one-click demo again, and there's my super source demo, so now it's gonna do something different where it's moving that flicker to the end. So here's how I'm gonna demo it. I'm going to reset the super source. Let's go back to camera one on here. Now I'm gonna switch over so that you can see what's happening, and now I'm going to trigger that macro Look at the right camera here. I'm gonna trigger that macro, and because I have moved that load super source to the end, we shouldn't see the flicker. So, uh, where's the button? And, ah, we still saw the flicker. So, I need to add a sleep in there. Okay, so we're, let's do it. This is perfect. So we actually are gonna do it. Let's go back to the macro, or back to the screen view. I'm gonna record a simple sleep. So bring up my macros. Um, here's, that's actually is another really cool thing, is that when I wanna add something in, like let's say that I go, oh, I forgot to enable the border. Right, I forgot to enable the border. Or in this case, I forgot to add a sleep or now I need to add a sleep. I don't have to re-record everything. I can record just that one little piece that I need and then go into the XML and add it in, which is what I'm gonna do right now. So I go in and, and I hit, rec oops, hit uh, record. And we're just gonna call this sleep. And you see up here it says add pause. I click on that and I say add a pause for one frame, add pause, that's it, stop recording. So now I've just recorded a, a sleep command, which isn't gonna do anything right now, but again, I can use that code later. So I'm gonna hit Command-Shift-S to save and go away. And um, here's another little tip for you to keep the naming the same. What I'll do is click on that name. So that loaded, shoot, sorry, you didn't see that when it happened. Let me, let me redo that because that's a really neat trick. Let me cancel that and save as. Okay, so you see right now it says untitled. I want to name it the same as this, so I'll click on that one, that file, and it brings up that same file name, and then I'll just delete the timestamp so that it will uh, have that same base name and then add its own timestamp to it. So just a nice little trick there. Hit save. Again, select none, just the macros, and save. Okay, back to BB Edit. Close the existing one. Open the new one. There it is, and find that sleep command. Do, do, do. Uh, one click demos, must be after that. There it is, sleep. So macro sleep, there's the command. Now I can take this and copy this line. And I'm not gonna cut it, I'm gonna leave that there because I might wanna use it later. I'm gonna just hit command C, copy. I'm gonna go up here before the super source comes on and paste that in. So paste in there. I'm gonna add two frames of sleep just to, for safety in here. Add that in, let's save that. Command Shift F S to save. Following my guidelines, I will timestamp it as two and not put the seconds after it. Click on save, back over to here, command R to reload, bring up that, hit OK. Now I'm just moving fast because you know you don't need to see everything. Maybe you saw the progress down there. Now let's do the switch up again. So I'll reset my macro 
uh, my super source. I'm going to load up camera one. Let's go to the input. There's the right input and bring up the command. And now is where I go. I hope everything works the way I planned it to. And I hit the super source demo. Boom, and it worked. So you saw that. There was a ever so slight pause, two frame pause, but we did not get that flicker in there. So super powerful. So I just showed a bunch of stuff at once in there. Explained kind of in a haphazard way why you have to do macros the way that you do. I showed you how to record the macro. Hit record, give it a name, do whatever you gotta do, stop recording, and there's your macro. To edit it, export that XML file, open it up in an app like BB Edit, and change whatever you need. You can reorder things, you can change things, go, oh, it should have gone to camera one instead of camera two. Um, I wanna make the border red instead of blue, punch in the code for that. I want to pick your thing, add sleep in there. All of that you can do. And then I showed you how you can record a single line of a macro and then add that in. Um, later on. Super, super useful for sure. You can also borrow code from other things, right? Like you've got, oh, I did this layout or I did this, I did another switcher for this. I want to build one that does all of these things. So you can go in and just copy blocks of code out of one and paste them into another. Super useful. And always, 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 always do a save as. Don't open up that XML and just hit Command S because then when you restore it, if you broke something, you have no way to go back. By doing a save as, Command, uh, command Shift S, or, well, on a PC, whatever that is, but save as, for that XML file, then you can always go back. If you totally botch it, you can go back and restore it and go, okay, I don't know what just happened. Let me start over and go back one step. So definitely do that. They're tiny little text files. You know, it's not going to fill up your hard drive. Okay. That's everything for today. Gary, do we have other questions? I'm going to bring Gary back up here and let's see if we've got any other questions we want to hit right now. And, um, and otherwise, otherwise we're going to call it lunch. Okay. So um, there's a few questions. And um, first of all, I'll... Add a couple of comments about the um, super source and the macro, as okay. everything that Joseph said is um, is spot on. There, um, here's a trick that some users uh, go by for super source macros that works quite well in most cases, um, because of the the fact that you can actually import an XML and select super source uh, components by themselves. Um, it's easy to set up a, a super source macro, uh, set up a super source exactly the way you want it, then save that setting to an XML file, and then record a macro called super source however you want, and then just import that super source macro component only, because that's probably the one case in the whole set of ATEM controls that you can do that. And that, mac that importing that super source XML will tickle all the things that need to be changed for just that part of the uh, switcher. So um, once you do that, stop recording, and then you'll find that you'll have those presets with everything about the super source, and that means everything, so there may, not be, there may be things you didn't want. Um, they will be set up and you'll be able to switch to that uh, preset quite easily. Um, the thing that that doesn't do is it won't add any um, delay like uh, like Joseph showed there. The delay, by the way, is mostly necessary because um, the, when you change an input to a box, the actual input is a frame late because the delay in the box is a frame later than the rest of the super source. So uh, that's why that's necessary. But if you were to if you were to say recall the super source preset before it was on the air. Uh, then you wouldn't need to add that delay because it already be be there. But it's usually it's when you're changing from one super source preset to another that you need to deal with that uh, delay and pause and things like that. So hey, that's Gary, just one thing that people you, do. Um, just to be clear, source. when you're talking about importing a another macro, you mean to trigger the macro while you're recording it, correct? Yes. So what actually happens is um, this is a unique case, but you've you've already um, preset the super source exactly how you want it and you save the XML, you save that setup to an, an XML file, not a macro, just an XML file. Then you start the recording process of a macro and then import just the super source settings from that file you saved and then stop the macro or you can add other uh, changes that you want. But the fact is, is that when the Mac, when the XML is loaded from the switcher to the switcher, those settings will get changed because they're actually modified through the uh, through the XML. Um, they will be part of the recording process. Interesting. I've never actually tried that. I'll have to try that. Okay, cool. 
it's just a unique uh, feature of the super source there might be some other areas in the switcher you could get away with that but mm. uh, a lot of times it's pretty the, the settings like you say it's pretty broad because so many settings get um, saved with the XML that uh, it might cause that right. okay cool okay the other thing about super source um, that you uh, stumbled on was uh, the borders in the mini uh, the mini extreme borders are not available um, due to resources uh, uh -huh. in the so they're they're not available so the best way to handle borders is to create a piece of artwork um, and then you put that artwork on the foreground on top of your boxes and that will create borders and and quite often they'll be nicer looking borders because they'll be exactly the way you you want them to be got it okay I'll look at some other things okay um, if you if you're going to talk about this tomorrow you can say so uh, the question is what kind of key works best with ATEM and what can make a green screen look smoother and if you're going to talk about that later you can defer yes yeah, so I'm actually not planning on going into green screen tomorrow um, I did green screen quite a bit in the previous webinar and so I'll refer you back to watching that one just because I did go into it quite in depth but I will give you some some hints um, getting a really clean key is is definitely a challenge but the keyer that is built into the atems is very very good it's remarkably good honestly for for what it is um and for what you're paying for it you know really like high-end keyers cost into thousands and tens of thousands of dollars so it's really remarkable what's in there but one of the tricks to getting a good clean well two of the tricks i'll tell you for getting a clean one first of all is a bit obvious the background make sure that it is evenly lit and when I say evenly lit, it doesn't mean you shine a light on it, you stand back and go, yep, that looks even. You, you want it to be really even. Look at it with a, a camera with a histogram on it and look for an even line uh, on the histogram. If you see a big spike at the ends, then that's gonna tell you they got big shadows at the end or highlights at the ends or don't fall off, you see have big shadowing around the edges or you'll see big spikes in it where there's hot spots. You want that to be as even as you can. That's, that's a really important first part of it. Um, that's just for getting a nice, simple key out of the background. But then the edges, to make the edges look clean, the best way to do that, that I found at least, is to backlight your subject. Have a hair light, have a backlight that's hitting them, and that act of having that little halo of light around every strand of hair or whatever puts a little bit of separation between the hair, for example, this is where you're going to mostly see problems, the hair and the green or blue background, and it just makes the whole thing look so much cleaner. So it's, it doesn't take much, just a little bit of a backlight on the back, and that makes a really, really big difference. Oh, I don't hear you, Gary. Gary is, Gary's muted, muted, you're muted. We can't hear you. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. There we go. <laughs> The red button is right in front of me and it's uh, it's red too uh um several people have been asking and you'll probably ask by the end of the uh the show here today but um a link to your uh, site what uh, link should they go to to find your site for oh, the uh, previous shows yeah so my my main website is photojoseph.com but on youtube and, and you'll find everything on there but on YouTube, I'm YouTube as Photo Joseph and also Photo Joseph Live. Those are the two YouTube channels. The previous live webinar is actually uploaded to the Photo Joseph Live channel um, because it was a live event, so I put it there. But it did really well there, so I'm actually going to put this one on the main channel next week. But Photo Joseph, just if you type Photo Joseph into Google, you'll find everything. Uh, would you recommend uh, using the iPad or other device for playback, such as HyperDeck? Uh, and then what are the pluses and minuses for using different approaches for playback? Okay, that's a great question. Um, I'll talk a bit more about the HyperDeck tomorrow, but the nice thing, as I was explaining about using the iPad, is this very tactile, right in front of you, scroll through your library, tap a video, call it up, it goes full screen. You don't have to um, worry about the play bar interface showing up if you accidentally move your mouse, like if you're playing it from a computer. So using the iPad for video playback is a really nice way to go. The HyperDeck gives you, for play, it also can, the HyperDeck can also record, but as a playback device, the HyperDeck is really cool because you can program Video, certain video files to play and build that into a macro. So you can have a macro that you trigger that says play video number three, and then it plays that. So if you've got like a, you know, a interstitial commercial you wanna run, you can hit a button, it fires that up and it hits play. So that's certainly an advantage there. And you can control all of that through the ATEM itself as opposed to just a random input like the iPad would be. So there's advantages to both sides. 
if you were doing it casually, then use an iPad or even a computer. It's just dead easy. You already have everything that you need. If you're doing it regularly, especially if you're going to be calling up specific videos on a regular basis, then doing the HyperDeck can uh, certainly be a good way to do that. Oh, one more thing actually with the HyperDeck. Okay. Um, um, this, I'm not sure if you said this or not, but um, uh, somebody said, what brand and model of SDI to HDMI converter that you mentioned, did you have another one uh, that you were using for some purpose or were you using the Blackmagic ones? It's, it's just the Blackmagic ones. So it's this one here. Oh, actually, I'll do a close up this way. Uh, there we go. You see, this is, this is that bi-directional one that Gary mentioned. Uh, I'm obviously just using the one direction, but it's HDMI in, find the right, there we go. HDMI in, SDI out. And so that is because I need to move this over to my, uh, take this signal into my SDI driven switcher. So that's why I have this here. Uh, but yeah, the Blackmagic one, that was I great. will um, offer several comments about that. I hope I don't forget them. Um, the um, micro converter bi-directional 3G with the number 3G uh, at the end, because we make two models like that. Um, that's the one that's designed to work with the ATEM Mini or actually the ATEM SDI switchers so that you can actually incorporate an, our HDMI cameras into an SDI switcher and, and use camera control and vice versa where you can incorporate our SDI based cameras into the ATEM Minis and have camera control. You would use that particular bi-directional microconverter 3G to do that because it has the functionality built in to do that. The older microconverter uh, doesn't have that capability, so uh, try not to get confused with that. Um, but I think one the thing that, one is also uh, a bit cheaper that and might just come up and it's, it's useful version. to know, um, a bi-directional microconverter, the way ours are designed, um, if you're using both sides, you know, basically you're feeding HDMI and SDI, then the outputs will be the respective opposite inputs, as you would expect. If you do not feed one of the inputs, then both of the outputs, both HDMI and SDI, will carry the output of the single feed. It's a quite useful feature, um, and, I, and I think it's, and it just automatically works and it's just fine. There is uh, one side effect that you might be, uh, it might be useful to know, is that um, your two feeds that you're actually running through it, if you do not ever want the feed of one side to appear on the other side's content, then do use the product to do that because it's quite common for like power up or maybe if somebody disconnects a cable that will cause the feed of one side to then appear on the other side. And, and if that's not what you ever want to happen, I wouldn't recommend using that converter. Otherwise, it's a brilliant uh, feature uh, for that. checking. Are you going to be talking about um, ISO recording specifically in res uh, tomorrow or? Yes. Did you yeah. So tomorrow I will do, I think it's the first thing on the agenda tomorrow. I'll talk about doing the ISO recording using the pocket cinema cameras to record B-RAW and then taking that recording into Resolve and relinking to the RAW file. So that whole workflow I'm going to go through tomorrow morning. Can you talk about airflow and heat dissipation uh, with the different models and the best way to deal with, uh, with that to prevent possible problems? So I've heard this before, people saying that the, the hardware gets really hot, and it does, uh, but it's designed for it, right? It's designed to handle the heat. It has vents on the sides, so you definitely don't want to block those vents. You can feel them, like right here, I can feel barely moving, a uh, bit of moving air, but don't block them. I mean, that's, you know, here, let me look at the uh, overhead view here. So there's vents on the sides here. If we look at the side view, uh, the close-up view, we should be able to see them. You can see those vents in there. The bottom right now, putting my hand on it, is quite hot. Not like scalding hot, but it is definitely hot. Uh, but it's designed for it, right? This hardware is designed to take it. All electronic devices get hot. This will definitely get hot, but not. it's not gonna hurt itself. It's designed to do it. You can buy third-party stands to hold it up a little bit, which will add a little airflow underneath it if you want to, but you certainly don't have to. But don't block the sides. That's super, super important. Don't block the sides. Yeah, um, sure, I showed that, but I'll, I'll jump back into that again. So. If we look at the software and I go to the audio tab, you have a row of EQs and dynamic controls for each input. So each one of these has its own inputs that can be enabled. And as I enable them there, we see a little graphic, uh, a little graphic update here to show you how that's been set. So you know, as I 
change the EQ on this one, Oops, change the EQ on this one, we'll see that represented up there as well. But you just click on each one of these to call that up. And you have individual controls for every input, so all the way across every input, and then there's a master control that you can add as well at the end if you want to. Okay, I'm just looking at some uh, just uh, last minute question and uh, <laughs> trying to do two things at once here. Um, the question is, what was the other thing about the HyperDeck that uh, you weren't able to finish saying? Did I, did I miss something there? I don't think so. So the hyperdecks, I, I may have, I mentioned that they can be used for recording and for playback. Oh, 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 right. Because I understand what they're saying. Because Gary, when you're, I know because you're hearing yourself, you're pulling your ears out while you're muting the when. So I was trying to talk over you and I didn't realize you couldn't hear me. The other thing about the hyperdecks that's really cool is they have a dual SDI output. And that gives you the ability to play something with a key and a fill. So you can make a video that is a, a ProRes 4444 file, which has an alpha channel. You load that in, and then you can have graphics that come up with transparency on them. So if you wanted to have a animated, let's say a lower third animated thing with, you know, whirl, we swizzy graphics and a name that bounces in or whatever, you can do that by rendering that out of, say, After Effects or Apple's Motion or whatever. So you have that ProRes 4444 file load that onto the HyperDeck and then play that out. But it does mean that you have to output both SDI outputs. If you're gonna use it with one of these ATEMs, convert both of those to HDMI and then bring them in on two different channels. And you have to make sure you set that up properly to run two channels in here. And Gary, I don't know the new HyperDeck, so I, haven't, I don't have one. Um, the newest one, does it have dual HDMI out as well as dual SDI out or is it still single HDMI out, so you'd still have to convert it to HDMI to use with the ATEM Mini. That's correct. It's a single HDMI out. And uh, however, that single output could be um, output number one or the, um, the fill material. And then one of the SDIs could be converted to HDMI uh, for the key. Oh, OK. No sync issues if you do that? What was that? I said no sync issues if you do that, having one on SDI and one on HDMI. No. Okay, cool. I've actually tested that here, so um, I know that that works. <laughs> Let me think here. <laughs> well, while he's... Oh, oh go ahead. So how about keys for other things that aren't always uh, green screen? Uh, which one works best for you? Lumina, Chroma, Linear, Upstream, Downstream? It's kind of a broad question. Yeah, that, that's a pretty broad question. So let me, let me go back and just to explain what the question is. And let me get this set up. Okay, so go back to the software. So what the question is about these types of keys that are here. If you look at the Upstream key, you've got a Luma key, a Chroma key, Pattern key, and a DVE key. So if you're doing a green screen type thing, that's a Chroma key. Right, that's always going to be a chroma key. And you can chroma sample and choose the color, and that is traditionally either blue or green. But technically, it, it doesn't matter. It can be any color of the rainbow. But the reason that we traditionally use these bright greens or these bright blues is because they're so far removed from things that people normally would wear, the color of hair, or anything like that, that it makes it easy to separate. But if you wanted to, um, let's say you wanted to have a green subject, and they're like a really bright green subject, you could set a red chroma background, a red background, and then key that out. You totally could. Um, so if you're doing color keying, then that's a chroma key, chroma for color. If we go back to this, um, the Luma key is about, this is about using something like that ATEM, uh, sorry, like the HyperDeck, where you have a fill and a key source. So playing back from video. This isn't for keying out of the image. This is for pulling in two different video feeds. So you see it here, it's listed as media player one and media player one key. But if you were doing it by video, maybe it would be like, you know, camera seven is my, um, my video fill and camera eight is my key fill. And so effectively what's happening is the, the hyperdeck or tomorrow we'll talk about this actually from the, um, the, the 4K, whatever it's called, I forget now, the, my, my playback device that outputs dual SDI you're actually seeing a color version of your video, right? Let's say your logo with a black background. And then a, the second channel is a black and white 
key version of that, a mask version of that. They're playing simultaneously. And so here you're telling the software, use this feed, the one with my color logo, as the fill, and then use this black and white mask version as the key. And that combines the two, just like an alpha channel in Photoshop, it combines the two, and now you have transparency. So that's how that works. The other types of keys in here are pattern and DVE. The pattern key is like the picture in picture, um, could be a square, could be a circle, could be a diamond, could be any of these little preset shapes, and you can alter those. And then the DVE is really just about, that's kind of how we did the picture in picture in the first place. It's about bringing in a source and then cropping it and repositioning it. So it's not using any funky shapes, it's just cropped and scaled. So those are the four different types of keys that you have access to in there. Okay, uh, how do the ATEMs talk to the cameras over HDMI? Is it Ethernet on HDMI? Is it HDCP? How are they able to talk and send commands back and forth through HDMI? If you want, I can answer that or you can. Sure, go ahead. So basically the uh, HDMI uh, that we use um, supports a, um, a channel called CEC, or C Consumer Electronics Control, I believe. It's the sort of thing that normally you, you connect a device to your TV set and it communicates with the TV and, uh, you know, uh, the TV communicates with the device and tells it what settings to use and things like that. So we're using this CEC channel. Um, and the reason why I do say this is that if you actually use um, uh, an HDMI extension cable, which could be possible, um, it has to support CEC or there will not be any uh, bi-directional communication. So that's an important thing to note that anytime the HDMI goes through something, it has to pass that back channel uh, to work. Uh, we don't use the Ethernet channel. And the other thing about that is uh, uh, HDMI extensions um, using fiber optics are quite good and there are many uh, really good fiber optic extension products out there um, and they will say they support CEC. I mean you need to see that on the box or on the specifications and they will work good for long extension cables. He probably has one in his hand right now. Yeah, um, so that's it's interesting. The, um, I don't know if you can hear me. HDCP sure. is, is an excellent okay. question. You can say we either support it or not but, but the point is if the has uh, copy protection enabled, uh, the ATEM will never pass it in any way, shape, or form, um, uh, officially. So um, the best way to uh, treat that is, you know, we, we take cameras, but um, uh, set-top cable boxes and things like that are always going to be a blank screen to us. Um, so that's how we talk uh, HDMI. Okay, so I guess before I did my show that I did on the long fiber cables, um, I should have talked to you about it. So these are, this is two fiber HDMI cables. This one is 300 feet, 300 feet of fiber HDMI. And this was 100 feet of fiber HDMI. And um, these support ARC, A-R-C or E-ARC. And I'm just looking at the Amazon page where I bought them. They don't say anything about CEC, but they do support ARC, which I'm guessing is largely the same protocol because these do work. As long as they are ARC cables, they do work to support the Blackmagic camera uh, control. I just, I never heard of the CEC before, so I guess I should have asked them before I did that video. But yeah, if you have a, I did a video on this recently, if you look at my YouTube channel about um, using super long HDMI cables, it's, oh, it's over fiber, those fiber cables, they're remarkably affordable, and if they support ARC, then they work. So that's awesome. Are there any other questions? Okay. I don't, I think the rest of the questions can fit tomorrow. I'm going to answer a few of them just online real quick. Okay. All right, super. All right, well, thank you very much, Gary. Uh, thank you, everybody, for watching today. That was an awesome first go. We had two and a half hours in, so tomorrow we will pick up where we left off. Um, like I say, let me all actually pull up the agenda for tomorrow again, just so you can see that. So let me get that, get the right slide up. And I'm swiffing through my splits here. That was today. Hopefully we did everything that was planned for today. Um, oh, that's why it's taking a long time, because I have little animations on there. That was silly. Okay, so tomorrow, ISO recordings and B-RAW is where we start. Hyperdeck for recording and playback. We're going to get into the ATEM streaming bridge. There's not a whole lot to show there, but I just want to show how that works. we we'll also talk a little bit about the WebPresenter HD and the new 4K model. And then uh, we're going to get into BitFocus Companion with the Elgato Stream Deck, which is just such a cool way to do everything. And also talk about Mimo Live and the uh, Ultra Studio 4K. That was the word I couldn't remember earlier. That is uh, it's just it's awesome. So just to give you a little 
teaser of that, the Ultra Studio 4K is what allows me to do things like bring up this little lower third branding on there, or even bring up a little, oops, I hit the wrong button, bring up a little animated subscribe button. Um, I guess I should probably let that actually finish. There we go. Uh, that is all handled through Mimo Live and through that 4K, the Ultra Studio 4K. So we're going to take a look at all of that tomorrow. All right, guys, that's it for now. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I hope we'll see you again tomorrow in, um, in what, 21 uh, and a half hours from now. We'll see you back here again. Take care, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Hey, folks, that was all of day one. We're about to get into day two, and I just want to remind you that you are watching this ad-free other than the ad of me now asking you to consider becoming a channel member. Uh, that's it. Promise. Let's get to part two. All righty. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, and welcome to day two of this webinar. This is the Blackmagic ATEM webinar. I am your host, Photo Joseph, and I am going to take you on a big old whirlwind tour today of a bunch of stuff that is kind of add-on supplementary to the ATEM. Uh, mostly, we have got some things to do within the ATEM itself still. So a couple of things first, a couple of things on the agenda. Um, First of all, yesterday we were getting a lot of feedback that the quality of the stream was quite low. We're aware of that, and that's just a limitation of Zoom. Zoom will only allow us to output a 1280p, so 720 by 1280 webinar. However, 720p, I guess. Um, however, today we're doing something a little bit different. We have added a simultaneous stream to YouTube. This is a private stream just for you guys, and that link is in the chat right now. If you just go to photojoseph.com slash ATEM webinar, it'll redirect you to that YouTube link. Don't save that YouTube link because it won't be there once this is over, but you can save that photojoseph.com slash ATEM webinar. That will redirect you to the upload of this, which will go up hopefully next week. So go to that and you'll be able to watch this webinar in full 1080p. It'll be much better quality than what you've got in Zoom. However, don't leave Zoom. I still need you to stay in Zoom for the Q&A and, the, uh, and the, the comments, the comment system in Zoom, uh, sorry, the comment system in YouTube is shut down. So all chit chat, all chatter has to happen over on the Zoom platform. Uh, yes, it means you have two windows running at once, but you can obviously mute the Zoom one and hopefully that will work out for you. So with that said, let me jump into the agenda and, uh, and we'll get started. So let's see here. That's the wrong one. Oops. <laughs> Look at that. It looks like my sharing stopped. Let me uh, fix that momentarily. Wonder how that happened. It was sharing 10 minutes ago. I guess it just decided to drop the share. Come on, screen mirroring. So I'm just in case you're curious, because people always love to know the setup. The way that I'm showing the slides, which are, let's see here, make sure they're back to playing. And there we go, which are, there we go. Now that's working. Although it's not, you know, Everything breaks. I added like 15 things last night and a couple new ones this morning, and apparently I broke a few things. How did it break my slide split? Well, that's very un unfortunate. I don't know quite that happened. Well, anyway, the way that I was supposed to be doing this, so I got the slides here, and this is obviously an iPad, and this is obviously wireless. And it is screen mirroring to a little cheap little uh, receiver. It's a, um, I don't remember the name of it, but it's just this cheap little receiver that can receive uh, AirPlay from the iOS devices, it can receive it from a Google device, it's like 20 bucks or something, plugged into one of the inputs on an ATEM, and so I am just feeding this to there. We're supposed to have a split screen with me on the screen there as well, I don't know quite what happened. Somehow I broke that, but anyway, let's just move through these slides real quick like and get to the point. So the point is the format, first of all, uh, questions themselves. If you have questions, drop them into the Zoom Q&A module. There is a separate chat module from the Zoom Q&A module. Use the chat module, please. Then, oh yeah, I, I might, might take a water break. Managed not to do one yesterday. Um, also, just to repeat, in case you just tuned in, this is being simultaneously streamed at higher quality to YouTube. Turn the volume down on the Zoom one, watch the one on YouTube, and you'll have a much better quality experience. That link is in the chat module. You can go check that out right now. Okay, so let's see here. The agenda, slides back up, there we go. So yesterday we went through introduction to the ATEM, setup and switching basics, audio basics. We went through multi-screen options to some degree, didn't go super, super deep into it. We talked about macros and we talked about camera control. Today, here's today's agenda. We are starting with ISO recording and B-RAW. This is the ability to record a live show with all of its switching data and its ISOs on the ATEM, on a little external drive, but simultaneously 
record B RAW in the cameras with the Blackmagic Box Cinema cameras and then link those up. So we're gonna go through that whole process, bring it into Resolve. I'm gonna show you exactly how that works. It's really cool. Then, after that, we are going to have a chat about uh, the HyperDeck, and we're going to talk about how you can use the HyperDecks for both recording and for playback. We're going to talk about the ATEM streaming bridge. Uh, not a whole lot. This is going to be a, a fairly quick one, but we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the WebPresenter HD, and there's now a new model, the 4K, so we'll talk a little bit about that. And then we get into some of the fun third-party stuff. This is uh, starting with BitFocus Companion and Elgato Stream Deck. And then we will finish it up with Mimo Live and the Ultra Studio 4K Mini. And truth be told, those last two are gonna be kind of uh, all in one together because the way that I use them is all together. So it'll be, uh, there'll be a lot happening in one piece there, but that's how that's gonna go. Now, before we get started today, there, there were some questions that came in yesterday that we didn't get time to answer. I wanna actually start with these because I just wanna make sure, first of all, that everybody who attended yesterday gets their question answered. And, um, and some of these are really, really good questions. So we're just gonna dive right into these. Again, throughout the day today, if you have questions, drop them into the Q&A pod. Gary from Blackmagic, who is here on the show with me, uh, you know, everybody can wave at Gary now. There's Gary, and he's here with me today. He will be coming up to ask your new questions as they come in. So drop your questions in the Q&A whenever you want. He will aggregate those, refine them, and then read them to me as we go. But for yesterday's questions, some leftover questions. Um, this, is a, this is a good one and kind of a tough one to answer. What would be your list of must-haves for one-person operation? This is a great question, and I've as you can see here, I'm doing a one-person operation. If you saw the picture that I posted on Twitter yesterday of this, my view of this, it's kind of insane. And this is this is this insane because I'm doing a webinar about ATEMs using ATEMs. So it's quite meta the way things all tie together. There's just a lot of stuff here. Certainly not what you need to get started with a one-person operation. So the basics of a one-person operation. If it's in your budget, I would certainly recommend the ATEM Mini Extreme over the smaller models, primarily because of the super source. That's just, that's, even when you're just starting out, super source is so awesome to have. So that's gonna be the number one reason to have it. You probably don't need all eight inputs. You, um, you can get away without the headphone port, but having the super source, mm, that's pretty sweet. So if you can swing it, do that. If you can't, understandable, go for one of the smaller ones, totally fine. So you need obviously an ATEM. Your cameras, the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema cameras are ideal for a live streaming setup like this because you get the whole ISO recording, camera control, all that stuff we talked about yesterday. But again, higher end cameras, not necessarily in everybody's budget. The cheapest camera that I know of, and I have yet to be corrected, last time someone tried to correct me, somebody else corrected them that they were in fact wrong. <laughs> the cheapest camera that I know of that will work with this system is the Panasonic Lumix G7. And I'm not saying that just because, I'm a Lumix, just because I'm a Lumix ambassador, but it actually is, to my knowledge, the cheapest one. Why, what makes a camera usable for this kind of a setup? Two things, there's two requirements for a camera to be able to be used in a live stream setup through the ATEM. Number one is clean HDMI out. That means that when you plug in the HDMI cable from the camera into the ATEM, you can go into the menus in the camera and turn off all of the other metadata, all that screen data, you know, tells you what your exposure is and your focus, all those settings have to go away. That's called clean HDMI out. Cameras don't mark it with that terminology. They don't necessarily say it has clean HDMI out. Sometimes you have to dig into the menus, but that is required. The second thing that is required, is, and you can get away without this to some degree, but it really makes it much better to have, and that is a microphone port on the camera. Granted, the ATEMs do have microphone ports built into them, so you could get away with plugging your microphone into the ATEM. As discussed yesterday, you will have to deal with the latency issue and do a delay in the ATEM, and the delay on the G7 is significant, so you will be maxing out the delay capabilities of the ATEM to make it match. It'll work, but you're still much better off running your audio through the camera. It's just easier. So those are the two requirements. So that G7 is the cheapest camera. It's like five, hundred to $550. I've actually seen it on sale for as low as $450, and that's a camera with a lens. So that's, that's what you need there. Um, microphone. You need to have a good microphone. The cheapest good mic that you can get is going to be a wired lavalier mic. So a little lavalier like I'm wearing here, but wired straight into the camera or into the, uh, the ATEM itself. As you move up from there, you can get into boom mics, which have advantages and disadvantages. But a really good boom mic is going to give you a better quality sound. It's going to give you a more focused sound, 
but A, it costs more, B, they often have to run through XLR or audio interfaces, um, or you have to power them themselves. You have to you know, have batteries in them. But the problem, the biggest problem with using a boom or shotgun mic for any kind of live event is as you, let's say that I had one pointing at me here, as I moved over here, it would get quieter. And I move back and it gets louder again. If I turn around, it gets quieter. So if you're doing something where you're all over the place throughout your live show, your audio is going to be affected. Whereas by wearing a lavalier mic, it doesn't matter where you go, which direction you face, everybody can hear you equally. So advantage of the lavalier. Um, obviously, if it's wired, then you can't go very far, but then you can step up to wireless lavaliers like I'm wearing now. So lots of different ways to go there. Advantages, disadvantages each side, but the cheapest way is going to be a wired lavalier microphone. You can get cheap ones off Amazon for probably like 10, 20 bucks. Uh, if you wanna spend a little bit more money, Rode makes some really nice ones for about $100, and there's a bunch of them out there. So, you know, read the reviews, pick something, something that's not awful. Um, lighting, you know, you can get away without lighting, right? You can start without lighting, especially if you're very aware of lighting, set up next to a window, don't have a window behind you, you know, think about your backdrop and your setup and, oops, um, sorry, I guess I forgot to put on Do Not Disturb today. Um, set up your background and your, and your uh, lighting to be as good as you can. If you can be by a big window so you get nice big light from there instead of having just your overhead lights in your ceiling, that's gonna be better. Overhead lights and ceiling are usually awful. You wanna have light that's more at your level shining at you so as you start adding lights, but you don't need lighting to start. You can start without it, get a good window light, just set up everything properly and you're good to go. Um, needs, you need some kind of a monitor to be able to see what's going on on the ATEM. I mean, need, you can get away without it, but that's a little bit sketch to be doing it totally blind, but you can use any HDMI monitor, right? It can be just some cheap old monitor you have laying around. You can go to Best Buy or whatever and buy the cheapest HDMI television that you can get. That's, you could probably spend less than a hundred bucks and get something that will allow you to monitor your, your, um, your scene, your setup. And then if you're using the, and well, basically any of the models of the A10 mini that do the streaming, will have the multi-view out. And so that's what you really want to see. You want to see that multi-view. Um, you can the switcher, the camera, microphone, optional lighting, the monitor. I, those are kind of your basics. That's like, that's what you need. You can't really, you can't live stream without a way to live stream. That's the ATEM without a camera to see you and without a microphone to hear you. Everything above that is gravy. So those are the, those are the biggies. I hope that helps. I hope that helps. Next one. Is there anything you can do uh, is there anything you can do with a Stream Deck that you can't accomplish with a touch portal? Great question. So we'll, we'll see some of this later on. The Stream Deck is hardware. It's, so I changed my view here. I made it a little bit tighter. But if I go to the overhead and I pull this in, this is the Stream Deck as a physical interface. You can see all the buttons from today's show on here. I can load that same interface up on a... Uh, on a web browser so that I just, or on an iPad for touch so that I just see it. You have the same controls as far as using something like Companion goes. However, the Stream Deck does have additional functions within itself that have nothing to do with Companion's software interface. So like on my desk, so this big one here is normally living on my desk. When I'm not doing a live show, I'm using it as a launcher. You know, you got all these buttons on there for all my favorite apps. And that might seem gratuitous, and it is, but, you know, it's there, so I'm, I'm going to use it. And I have found that I actually really like having it as a launcher. Uh, right now, because it's here, I was at my desk this morning, and I keep, you know, wanting to launch an app, and I'm like, eh, it's not there. It, it spotlight launched the app. So it's really great for that. But as far as live streaming goes, the there's no difference in capabilities. Uh, th if you're using Companion, that's, that's the caveat there. You have to be using companions. There's no difference in the capabilities, but having that touch, that tactile, the buttons is really nice. You feel more confident in making your switch, especially when you're trying to hit something out of the corner of your eye or just glancing momentarily. It's so like, you'll see me as I glance down, you know, I'll glance down very quickly and I'll grab the, um, switch the cameras in there, but I'm not going, uh, well, sometimes I am because I can't find the button, but I'm not generally going, uh, which button is it? And then be very careful because with the touch interface, you know, you've got no tactile feedback when you reach down for it. If you're off on the button a little bit, it's very easy to, you know, go and go like, oh, I hit the wrong button. Where's the right button? And then you bring it back. So it, it is nice to have. Not required, but definitely nice. Okay. Is there a limitation for the ATEM's recording function, file size limitation and recording length? Um, and Gary, you made a comment here that you can help with this. Uh, the only thing that I 
know of is to say that the, the limitation is just the size of this drive. However big drive you put on here, that's the maximum. Um, I don't know if there's anything beyond that, Gary, I'll bring you up here that you wanted to add uh, that's more than that. I think that um, uh, some of the problems that people run across are the fact that uh, there's a certain file size that we have to stop uh, recording and starting a new, uh, start a new file, and this is due to the header uh, restrictions and how the, the thing was designed. There's a lot of ways this could be done, but it was chosen to pick a certain file size for the header. So basically, if you record for a real long time, you're going to have multiple files, uh, but they should be end-to-end -end, uh, contiguous, I think. Um, yeah, the size uh, shouldn't matter. The size of the disk uh, is pretty much what we go by because we can fill up one disk and then auto uh, trickle over to the next next disk uh, in the set. So that shouldn't be a problem. All right, thanks, Gary. Yeah, that's something I actually didn't mention yesterday when we were talking about the two USB ports and how on the extreme, how you have two USB ports, you can set one USB port to be recording for your hard drive and you set the other one to go out to uh, the ATEM, uh, to your computer, but you can also plug in two drives. And in fact, you can plug in a hub into one of them and plug in two USB drives and the system will see both drives. And as one fills up, it'll automatically switch over to the other one. And at that point, you can take out drive one, replace it. And then when drive two fills up, it goes back to drive one. So you can do that using both ports or you can do that just using a hub plugged into your um, your ATEM. So that's, that basically gives you unlimited duration. You, know, you just keep on adding more hard drives, unlimited duration there. So thank you for that question. Okay, um, what is the branded model of the SDI to HDMI converter you mentioned? Okay, so, and it, there's some notes in here from Gary about what I might've been talking about. So this, the HDMI to SDI is this one right here. Actually, I'm gonna go for this close up view and get that in. So this is the Blackmagic micro converter. This is the bi-directional one. And Gary was talking about this a little bit more yesterday. Uh, and this is really designed to take SDI cameras and put them onto the HDMI system or vice versa. But this is not, this is more than you would need just to go HDMI to SDI. There are cheaper Blackmagic converters that do that. Where this question might have come up is yesterday I mentioned an SDI to USB converter that I'm using in my office. That is from a company called Inogeni, and I N O G E N I N I N O G E N I. I think that's right, Inogeni, or maybe it's two ends in there. But that hardware is specifically SDI to USB, and so the way that I am streaming this feed to Zoom, because Zoom needs a webcam, is the one of the SDI outputs from my big ATEM, that's, which my, this whole show that you're watching is being run on the big ATEM, uh, the 2ME, one of the SDI outputs from that is running from the ATEM in the rack all the way into my office, and there in my office it plugs into that Inogeni, which then gets converted to USB, plugged into the Mac, and Zoom sees that. So that's how that works, and that's probably what the question was yesterday. The only HDMI to SDI converter that I mentioned was the Blackmagic. All right, uh, let's see here. Talk more about using the HyperDeck to extend the media pool to be triggered by playback and record actions of the ATEM. We're actually going to cover that today. So we'll be talking a bit about what the HyperDeck is, how it works, and how you can control playback of it. So that we're going to cover today. Can you bring a stereo feed into the extreme ISO? And if so, what is the workflow? Great question. Absolutely. So both of the microphone inputs are stereo inputs. In fact, all most cameras, I shouldn't say all cameras, at least most cameras, have stereo microphone inputs. And so as long as you're feeding in a stereo microphone, whether that's a dual mic setup in a dual array where you've got kind of a left and right, so you hear the panning, or you're just coming off of a mixing board, you've got a live event and you have stereo sound for that that plugs into the mini ports here, Yes, absolutely, you can bring in stereo. So again, if you're doing stereo with two microphones or a stereo microphone that has a left and right channel, then that will just plug into the camera, come into the ATEM like anything else. The ATEM will see it as stereo and off you go. If you're doing something off of a mixing board, again, let's say a live music where you want that stereo separation for live music, whoever's running the mixing board, as long as they're sending you a stereo feed, and that would probably be an XLR out that they would be feeding out, you'd have some kind of a converter box to go from XLR to mini to the 3.5 millimeter, and you feed that in, it'll stay stereo all the way through, and you'll have stereo in here. So absolutely stereo support. Uh, are you... Going into setting up a streaming set with a fixed IP, I didn't quite understand this question, streaming set with a fixed IP. So I am gonna talk about live streaming using the web presenter. Um, 
Maybe you mean fixed IP of your, like if you have a fixed IP, but I don't, it doesn't change whether you're fixed IP from your ISP or you have a DHCP server, whether you set the ATEM to be DHCP or you assign it a fixed IP. That doesn't change anything about the streaming setup. That IP address is how your hardware is found on the network, but we're talking about going the other direction. You're streaming from here out, and as long as it is successfully on your network, then you go in here and you set up an, a, a destination to YouTube or wherever you like. Um, if, you're, if you're thinking, maybe, now that I say that, maybe what you mean is you're streaming to a specific IP address, because in the, let me take, pull up the settings here real quick and then I'll switch over to the screen. Make sure I'm looking at the right ATEM. Yes, I am. Um, live stream. Okay, so maybe what you mean is in here, if you want to go to a custom platform that's not in here, if that's what you meant, then to do that, you have to modify an XML file. And I actually did a video on this a while ago on my YouTube channel. So if you just go to YouTube, you search Photo Joseph, um, search atem and restream.io. When I did that video, the premise of the video is adding restream.io to the ATEM. Since then, Blackmagic has added support for restream.io natively, so you no longer have to modify, modify the XML to do that. However, that video will show you how to modify the XML, and then you can obviously put whatever address you want in there. So it's a manual process. You have to go into the code a little bit, but you can set the, hyper de uh, set the um, ATEM to stream to any destination that you want. Gary's got something he wants to say. I'm going to pull him back up here. Yes, I will add uh, to that off my sound. Uh, basically, um, since the Web Presenter HD came out, um, they've added to the code the ability to create a small XML file with just the information you need and to be able to import that directly. Uh, the information for that is in the Web Presenter manual, but that actually works on the ATEMs. If you look on the ATEM menu um, for stream, you'll have the ability to import an XML file for a particular streaming site. That's a lot easier than editing that uh, specific XML, which is buried in a protected area of your computer. So um, you can basically create, uh, I think there's a sample in the manual. Um, if not, you can contact me and I'll, I'll get you one. Uh, but basically, you, it's, it looks the same. It's the same uh, text as in the XML, but it's just the service section of it. And you can import that directly into the ATEM or the web presenter. I hope that makes it a little bit easier for everyone. Awesome. Okay, thank you. I did not know that. It's funny because I actually saw in the web presenter setup the ability to load a file, and I thought, Oh, that's interesting. I wonder exactly what that's for, but that is, and I hadn't looked into the manual for that. So, okay, cool. Um, what he's talking about, let me show you that load option. So this is the, obviously the ATEM software. Again, here we have our different platforms we can stream to, but if you go up to the stream menu, there is a load streaming settings. And the way that I've, I know the way it was originally designed, the way that I've used it in the past is for loading settings for the, um, the stream, the stream, what's it called? <laughs> the stream deck, the thing where the Gary's streaming to. There are too many products. I keep forgetting names of things. Um, the, the bridge, the streaming bridge. Thanks, Gary. Um, when you set up a streaming bridge, and we're going to talk about this in a moment here. When you set up a streaming bridge, you generate an XML file, and that's how you would import that XML file. So, um, so that's how that works. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see here. And that was it. Okay. So that was the questions. Thank you very much for all those additional questions from yesterday. All right. Let's get into, and I'm going to try really hard to do the slides this time. Let's get into ISO recording and B-RAW. So this is so fun and so cool how well this works. Let me step back, overarching concept of what we're doing, and then we're going to do it. So here's the idea. During a live show, you're live streaming, you have the ability to record your live show to a hard drive to a little little SSD or whatever hard drive you plug in, like this guy here. If you have one of the ISO models, so this only applies to the ISO model, so that's the ATEM, um, ATEM Mini Pro, ATEM Mini Pro ISO or the ATEM Mini Extreme ISO. Just, I'm really wondering what word's going to get added next to this whole thing. Good grief, these names are getting big. All right. So if you have a model that says ISO on it, then the benefit of that is that on this hard drive, not only do you get the program, which is, of course, what the audience saw, you also get the ISOs. And the ISOs, 
ISO is short for isolated stream. It's the isolated individual video stream coming into the ATEM. So if you had eight cameras plugged in, you will have recordings of all eight of those cameras, regardless of whether they are on air or not. You also get an XML file that opens in DaVinci Resolve that will have all of your switches. So if you switch from A to B, you need to cross this all from B to C, all of that data is in there. And the idea being that you can take this drive, plug it in, you know, copy your files over and open it in Resolve, and go in and re-edit your show without having to start from scratch. So imagine, you know, I've got this live show and I, you know, this, we're doing a live show here, everything's great, and I go, okay, now we're gonna go to camera B. Oops, I went to C, darn it, go back to B. Okay, well, your live audience just saw that mistake, right? They got that. But if you're going to upload the show later to, at, at a higher quality to YouTube or whatever, you can edit that mistake out. So I'd go into Resolve and I go, where was that place I went to camera C instead? Oh, there it is. And you get rid of that switch or you switch to the right place or whatever it is. If your timing is off, you can go and re-edit the timing. If you decide to change the whole thing, uh, you know, oh, I completely, I did a whole thing on the overhead camera, but I forgot to switch to the overhead. I'm really good at that myself. I'll sit there and talk to you for 10 minutes about something I'm doing here. And I look up and realize <laughs> I forgot to switch to that camera. Well, the live audience suffers, but when you upload that later, you can change all of that. So that's what the ISO does. Now we add in the next level of this, and that's the B-RAW support, Blackmagic RAW from the Pocket Cinema camera. So this only applies to the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema cameras, but you can enable recording of B-RAW in the cameras. So when you start recording on here, it starts recording to this, plus it triggers recording on the cameras. And you now have the Blackmagic RAW files in 4K, in the case of the 4K camera, or in 6K, in the case of this camera. You then bring those files into Resolve along with the project off of here. Everything automatically links up. We're gonna see all of this. And you can then re-edit in 4K or even in 6K. So your live show may have only been HD, but you can re-upload a, a version of it later in 4K or even 6K. Or of course, if you're just doing a 4K production, but you got a 6K camera, then that 6K camera gives you a lot of room to push into the shot if you wanna do some reframing. So super, super powerful feature and capability. Again, the whole ISO part on its own works just with the ISO. You don't need the Blackmagic cameras. If you want to relink to the B-RAW files, then you need the Blackmagic cameras for that. Now, now to be fair, you can manually do this. If you have non-black magic cameras, you can go to those manu those cameras and manually hit record on them and record internally to whatever format they record to or have an external recorder and capture whatever you want, but you will not have the time code sync. You will have to manually relink those and manually set up that um, the linking of those high resolution files to the ones that are on here. It's possible, but it's just not as easy as what I'm about to show you. So with that said, let's get started here. All right, let me fire up the iPad here, and I'm going to switch to a multi-view. And I actually want to show you something else that's kind of neat um, that I neglected to show you yesterday. So let's see here. I'm going to hit play on, actually, before I even hit play on the iPad, let me switch over to the side view. So you can see the iPad here. This is the, you're physically looking at it. I'm in Keynote, and you can see the Keynote layout and presentation here. And if we look at the multi-view, you see on, um, so let's see if I do this, it's right there. Okay, ignore the preview side, but on the program side, you can see the, the uh, iPad coming out and it's mirrored. You're seeing the same thing. Okay, now if I hit play on this keynote presentation, remember yesterday I talked about when you play a movie or a photo out of the Photos app on the iPad that you get to see that full screen, whereas when you're not viewing it, you see the interface and it's cropped. Well, now we're playing the slide deck. You're seeing the slides in full screen, but look at the actual iPad, on the iPad, I'm getting my current and next slide layout. And I can even go in in Keynote and I can change the layout of here to whatever I want. But this allows me to see the current and the next slide while the audience is seeing, that's there in the iPad view, let me pull it up there, the audience is seeing just the slide itself. So that is a, a really awesome feature to have. Um, and another really cool thing about the iPad for this, that will work off of a laptop as well. If you have a laptop set into here as a dual screen layout, um, exact same thing will happen. So I neglected to show that yesterday, so I wanted to show that. Okay, so back into this, back to the extreme. So I've got three cameras on here. I've got, there's camera one, that's the 4K. I've got camera two over here, that's the 6K. And then of course there's the iPad. And you can see over, um, over on the right-hand side, there is a super source that I've set up um, as well. So I've got a bunch of stuff set up in here. Um, and then, oh, in the bottom left, you'll see a, it says Photo Joseph. There's a little, uh, little lower third on there. So we're gonna incorporate that into this as well. I do wanna point out, and I'm gonna take this opportunity to do this. 
while the ATEM uh, ISOs will record most things that happen, it doesn't actually do absolutely everything. So a super source is one of the things that it will not capture. You would have to rebuild that super source in post later. It is not going to capture that super source for you, unfortunately, but it does do the vast majority of the switching that you need. So, uh, all right, what I'm going to do is start recording and do a couple of quick little camera switches, and then we're going to pull the file out and, uh, and pop it into the computer. So first things first is to plug the hard drive in. So again, just USB. I've got this little Samsung T5 drive. These things are great for this. They're tiny. They weigh nothing. They don't require external power. Um, they're great. So recommend these little guys for that. Okay, that's plugged in. Um, the cameras are ready. I can see, yep, I can see, you can see the displays on both of the cameras. I see they're obviously on. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, just make th going through my head, making sure I don't have anything else to set up. I set this all up last night, so hopefully it's, it's all going to go to plan. All right, I'm going to start it. So I will start, let's go to the multi-view. So you're going to see the multi-view. Part of what you're going to get to see in the multi-view, see where am I looking? Part of what you'll get to see in the multi-view is the... Uh, the buildup on the preview that I'm going to do. Oh yeah, that was the one thing I wanted to shut up, set up. Okay, so right now, you're seeing the same image in preview and program. If I switch to camera two, you see the same thing there. And if you've only ever worked with the ATEM this way, you might be thinking, I don't understand what the whole point of the preview thing is in there. Well, in software, I can go in, so let's do this. I have a whole bunch of new presets set up. Um, there we go. Okay. So in software, this is the software for the A10 Mini. On the right-hand side, you're seeing the multi-view out. You'll notice here, if I, I'm going to hit the button on the hardware. I'm going to go to camera two. And you see on the left-hand side, there is both a program and a preview. And they are both switching simultaneously, right? What I can do, though, is I can load a separate preview. So I'm going to hit the preview button here and you see it loads up a separate preview. Now I've got a separate window over here. So we're seeing this camera in the preview and this camera in the program. This would allow me to then build the preview. The whole idea here is that you build the preview. I go, all right, I want this shot. I want this lower third. I want this bug. I want this graphic. You build everything and then you bring it to air. That's how the preview works. Now, if you're self-producing, if you're self-switching, you're not going to use preview because you would never go, oh, hold on, audience, while I set this up and then switch over to it, you're not going to do that. So the kind of default position of the hardware is to just do that, that immediate switch. You can do the preview setup in software, but you can do preview switching on the hardware itself. You just have to change a setting. So this is something that I had meant to show you yesterday and I forgot to. So I'm going to show this to you now and I actually need this set up for, uh, for the thing I'm about to do. So to do this, let's go back to the Mac here. We go into the, here it is, the ATEM setup app. And this, is the, this app controls all the hardware it sees on the network. So I've got my, so just to run through and see everything that's in here. Um, I have an old A10 Mini that's in the rack that's handling a couple things. I got this A10 Mini Extreme ISO, that's the one that's on my desk. The A10 Mini Pro ISO in my office, the three streaming bridges, so we'll talk about those later, and then the big A10, the 2ME. That's everything that's on my network right now. So let me go back to the one that I want to edit. Uh, here it is. And this button right here will launch this software, the ATEM software control, but this button will open up some settings. There's not a whole lot in here, but this is where you'll find the IP address that your, your uh, ATEM is using. So if it's self-assigned, this is where it's gonna show up. And down here, you have a few options under panel. This is the main one that I wanna show you, this switching mode. By default, it's set to cut bus, and cut bus means that when I hit a button here, it is going to immediately cut to that, that input, to that bus. However, if I set it to program preview, now what happens, let me save this and I'll go back to, uh, let's see, I'm going to go to this layout. Yep, that's the layout. Now, if you look at these buttons, so I push camera two. So we got in the program and the preview are both the same thing. Now I push button two on here. Button two has gone green. Green meaning it's in preview mode. Red is on air. And now we're seeing the preview and the on air cameras in the preview and the on air part of the multi view. Now to do a cut between them, I hit the cut button and it cuts between them. Or I, and you see they swap places. So I can cut back and forth. So if I'm cutting back and forth between two camera angles, it's literally just one button in this mode. If I wanted to do a transition, I would set up a transition. Let's do a simple dissolve, make it uh, half a second long, and I hit auto and it does that transition. And so that is the power of the uh, preview program mode in hardware itself. So now that that's enabled, now I'm going to do my little show demo. Okay, so um, we're going to go to this 
view. No, we're going to start in this view. We're going to leave it here to start. It's all planned out. I just have to remember what I planned. And we'll go for uh, starting with this one camera. I guess it doesn't really matter, but we're going to start with this camera. Okay, so we're set. I'm going to go ahead and hit record. There's a record button on the ATEM, or I can do it in software, but I'll hit the record button on the ATEM. That lights up red. It's recording. These cameras are both also recording as well. And now I'm going to start with just a simple cut. So I'll cut back and forth between these two. So we've got um, camera one, camera two, camera one, camera two. I don't even know which one I'm looking at anymore. Um, so there's my cuts in there. Set that up. Okay, so I've got a couple cuts. Now let's do a simple transition. So I've got a mix. I'll do a one and a half second long mix, and I'll do that nice slow dissolve between them. Okay, that's set up. Now I want to bring in a slide. So I'm a live on air with this camera, live on air, and now I want to bring in my slides. So I'm gonna hit number three to bring up slides as a preview. And now let's do a wipe, we'll do a diagonal wipe on here and I'll hit that button and it does the auto wipe into that. Okay, so now I'm back to, uh, let's see here. I wanna take this camera, for, camera four, uh, camera one, sorry. And I'm gonna bring that to the preview. And now I'm gonna switch over to the software view on the left. So that is, there we go. And I'm gonna build a lower third on here. So to do this, I'm going to use the downstream key. So I'm gonna hit tie. And what tie does is it doesn't bring it on air immediately. It ties it to the next transition so that when I do the transition, as you can see it being built on the preview, that's gonna come over. So that is set up, that's ready to go. Um, now all I have to do is do the same transition, go back to this view, same transition I did before, I'll do a different wipe on here, I'll hit auto, and it's gonna auto wipe over there, and I come up with that lower third. Okay, so there's, there's my show, right? Got it, all set. Let's stop recording. Stop recording, there we go. And, um, and that's it, so now we can start loading up the files. So, let's take, let's go back to this view. Um, I'm gonna pull this off, by the way, there's no eject on here, you just pull it off. Here's a really cool thing about this. If you yank this while it's recording to it, it will actually close the file safely. So you will, even if this accidentally gets yanked out, you don't lose your entire show. I don't know how they do that, but that's magic. Okay. <clears throat> um, plug in the USB into, plug this into my computer. And let's bring up the Mac. And I should have folders set up for this. Okay, there's my folder. Let's get the hard drive. The, there it is. And um, there we go, ATEM Webinar 3. That's what I just did, so I'm gonna copy that over. While that is copying, I am going to grab the SD cards out of these other cameras. So pull this out of here and pull this one out of here. And this is the part of the demo where I go, I really hope I did everything right. <laughs> like I said, set it all up last night. This should totally work. Um, I'm going to show you to the cards that I'm using. So because I'm recording to RAW, that means there's a lot of data being generated very, very quickly. Um, I'm using these cards from a company called Prograde. The, let me get these to the right angle so you can actually see. There we go. Which, actually, hold on. Let me switch how I hold these. There we go. These are Prograde cards. These are rated V90. So these are the really fast cards that will, that will support the RAW. I'm trying to rotate these. There we go. That will support the RAW. Uh, uh, data flow. So I highly recommend that. And then for the reader, I'm also using a ProGrade reader. This one is a dual SD card reader. So you can I can do both at once. It is USB-C and it is more than just being a dual reader. It is very fast, very robust, and this will give you the kind of performance that you would expect from the rest of your system. I think a lot of people make the mistake of, of uh, you know, using all these you know, great cameras with high resolution image and these fast cards, and then they go and they plug it into the SD card reader on their laptop, or they just use some cheap SD card reader from, you know, that they've got at, Bymar, uh, at um, Walmart or something. And it's, it's not the same. Uh, the performance is just not gonna be there. So definitely invest in a good reader if you are going to invest in all the rest of this gear. All right, uh, so with that said, I'm gonna pop these two cards in, and let's go back to the computer, and... There's the first, there's camera. That's a problem. Didn't record. Did I, <gasps> did I neglect to, where's my recording? Oh, I had it turned on. Rut row. Rut row. Something happened. Something went wrong. <laughs> Gary, what happened? Why did it break? 
I actually was uh, busy looking at something else, so I oh, no. didn't catch what you were actually doing. So um, I don't know what I didn't happened. See if I if we missed any steps That's there. That's terrible. I didn't miss. I'm okay. We're just going to do this again. I don't know why that happened. Um, in a real world scenario, you would obviously take the time to go to the cameras and make sure that they were recording, um, which I clearly didn't do. So all right, we're just going to we're going to do the whole thing again. Man, that's a bummer. It's totally worked. All right. Um, Sorry about that, guys. Okay, back to this. Let's just redo that. So I got the cards back in. Uh, let's go back to the Mac and eject those two cards. What a bummer. Man, never do live shows with children, animals, or technology. They're all just begging for disaster. All right, so that's both the cards out. Let's pop these out. What I'm going to do is reformat each card in the camera to make sure it's totally super ready to go. And this is already set, that's fine. So we'll put that there. What a bummer, sorry about that guys. And that makes for a bummer demo, doesn't it? All right, well now you get to see how this process works. Pop this in and, does it see it? No card, oh, fascinating. Okay, there it is. Card, format SD card, format card, format, hold this button for three seconds, and it formats that card. Okay, so there's that one. And now let's do the other one here. I don't know if you can even see this or not. I'm trying not to get in the way of the shot too much. Okay, format the card, format, format, format. And good to go. Okay, ready to use. Cards ready to use, exit that. Card is ready to use, exit that. And let's just see, I'm just gonna go ahead and hit record now. Yeah, and that says it's recording. Oh, that one's not. Oh, interesting, it's got a little exclamation point on it. Why is that? Now it's recording. This one did, okay, hold on. Troubleshooting in real time, that is super fun, guys. All right, let me turn that off. <clears throat> Everything is set. I don't know why. Record again. Now it's recording, and now it's recording. Very strange. I don't have any idea why it didn't work the previous time. Um, the demo gods were not happy today. But everything's recording now, so I'm just, I'm not gonna stop. I'm just gonna let it go, and let's do the thing. So, let's set this up again. Uh, we go to the Mac and Multiview. That's the one that I want. And, oh, actually, we're going to go for the overhead and the multi-view. There's the one. Okay, so we are going to switch from camera one to two. There's our cuts from camera one to two. So there's that. Okay, so cutting, cutting, cutting. Yay, yay, yay. I want to do a dissolve. I'll set it to a simple cross-dissolve and do that. And we see that cross-dissolve in there. So that's all good. And then I'm going to load up the slides into the preview. We will do a wipe into that slide. So there's that transition. And then I'm going to go into the software and, and I could do this in the hardware as well. Uh, actually, no, I can't. I can't do a tie in the hardware. So I need the software for this. Set up that lower third, that lower third, by the way, here in the media pool that's set up. Is that's, I clicked on tie, so that's ready to go. And now I go back over to the hardware and let's go for a, uh, we'll do something else. Um, let's do a wipe, I guess. Let's do a wipe and affect that. And there's the wipe, and there it is. Okay, that time, we got it. Stop recording. Cross all your fingers and all your toes, ladies and gentlemen. Hope I got this right this time. And good. Okay, so now we yank this. Pop this under here. Start this whole process over again. Back to the Mac. And go to that. So we'll just delete that previous one so we don't get them confused. And to the number four. There we go. Copy over number four. Okay, while that's copying, I'm gonna grab the SD cards. And there's number one. And there's number two. Doesn't matter which one's. Kind of cool thing about the, um, the cameras, they will name the card with the first number in the name being the camera number. So you know which is camera one and camera two. Kind of cool. Uh, all right, let me eject this. Again, our super duper prograde reader. Here we card one and two. And back to the Mac. And there it is. Okay, so there's our second file. 
yeah, right, because we did the test. Yes, it's the second one. I want the second one. And I guess I did two tests, so we're going to take the third one there. All right, so all of those are there. Now, with these copied over, um, oh, you can see, by the way, these file sizes on these things. These are pretty big, right? That was just the short duration. There was five and a half gigs on the 6K camera and two, a little over two gigs on the 4K camera. So these are, these are going to be big files. And I think... I think I have this compression set, the 12 to 1, the most compressed B-RAW. So when you're shooting RAW, you're going to get some big files. You're going to need some big cards for sure. Okay. Um, that said, let's go back here. Now, let me show you what's in these folders. This is what's created. So this, again, is what came off of the ATEM itself. If I open this up, the first thing there is the actual, um, uh, the actual Resolve file. So that's what we're going to open up in DaVinci Resolve. Here... I guess this must be two, two. I'm not sure why there's two in here. So there's the one that I just did. Is this the previous one? Yeah. Oh, that's from when I hit, hit record and then stopped again very quickly. So it recorded both of those into there. So there's, there's my program. So these are both program files. That was from the first very quick test. And then this is the second one. So this is the actual program file we're dealing with. So from here, we see everything that happened, right? All the switches that are in here all the cross dissolves, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's the final uh, buildup and then the final wipe over. Okay, so that's the program file. This is what the audience saw. Then you have audio source files. This records a dedicated audio file for each input. You do not need all of these necessarily, and you're gonna have your audio on the video file as well if the audio is coming through the camera. It's just that it's giving you these separate audio files. Anything you don't need, you can just throw away but they're there just in case you need them. And notice that it did record an audio track and you'll see it did a video track as well for every single input. So if I go now to the video ISO files and we see in here, there's all the different camera inputs. Oh yeah, see there's the camera one and camera two, a camera one, take one and take two because I stopped and started again so quickly. That's why we're seeing multiples. Um, but we're seeing one for each input, even though you know some of these are just black, right? It's just blank. You'll notice the blank ones, the black ones are very small. You can see they're, they're very small files in here because it is a variable bit rate. It's solid black, so it is a small file, but it does record everything the whole time. Here's camera one, just the camera one input. So we scrub through here, there's the entire camera one feed. We go to you know here, the entire camera two feed. The whole, whole feed is there. So why does it record the black files? I get this question a lot. Why is it doing that? Because it is simply recording what's on that channel. It doesn't know if you intend to add something to that channel later. So I could just plug in a camera in the middle of a show. You wouldn't want it to go, oh, now I have to start recording or, um, or if a camera blanks out for a second, it stops recording. You don't want that, so it just records everything. You can plug in a camera live, you can hot plug a camera in in the middle of a show, and it will just pick up and the, your black file will suddenly have picture on it. So that's why that works that way. You've just got all the files in there. So, um, so. And again, if you don't need it, you just throw it away, but because they're variable bit rate, if they're just solid black, they take up very little space. Okay, so back to this. Now, I've got all of these files and I got all my ISOs, and then here's those two RAWs. I can load the RAWs in two different ways. I can either manu either open up the project file without the RAWs and then add them in, and that's really easy, and I'll show you how to do that. Or what I can also do is just create a folder, call it BRAW, and I'm gonna put this in here, and then take these and put them into that BRAW folder, and DaVinci will, uh, Resolve will actually just find them, which is kind of cool. All right, I'm just gonna double click on this ATEM webinar and let that open up into the Resolve. I'm using the full studio version here. You don't need the full studio version. You can do this with the free version as well. And loading the ATM webinar, and there it is. Okay, so, oh yeah, see, here's the first one when I was testing it, and then there's the gap, and then here's the second one. So here's the real show. So as I scrub through here, okay, here's my first camera angle switches. You can see here, I'll play through. There's our cuts from camera one to two. So there's those cuts in there. And if I wanted to make any change in there, I can just go in and start cutting. Oh, I cut too soon. I want to change the angle, whatever I want to do in there. Here's the transition. A little dissolve in there. Um, and so the wipe, the transition is a wipe. didn't come through as a wipe. It comes through as a simple dissolve. So that's something you go in and manually set if you really wanted that wipe in there. And then let's go to the end here where I built up to the graphic. And that... And there's the graphic in there. And so you can see here on the timeline, there's that photo Joseph graphic that I had, that lower third. So all of that is in there. All right, so now what about the raw? Well, look up here in the 
in the media pool, and you'll see there's a folder called Blackmagic Raw. Notice that I didn't call the folder Blackmagic Raw, I just labeled it B Raw. Um, it found it and goes, okay, these are your Blackmagic Raw files. Also notice in here that, on, that I have a folder called ISO, and inside of that, every ISO is set up in a folder that matches the name of the input. So this input is, this folder is called BMPCC 4K, this one's called BMPCC 6K, and um, this one down here is called iPad. If we look back at the switching software, and I go into my settings in here, you'll um, go to where are we labels, you'll see that those are the labels that I had actually named these inputs. So I named them BMPCC 4K and 6K in the software. So by labeling it that way in the ATEM software, when we go into Resolve, they're all named that way already. So just really, really clean integration of the way I configure the hardware and how that Resolve file gets generated. I, I love that. It's a really nice, really nice attention to detail. Okay, so I've got the BRAW files in there, right? They automatically showed up. If, they, if I hadn't moved them in, then it wouldn't have found them, or maybe I just copied them over later. Then to add them in, all I would have to do is the software would create, go back to this level, it would create this Blackmagic RAW folder anyway, and when you opened it, it would just be empty. And so I would simply drag and drop the files into there. That's literally all I have to do to load them. And now to get the BRAW up, let's go to a clip where we can tell. So here's, here's video of me, right? We know that this is the, the one that we were seeing in camera because it's got the color on it. This, is, this is, um, has a final look on it. Up here, zoom into this a bit, it's a tiny little button. But right here, and I think the thing will pop up. There we go. Let me scroll over, and there it is. You see this button that says Show Camera Originals. When I click that, it switches over to show me the RAW. And now, just visually looking at it, I can tell it's RAW because it's dimmer. It, it doesn't have a LUT applied. This is a log file, basically. And there is the final thing that was actually streamed, but there is the, um, the LUTed file. So that is how you do that. Super, super easy to do. And at this point, now I could go in and manually color grade these, obviously re-edit however I want, push into a file if I want to, whatever you want. Super, super slick. So minus the kerfuffle in the beginning there, um, that came out great. That worked out great. So let's go to questions, see if there's any that we've got, and then I will proceed with the next parts of the, of the plan today. So Mr. Gary, you're up, my friend. Do we have any questions right now? Okay, um, yes, several questions. So is BRAW more efficient than other format uh, types and which file types are best to choose at which times when using this system and equipment? Uh, I know you can't choose uh, anything other than BRAW in the camera for recording, but for doing the editing and stuff, maybe that would be the question. Sure, okay, so like Gary said, you when you're doing this system, they only record in B-RAW. You can't tell the camera to record to any other format. It's just B-RAW. You do have the choice of, of uh, the compression level of B-RAW. So you can go for the, I think three to one, I think is the lowest compression and 12 to one is the most. I think that's right. So you can choose that, but that's it. If you are, um, so again, in, in the in, coming out of the ATEM, you don't have any choice of what gets created. It's just that MP4 file at 1080p resolution. Excuse me. So... There's not really any other choice in there. Working with the B-RAW, you have the added capability, you have the dynamic range of that. You've got a broader dynamic range. You've got that raw file, uh, that um, log file, so you can color grade it however you want to. So you can, you know, if you blew out a shot, it was overexposed, odds are you'll be able to recover it if it wasn't too overexposed. So you have a lot of flexibility in working with RAW. If you remove the Blackmagic cameras from the system and you're just using other cameras and you're gonna record either internally or to an external recorder, you could be recording to you know, MP4, to HEVC, to ProRes. At that situation, at that sense, you're taking advantage of what those codecs have to offer, just like any other shooting situation. So, you know, HEVC is highly compressed, but very high quality, smaller file, allows you to do things like shooting in HDR natively and, and um, um, HLG. So you could do a camera where it's recording HLG, hybrid log gamma, HDR in camera, and then you're doing the switching, but of course you'd have to rematch those manually later. Um, if you were shooting to ProRes RAW, you wanted to do ProRes RAW, you have some recorders that record ProRes RAW attached to your camera, you capture ProRes RAW, exact same thing, you just have to do it manually. Now, you can 
uh, within Black Magic, I don't believe Black Magic supports. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't believe that DaVinci Resolve supports ProRes RAW. That's a Final Cut thing. You can take your Resolve project and move it over to Final Cut. There will be a little bit of cleanup stuff that you have to do, especially when it comes to relinking to the um, the originals. There's not this really slick auto relink to the originals format, but this timeline that you just saw here, I can export this out and bring it over to uh, to Final Cut. That is possible. And I'm I'm sure that you can do this with Premiere as well. I'm not a Premiere editor, so I, I, I'm not going to go hand on hard on that, but I'm, I'm almost positive that you can. But you absolutely can do it with with um, uh, with Final Cut. In fact, I did a video on this. There's another one on my channel. If you search on YouTube for Photo Joseph and then um, ISO, do A10 Mini ISO, A10 Mini Pro ISO. And I did this whole thing where I shot, I brought in a musician into the studio here. It's actually a really cool project. Brought a musician into the studio. She played a song. I did a whole four camera shoot. I had one on a on an arm. I had like all this stuff set up. And so you see a whole behind the scenes. And then I take that project into Resolve. I convert it over to Final Cut. And then I do a re-edit or whatever in, in Final Cut. Um, really slick. It was kind of a fun project. Encourage you to watch that one. That was super cool. But then you'll see how that moves over to, um, to Final Cut if that's what you want. Um, or you know, edit and resolve because it's awesome. Resolve rocks. I really need to learn the color tools more in resolve. Okay. Um, anything else, Gary? Okay. So did the cards, um, when you had them in the camera and formatting, did the cards show space uh, used or allocated on the drive in some way? They they show how much space is available, how much recording time you will get given whatever compression setting you have. So if I set it to the lowest compression setting, it would probably say like five minutes. With the higher compression setting, it's, I don't know, whatever it was, like 20 minutes or something recording time. So, but it does tell you how much recording time is left on the card. There was a question about the um, ISO recording and the audio, and I think you might have answered it. Um, which audio will be recorded on the ISO video? And uh, it's more important to know that the program audio is always attached to the video recordings, um, which is why we provide the separate WAV files for the separate uh, audio files. Okay, great. I'm glad you pointed that out. I, I don't think I realized that. So perfect. Great. Thank you. Oop, you're muted. Uh, one of the uh, couple of uh, people have asked, uh, maybe at the end we can talk about this again, to post links of the non-Blackmagic products that you mentioned um, and maybe possibly email them to registered users at the end or have some method that they can look up uh, some of these other products you were talking about. Okay. Um, yeah. What I'll do is, because I'm going to be uploading this to my YouTube channel, I will record, I will have a list of the links there of the products and I can then, uh, when I make that, I can share that with you and you can send that out to, um, to everybody. Um, yeah, that's a good idea. Okay, cool. I can do that. I have to remember, Gary, remind me if I forget, but I will, I can definitely do that. Yeah, we'll do. I think we can continue on right now. Okay, great. All right, so next up is, look, I actually got my slides ready. Next up is the HyperDeck, both for recording and for playback. So let's talk about, actually, I should have pulled up a web page. Let me pull up a web page and show you what the HyperDeck's lineup looks like. I have previous edition of the HyperDeck's installed here, and I'm going to show that to you in just a moment. There are some new generations of them. I'm not super intimately familiar with all the new features in the new ones, but I will show you the lineup here. So this is the Blackmagic website. Go to Capture and Playback. And, uh, oh, sorry, not Capture and Playback. My wrong. Um, video auto monitor test, multi view routing, streaming coding. Nope, we'll do it live. Where's this? Where are they? Are they? Do disc record? Oh, disc recording. There we go. Duplication disc recording. There's, I think we went. There we go. Hyperdeck Studio HD Mini, the Hyperdeck Studio HD Plus, which is 4K. Um, I'm gonna look Gary, give Gary the side eye right now and ask why this is not just called the Hyperdeck Studio 4K, but because this one does do full 4K. You see here it goes up to 2160p 30, so that's 4K 30 frames per second. Um, and this is what I, I have the previous edition of these, and these are these little guys right here. And then there's these bigger ones that'll record to SSG. So the ones that I have, we're working with SD cards, the little baby SD cards. The bigger ones will record to SSD, and you can see that they have dual slots, so you get, um, as well, both of these have dual slots. So you get unlimited recording, just it will fall over to the previous, um, uh, to the next disc, and then you can swap out the old one. And then there's the big old 8K Extreme version, which is crazy awesome. Um, Oh, this duplicator, this is really neat. If you're doing like a live event, you want to hand out 
copies of the live event afterward, this thing will rip out a bunch of copies at once. Pretty slick. Anyway, but we're talking about these little guys here. All right. Um, I, ooh, I set up a new camera angle, but I didn't set up a shortcut here. So let me switch over to this. Give me a moment. I want to show you my, uh, my rack with the deck in it. So give me a second here. I'm gonna switch over. I'll just show you what I'm doing here. I'm going to switch over to my big ATEM. And why are you asking for that? And it is the rack camera. So I'm going to enable that. There we go. So there's that's my rack. You can see the the at the very top, just out of view. That's the actual ATEM 2ME. Underneath that, the two big screens are the dual view monitors. So that's showing me the two uh, multi views that are come out of the 2ME. The the two in 2ME means that it has two full two different streaming, uh, full two different layouts, mix effects layouts, and that's the, what you're seeing on the left and right there. And then underneath that, you see six Hyperdex. You'll notice the two on the bottom left, the so bottom left and bottom middle, are both recording. Those are recording this actual show. I'm recording one to H.264 and the other to ProRes, and I'm doing that so that I can re-edit the show later. The only reason I'm doing both is because the ProRes file is going to be massive, and if there's no quality difference, then I'll just use the H.264, and I already compared yesterday. The H.264 is perfectly fine for what I'm doing, um, but I just hit record on both today anyway because I did yesterday. But um, but that's what I'm doing. So each one of those decks is recording the program, and in fact, if you look at, if you look really closely at the, uh, actually, I can just walk over there and point it to you. If you look closely here, you can see that is the program. Look, there's my hand. <laughs> it's a little meta. Um, so that's the program coming into these two. The other ones here are currently pointing at random things. And then number six is the one we're going to be working with for playback stuff. But those bottom two there. And so let me go back over here. And I want to show you something else in software related to these. So if I go into my ATEM software control, you'll notice up here, these, this is HyperDeck 1, HyperDeck 2. So these are output 1, output 2, output 3. This is the ATEM 2ME, the big ATEM, right? So somewhere in the settings, I don't remember where it was, somewhere in the settings in here, I have no idea where, it doesn't matter. Um, I was able to rename these output menus to Hyper, to whatever I want. So I named them HyperDeck 1 through 6. So this big ATEM has six outputs that are remappable. I can send anything I want out to each of those six. And these are auxiliary outputs separate from the program out and the multi-view out. So I can, like this camera, uh, this ATEM has two HDMI outs that I can set to anything. Uh, and that's it. The 2ME has six auxiliary outputs plus additional program and multi-view out. So it's got a ton of outputs. So I've got the output from each one of those six going into one of these six hyperdecks. So then let's go back over to the software view. I can choose like hyperdeck one, I can say, have it show me camera A or camera B or camera C. And so in a normal shooting environment for me, hyperdeck one is recording camera A, hyperdeck two is recording camera B, and hyperdeck three is recording camera C, hyperdeck four is recording camera D and so on. But right now hyperdeck four is recording the, the, uh, the ME one, that's the mix effects one, that's what I'm using for this show, the program. So that's what's being recorded there. And HyperDeck 5 is recording the exact same thing. Within the HyperDecks, I've set them to be different settings. Um, and then HyperDeck 6 is not receiving anything right now because I'm setting that up for playback. So that's your kind of basic setup of that. You've got this recorder that you can feed in a signal from anywhere. These have, um, actually I probably have the back illustration on here pull up a tech view of this. You can take a look at what's on the back of these. So here we go. Let's go back to this view. Um, so this is, you know, again, this is the new one on here. Mine looks a little bit different than this, but basically you've got, um, you've got SDI outputs. Oh, this is the, let's go to the HD plus because it's representative of what I have. There we go. So this has dual SDI outputs, which is going to be very important for the playback portion of this. We'll get to in a moment. And then it has an SDI input. So the input from the ATEM is going into SDIM. And then it has a loop out, which is really, really handy. So if you, you are effectively not giving up that output, if, um, if you want to pull the output from the ATEM into the hyperdeck, it will then loop back out and go off to somewhere else. If you want a feed of that somewhere else, you've got that as well. Obviously, it's going to be the same feed, but you've got that loop out feed there, which is pretty slick. Um, time code support and so on, all kinds of deck control and other funny things in here, the Ethernet port. And then there is an HDMI output. Now, this new one actually has HDMI input. Mine does not have the HDMI input, but it does have HDMI out. So you've got multiple inputs and outputs on here. And so that's, that's all you know, that's great. Um, the dual SDI out, this is the key though. So yesterday I talked about 
Uh, it's the key, no pun intended. Yesterday I talked about having the key in the fill, having an output where you have your video and then you have a, a alpha channel, black and white grayscale alpha channel that represents the mask. So if you think about Photoshop, you've got a transparent thing on Photoshop. If you look at the mask where it's transparent, it's black, where it's opaque, it's white, and any shade of gray is a transition. So if you've got something with a drop shadow and you look at the mask in Photoshop, you'd see that transition. Exact same idea here. You have a video file that has the picture, the video, whatever it is you want on screen, and then you have a secondary part of that file that is the alpha channel. Now, the way that you create these files, so now we're obviously talking about playback. Recording, there's not much else to say. You know, you hit it and you hit record, you choose a format, off you go, that's it. For playback though, when you wanna play back a video with the alpha channel, you render out of whatever graphics package you're using, a ProRes 4444 file. So there's four fours. That fourth four is the alpha channel. So, you know, you hear about your codec, your video codec. It's, oh, it's 420, it's 422. Those are quality settings. We're not going to go to each one of those, but those are essentially quality settings. The highest one is 444. And then the fourth four is that alpha channel. So if you're using After Effects or Apple Motion or whatever, Keynote, and you make a animation, against transparency and you render it out to ProRes 4444, you get that ProRes file that has the alpha channel, the HyperDeck will immediately recognize that and it will split out the output. So it'll take the video portion and put it out the first SDI output and take the alpha channel and put it out the second one. So that's the concept of how it works. Now, here's what I'm going to do. Um, I've got a video file already loaded up in the HyperDeck. So let me give me a moment here while I set this up. Um, okay, we, if we go to go back to this view, so here is the HyperDeck control. Now we are now looking at my big ATEM. This is, we're looking at the 2ME. We're not looking at the extreme because this is, you know, it's obviously configured on the big ATEM. If I go into these settings in here, there's a HyperDeck option. And you'll see in here that I punch in the IP address of the HyperDeck. And so I've got HyperDeck, um, the way I've numbered mine is, you know, 111 is HyperDeck 1, 12 or 2 at the end is HyperDeck 2 and so on. You can only control four of them even though you have six outputs. It's not like the six outputs are you know, specifically meant for HyperDeck, um, but you can only control four HyperDecks at once. You can go in here and change it at any time, but you can control four of them at once. So I'm controlling the first two and the last two right now. So the last one though is the one I care about. So HyperDeck 4 is What's labeled here as HyperDeck 4 is actually HyperDeck 6 in my system. So, um, so that's set up. So IP address 116. All right. So now we go over to the settings here. Look at the HyperDeck. And you can see that um, HyperDecks 1 and 2 aren't doing anything right now. And then remember, these are actually numbers 5 and 6. So number 5 is actively recording. That's that one that was recording to ProRes, so I don't want to touch that. And then over here, this one is actively playing. So this is my HyperDeck number 6 that is actively playing. What is it playing? Well, I'm going to go back. Gary, don't worry about audio. I'm not going to bring you on. But um, this is the multi-view of me and Gary. Notice the background there, this little wavy blue thing. That is video that is playing from that HyperDeck. Just straight video, not uh, with an alpha channel, just straight video playing from the HyperDeck. So if I, let me go back to this view, if I wanted to show you just that video, I'll actually have a preset set up for this. Find the right button that I did, and here we go. This is the video output. The, on the left, you're seeing the video. On the right, you're seeing the alpha. Because this isn't a 4444 file, we're only getting there's no alpha channel, so the HyperDeck is just playing both out over the same one. But I have a video graphic load, uh, loaded up here that has the alpha channel. So to play it, let's go back to this. I'm going to uh, zoom into this again for you. Let me open this up, the little thing, and it shows me the files on the HyperDeck. Um, so background one is the blue one you're seeing. Background two is a blue version of that. And then the ridiculous text is my graphic I'm going to show you. Uh, you can, this is kind of a really, really cool f functionality of the HyperDex. You notice that they have an Ethernet port, right? So they're on my network. I can access the HyperDex over FTP, which means that when I record my shows or record a, a video that I'm doing to the HyperDex, and this is how I do my, all my YouTube shows that I record right here. Everything is recorded, not in camera, but in the HyperDex. I can then copy those files from the HyperDex across the network to my computer, so I don't have to pop the SSD cards out. Now, the HyperDex used to be only 100 megabit. They got a magical software update a while ago that upgraded them to gigabit, so I get gigabit, which is still slower than using you know, an SD card reader, but it's 
faster. Depending on how much data I have to transfer, sometimes it's faster for me to just copy the files over the network because I can start copying them all at once. I can open up, I use Transmit as a, uh, an FTP client, but you know, whatever you want as an FTP client. I have presets set up so that um, I open up Transmit on my system. I just select all six hyperdicks or however many I'm using, double click them. They all open up and I just drag the files over to copy them. Super quick and easy. Now, here's a neat little thing that I am about to set up in the studio. So we're now we're getting a little, this is what happens around here. There's always something better you can do. So I told you that the, the HyperDex recently got upgraded to Gigabit. How they did that, I have no idea. Like, anyway, so they're all Gigabit now. But the problem is that I'm on a Gigabit network in here. So that means that while I can transfer at maximum speed from one HyperDeck, if I start copying from both of them at the same time, well, I've only got a Gigabit of bandwidth in the entire network, so that's not going to help me at all. So what I've purchased <laughs> is a small 10 gig switch. It's actually, so it's only, it's 350 bucks. This is not that bad. It's a little Netgear switch. It has eight PoE plus, and oh, by the way, those HyperDex are all powered over PoE, so power over Ethernet. So there's no power cable running into them. They're all getting their power from the Ethernet. Right now they are, and this will continue. So this new switch, eight PoE plus one gig switch uh, ports on them. Then there's one, just one, one 10 gigabit port on that switch. So what'll happen is all six of the HyperDex are gonna get plugged into those six of those eight ports on there, okay? And then from the 10 gig, I run a 10 gig CAT7 cable because regular CAT5, CAT6E is only one gig. So a CAT7 cable will run directly from that switch to the back of my Mac Pro. The Mac Pro has two, uh, two 10 gigabit, gigabit ethernet ports built into it. Love the Mac Pro. Two 10 gig ports built in. One of them is plugged into my regular one gig network just for internet and file transfer. The second one will get plugged into that deck directly. So it'll be a direct connection. So I'll have a 10 gigabit connection to that switch, which means I can hit copy on all six of those decks at once. One gig each in file transfer speed. I've still got four gigs of, of bandwidth to spare and I'll start copying those files over the network much faster. Super cool. I'm really excited about this. I just kind of went through all the details and figured out what I needed last week and um, the hardware will be here next week. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. So anyway, so, you know, into the rabbit hole a little bit, but that's how that works. Anyway, so I can access those files over the network. Sweet. I can copy files to the HyperDeck over the network. So the graphics that you're seeing here, I didn't pop out the card and put them in my machine and copy them to them. I just copy them via FTP directly to the deck. So that's really cool that we can do that. Um, however, there's an oddity in that you, and Gary, if you know a solution to this, by all means, let me know. But the ATEM doesn't refresh, read what's on the card on a regular basis. The only way that I know of to force it to refresh and read what's on the card is to pop the card out and pop it back in. So it just means pop out, pop back in. Gary's nodding yes, so I guess there's no workaround for that. So you do have to pop it out and pop it back in, but that's it. Just click, click, and that's it. And then the ATEM will refresh what's on there and see the content. So all that said, now we've got this content on here. So I'm going to go ahead and select the ridiculous text and... Um, and that's playing now. And now I'm going to bring up the, uh, the split, here it is. And so there we see on the left, the video, and it's rendered against black, and then on the right, the alpha channel. So that is what would allow me to bring that up over my graphic. So now, um, let's see here, so that's now playing. Okay, I'm going to, where is that? Uh, I've already, I set this up and I don't remember where I put it. Let's see here, I'm looking at my computer on here, there we go. Is it, let me just look at my settings. I don't remember, I honestly don't remember where I put it. Um, it's not, okay, we're gonna bring on air. Oops, that's not it. Oh, right, okay, so I need to set, here we go. So I'm gonna set, I forgot, now, now I'm remembering. I undid everything so that I could show you how to set it up. Aha, that's how this was. See, there's a method to my madness. All right, back to this. So we currently have that playing. Let's just double check that. Output is playing from the, oops, sorry, media player is playing right there, the ridiculous text. If I load up my preset to show that, we see it. Okay, so that's all good. Now, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna bring it up as a upstream key. So I'm gonna go to my upstream key. There's upstream key. It's going to be a Luma key. This is really important, it's a Luma key. And somebody asked yesterday about the difference between the types of keys. This is where the Luma key comes in. The fill source is going to be the HyperDeck 6 video. The key source is going to be the HyperDeck 6 
Alpha. Where'd it go? HyperDeck 6 Alpha, there it is. So HyperDeck 6 Video and Alpha, those are the two that are coming in. And now I bring it on air, and there she is on the bottom. So now we're seeing that loaded up on there. If I, you notice you got this pre-multiply. If I turn that off, you see the black edges around it. It's very important difference here. Pre, what pre-multiplied means, super important, let me actually turn it back on. I'll leave that going there. What pre-multiplied means is that the rendered video, so this case that whirly, swilly, weird graphic thing, is rendered out to black. Everything that has transparency is rendered effectively with black behind it. And so if we looked at, it's kind of hard to tell from this video, but if you look at just the video itself, then the edges would look kind of funny. And if I turn off pre-multiply key, then you see that rendered out to the edge in there. This is what gives you the cleanest transition to true transparency. That rendering out to black then gets built into the mask as well, and you have this beautiful soft transition. And you can see, as I turn the pre-multiply back on, these very, so I need something white to hold on behind here. Um, you get these very smooth, clean uh, transitions or, or fades or drop shadows or whatever you want. There we go. Let's hold this right behind it. There you go. So you see there you get this really nice transparency as it fades off to that. Now, um, this is not um, this is not looping properly because I don't I barely know how to use motion. The fact that I can figure out how to do this is kind of remarkable. I'm not a motion graphics guy. I couldn't figure out how to make it loop seamlessly, but obviously you would make it so that it'll loop seamlessly. Okay, so that's how that playback works. Now, now let's talk about, let me go ahead and turn that off. Now let's talk about how you would incorporate this into a show because you can trigger which video file gets played in a macro. So I can build a macro that says play video file what was it called? Uh, what did I call this thing? Um, ridiculous text? Yeah, it's called ridiculous text. So I can build a macro that plays that track, and I can build another macro that plays the other background color. So this is really neat. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, let's go back to the Mac and open up the macros. Command Shift M to open up the macros. Let's bring this over here, make it nice and big so you can see. And find a blank one. All right, running out of some. Okay, um, I'm going to actually just clear. Uh, these are a bunch of things that I imported and I need to get rid of that I'm not using. So let's delete a couple of these. All right, let's put this right here. So I'm going to add a new one and I'm going to say um, load, let's see, I'll say play blue background uh, animation. Perfect. Okay, play blue background animation. Copy that. Hit record. Now I go over here and I select background one, which is my blue one. And remember when you're doing a, did that, I think I just switched cameras and I'm recording on there. So that camera switch just got recorded. Darn it. I'm going to redo that. I'm going to explain it and then I'm going to redo it without doing the switch. Um, let me just stop this. See, it's very meta when you have all these things intertied. Um, remember yesterday in talking about macros, I, I told you that you have to do everything that you want it to do. So in this case, I not only select that video track, I also have to hit play. I also have to set the looping format. Do I want it to loop or not loop? I have to set all of that. Otherwise, it's just going to do whatever was previously set. So I want this to loop. And my animated backgrounds, the blue and green backgrounds, are perfect looping. There are seamless loops. So, um, so I do want those to loop. OK, so let's go back to this. I'm going to re-record and not insert a camera switch on top of it. Uh, OK, so there we go. Hit record. So I select the right backgrounds. Let's actively select it. I'm going to make sure this is set to looping and I hit play. So those three things in there are all I need. I hit stop. Now I'm gonna to go to this one and I'm gonna do another one and we're gonna say um, play green, background animation, record, and now I do the same thing for the second one. Select that one, set it to loop, hit play. Okay, that's everything that I need and stop. So now I've got two buttons here, play blue and play green. Now let me switch over to, uh, let's see here, I'll switch over to the Gary and me and you can see it's actively playing the green. Now I'm gonna go on the macro palette to the run page and I'll click the blue button. There's the blue one and I click the play green button and there's the green one. And if we look at these side by side, you'll see play the blue, play the green. And it is instantly queuing up that right video and playing that back. So that's where you get this really cool flexibility of having a HyperDeck for playback and you can load up whatever files you want on there. They could be, you know, opening animation graphics, they could be the background graphics, like I've got a lower third, whatever, and you can queue up which one's played back through the macros. So that's where that becomes really, really powerful 
to do. Um, and you can do this with the ATEM Mini Extreme as well, or the, uh, any of them, you can do this. Uh, but remember, it will take two of your inputs. So if you're gonna be using a HyperDeck, you really wanna have the ATEM Mini Extreme so you get all eight inputs because two of them are being given up for that, assuming that you want the transparency. If you don't care about transparency, it's just for playing videos without transparency, then you just need one input like any camera. So um, that is everything that I wanted to show you in there. I love it. Having the HyperDex is super, super awesome and powerful. It gives you a lot of different things you can do with it. Um, all right. So that, let's go and see if there's any questions. Go ahead and bring up Gary Me back. I'm going to load up my blue background again because I like that one better. There we go. There's my blue background. Gary, do we have any questions? Yeah, since we're on the topic, uh, can you tell us how you encoded the graphics, uh, especially with the uh, alpha channel? Sure. So the graphic with the alpha channel is, as I was saying earlier, ProRes 4444. It's the only way. It has to have that alpha channel in there. So that's your, your it has to be a 4444 format. Um, I do ProRes. I'm not sure if there's other codecs that are supported, but it has to be 4444. And so I did that in Apple's motion and I just went to the export. Um, you know, it's built against transparency to start by default. So I just went to export movie file. Um, I set up the, the size and the resolution in advance. So when I built the canvas, 1920 by 1080 at 2398. And that, by the way, is really important. Um, less important for the ATEM Extreme, the, the ATEM Mini lineup, because each input has a scaler. It's still, you really want to create your graphics at the exact right resolution and frame rate. But on my ATEM, the 2ME, I have to have the exact right resolution and frame rate. So I had to make that video 1920 by 1080 at 23,976 frames per second. Critical, or it won't play back. So, uh, but yeah, 4444 is how you play that out. Yes, I, um, I'm old style anyway, and um, keeping everything the same frame rate and resolution that you're working with is always the best because uh, there's all these issues somewhere somehow that uh, get in the way. Um, another question, uh, can you do the same graphics overlay with the new HyperDeck Studio HD Mini? And the answer is actually the all, new, all the new um, products, the uh, HyperDeck products that just came out have the same capability of the um, uh, ProRes 444 files. Does it? I thought I saw, I'm looking back at the schematics, there's only one SDI. Oh, there's an SDI and an HDMI output. So is that how you would do the key and the fill? You're muted. Gary's talking, we can't hear him. Gary, <laughs> can't hear you. We can't hear you. Can't hear you, buddy. <laughs> I'm sorry. Sorry. I have to hit two buttons at once. I should have uh, worked that out with my stream deck. Um, so the new the new small one doesn't have SDIs out. I don't have it in front of me right now. It has one SDI out and one HDMI out. So maybe okay, I'll you can check use, that. Yeah, maybe you can use the um, SDI. Verify, but the ones key. with two SDIs should. Yeah. Yeah, the ones with two SDI absolutely will do it. Um, yeah, I'm wondering maybe if you can use the SDI and the HDMI out as a key in a fill. I, I don't know. Um, I, I know you can do that. Actually, you can use the HDMI as the primary option, and you can use the SDI as the key on on all of them that have the two SDIs. I mean, that would be an option for not having to convert one of the of the uh, outputs. Um, but I'll have to check on it and uh, get back to you because I honestly don't know at the moment. I'd have to just check. And. Um, I'll try to do that actually before the session's over just to maybe follow up at the end so we don't uh, get caught there. Okay, um, uh, did you go over the list of formats supported by the HyperDex? I did not. So um, I'm gonna do this off the top of my head. There's ProRes, you can do ProRes HQ. Well, actually, you know what, let's do this. Let's switch over. I don't know how well you'll be able to see it, but um, we'll, I'll show you how it's set. Let me go back to the rack view. Uh, you might be able to, if you're looking at it on the YouTube stream, then you should be able to see this as I pull it up. So let me get out of the way here and get my noggin out of the way. There we go. So I'll go into one that's not being used. I go into the menu, set, and then it says codec. So if I scroll up to the top, ProRes HQ, ProRes 422, ProRes LT, ProRes Proxy. Then I've got DNX HD 220XQT. I don't even know what that is. DNX HD 220MXF. DNX HD 145QT, 145MXF, uh, DNX HD 45QT and 45MXF, DNX R, DNX 
HR, sorry, HQXQT, good Lord, there's a lot of letters, um, HQXMXF, uh, SQQT, good grief, SQMXF, LBQT, LBQT, QT, QT, good grief, LBQT, you say that five times fast, LBMXF, and then finally, so there's a whole bunch of DNXXR, X, DNX, it's R ones, and then H264, high, medium, and low. Now I will say that you cannot, at least on this one, and this might be supported on the new one, Gary, I'd love to know this, um, on the ones that I have, I cannot record 4K30 in H.264. If I'm inputting 4K30, I have to record to ProRes. I can't do it to H.264. Uh, I wonder if that's the same on the new ones. Uh, I guess I would have to check. Um, basically, the best place to go is our website for the specifications because each of the decks are going to be different. Uh, and the new have some 4K modes as well that wouldn't be on the mini and things like that. So um, right. uh, uh, I, I can probably try to check that too before the end. Of the session, that's okay. But, um, that's okay. Unless if someone else asks, maybe, but for uh, from my own knowledge, it's fine. So yeah, that's, that is a, a, I don't know, limitation, restriction, whatever. But if you're doing 4K, 30, well, if you do 4K, then you can't record to um, H.264. Okay, uh, were there other questions? Yes, um, these relate to the ISO recordings that um, okay. it probably is just one question combined here. Um, uh, how can you sync the video with the master audio uh, and the master audio file if all you have is a sync option for sound and not time code? Can you talk about that with Resolve? Have you done that? Okay, so... So I'm assuming the question means if you're using, if you're recording externally, not using this system, so you've got a non-Blackmagic camera, you're recording a master to that, you would have to yes, use audio it, to it, sync. It also um, relates to um, the fact that th sometimes the camera audio will be a few frames off of the, you know, right. so the audio track will actually be a few frames off of the, um, the video, and so they might be able to want to try to sync that too. Yeah, exactly. So... So the first part of the answer is, yes, you'll have to rely on audio. There is no way to feed timecode into the ATEM Mini lineup. So its timecode is generated internally as time of day timecode, but you can't feed timecode in from an external source. So if you're using other cameras, and regardless of whether they have timecode or not, they, you will be relying on the audio from that camera with the audio that's captured in the Mini to sync them up. Um, in Resolve, I'm sure there's a way to automatically sync by audio. There is in every NLE, so I'm sure there is. But as Gary pointed out, it might actually be off by a few frames. The audio will be in sync, but then the video will not quite be in sync because of the audio and video delay that we talked about yesterday. So if that's the case, then you may have to manually flip it over a few frames to get it to line up. But this is not a big deal because keep in mind, you're talking about a live production. If it was an hour-long show or a five-minute show or a 10-hour show, it's still one track. Right, so it's only one track that you would have to slip in and out of sync. So, um, so it's not a big deal to have to do if you do have to do it. Okay, I think we can continue on. I'm going to probably step out and look at the hyperdecks for a minute. Okay, cool. All righty. Uh, thank you very much, Gary. And we're back. All right, so now we are talking about the ATEM Streaming Bridge. And this is, once again, how Gary is actually communicating to me right now, how you're seeing him. So uh, let's do, let me just kind of high level this first and then we'll go into some looking at it. So the ATEM streaming bridge is a, a little box that receives a signal only from, and this is the, this is important, only from an ATEM mini or from a web presenter, which we're gonna look at next. So it can only receive signals from there. Effectively what you're doing is you are just like from your ATEM, you would stream to YouTube or stream to Facebook. Instead, you are going to stream to someone's um, streaming bridge, wherever in the world it is. The latency is it's there. You can tell here, Gary and I sometimes talk over each other. There is a couple seconds latency here. That's just, that's just the nature of the beast. Uh, but that gives you the ability to do a one-way stream in. Now, I point out that it's one-way because this is a really important aspect to this. It is not a Zoom call type setup where you're talking back and forth. It is a one-way stream. And so I've done a couple of live shows on this on my YouTube live channel. So youtube.com slash photo Joseph live on the YouTube live channel. I've done a few streams about how to incorporate callers from a uh, using this the, the stream deck and in adding Zoom into it as a return. And effectively what you end up doing is having a Zoom call with, let's say you got three callers that are calling in. 
So you have a Zoom call with them. You, me, you, the presenter, you kind of ignore what's happening on the switcher other than, you know, you load up your multi-views and maybe you're toggling back and forth between that. But you're not looking at that or at them in that switcher to hear them. You're looking at the Zoom call because Zoom is virtually real time. It's obviously a much lower quality, but it is virtually real time. And so you're able to hold on a fairly normal conversation through Zoom, right? We've, in the age of COVID, we've all done Zoom calls about a million times already. So there you can have your normal conversation and in the um, in the hyper sorry in the stream in the streaming bridge too many words too many names uh, that's going to be coming in a little bit later but then everything syncs up in the end so this way you're not kind of waiting for them to stop talking or anything you just have a normal conversation so that works out really really well but you have to set up that two way communication as a back channel and then have the high quality input coming in separately so that's effectively how that works so let me show you the product and how this sets up. Um, Let's see here, let's go back to the Blackmagic website and pull up the products on here. And, um, you know, actually I remember it was hard for me to find this thing. It's, uh, we're just gonna do streaming bridge. And I think now the only place to find this is to go into the tech specs. There it is, streaming bridge. There it is, so that's what it looks like. So you've got on this thing a, um, well, you have a SDI reference in for sync, but we're not gonna worry about that. You've got a SDI out, dual SDI outs and an HDMI out. And then there's the ethernet port. And this ethernet port is where the signal, of course, comes in from the outside world. And then it outputs simultaneously to two SDI and one HDMI. So you could feed one of these into a switcher and you can feed the HDMI one into a monitor. So you just wanna have a separate monitor with confidence of what's, what's going on. And that's exactly what is happening here right now. Gary's um, stream is on a monitor that is an HDMI out from the streaming bridge onto a, a screen that I have down here. So I can see him the whole time. And, um, and he's streaming to it. So the way that you set this up, so let's do that next. Let's go back to this. And we go into the ATEM setup app. And here's, there it is. There's ATEM streaming bridge. So I got three of these, one, two, and three. So you can see that Gary is, he's on air, that's him. He's sending me 1080p 2398, and he's sending me at a rate of six megabit, give or take. So that's what he is currently streaming to me. I don't wanna mess with this one, so I'm gonna open up a different one, go into the settings in here, and here's the configuration. So uh, just like with the ATEMs themselves, you can set it to DHCP or build a static IP. The way that I build my network, and I'm not, you know, I'm not a network expert, but I, I like to say that I know enough to get into trouble, but not enough to get out of it. But the way that I set up my network, because I've got a lot of stuff in here, is every device is set to DHCP. However, in my router, I have assigned an IP address to every MAC address. So I go through the process of finding the MAC address of every piece of hardware that comes in, that goes on the network, going into my router saying this about MAC address gets this IP address. And I have a spreadsheet of all the possible IP addresses and I've grouped them into lumps of like 50 or whatever to say this 50 is reserved for computers, this 50 is reserved for streaming hardware. It's you know not necessary, but I've done this just for my own sanity and when I need to know the IP address of anything on the network, I can just pull up my spreadsheet and I go, oh, okay, streaming deck number uh, two is, is uh, you know, 128. So then I just, it just makes that easy. Okay, so you get your IP address for this. Then this is the interesting part, the streaming, the port forwarding. So, okay, right now it says internet status port forwarding error, but if I hit retry, it's going to refresh and it says visible worldwide. I don't know why, but quite often when you first launch this, even though you have it configured correctly, it'll say is an error, hit check again, and it goes, oh, just kidding, it's actually fine. And it, believe me, it's, I've had one or two heart attacks from this, but, um, but that, what that button is doing is it's pinging the outside world from the hardware to make sure that it can see the internet and the internet can see it. So super easy, you know, th that's what it's doing. But you do have to set this up, and this is where things get a little bit tricky. So um, you assign a port to this, and then we're gonna go into our router software so actually, let me just, before I pull that up, let me make sure that I pull this up clean. Um, okay, and here we go. Okay, so I'm gonna go to my router, which is my local network. I'm using a Synology router. This is something you can do on pretty much any router um, worth anything. So don't worry about like, oh, my router doesn't have that. I'm, I'm sure it does. And it's just your software is going to look different than this, obviously. This is a pretty advanced router. This router, actually, this router this is so cool. I have two ISPs feeding into the studio. Two total, I have a, there's a local, um, you know, to the city that I live in, kind of local homegrown ISP that's very good. And then I have Spectrum as well. 
I get better download with Spectrum. Upload's the same on both of them. But I have dual ISPs coming into the studio because I do a lot of things in here where it's mission critical that I'm online. And if one ISP goes down, because you know they always have a tendency to do that, or for whatever reason it's, it's acting up, I have two. I can switch back and forth. And my router will automatically load balance and hand off data to the best one. Or more importantly, I can actually assign a specific ISP to a specific device. So, you know, this device always uses ISP number one. This one always uses ISP number two. Pretty slick stuff. Anyway, just kind of going into the intricacies of this ridiculous um, setup that I have in here. Um, all right, so um, where is my, uh, let's, look, let's go to the Network Center app. Here we go. Hello, Network Center app. Excellent. And the page has totally locked up on me. Fabulous. You know, demos, man, don't do them. I'm telling you. Let me refresh this and see what happens. There, there we go. Now it's working properly. All right, open up my network center. Um, port forwarding, I think this is not where I, yeah, I go to the port forwarding. Right, that's what I'm setting up. And I'll give this, it'll take a moment to load. Here's all the devices. So there's my ATEM streaming bridges. So um, we're not gonna mess with number one. So number two, go in here and if I edit this, you'll see that it has a public port, number 1932. Let's go back to the setup, this one here. There's that same worldwide port. You can enter any number you want here. This is, you just punch in, you know, one, two, three, four, whatever you want in here. But whatever port you enter here, and along with the IP address of this device, so uh, what was it, uh, 128. So the 128 IP and this 1932, if I go back to Safari, we see there it is. So the, the, uh, there's the private IP address. This particular router allows me to see all my assigned IP addresses with the names that I've custom set, so it makes it really easy to find. So there's number, no, bridge number two. And then I set up that public port. Um, oh, you have to set it to a TCP uh, slash UDP protocol. That's what you want to set it to. And that's it. I set that. And once that's set, then the router will be able to pass the data through and it will show up on the internet. So you see here, broadcast from internet. And it says right here, status is visible worldwide. Now I can, if I'm not using this across the internet, this is also very powerful to use just on a local network. If I set this to local network without key, then basically that means no password required, if you will. One, if I set it to that way, any ATEM on the local network will see it. It will just automatically see that bridge from its stream option menu. So where you go choose YouTube, Facebook, whatever, you'll just see your bridge in there. It just shows up and then you select it and you hit stream and you are now streaming from the an ATEM on your local network directly to that streaming bridge. It's if you want outside people to come in, that's where you need to do the port forwarding and set up the internet access to it. But if it's just locally, just internal, then that's all you gotta do. You just set it up and you can have it with a password or without, a key or without, pretty slick. Okay, but let's go back to the way that Gary's using it. So um, again, it's set up as, a, as an internet. Obviously this is all configured and I've got some things I can change in here, but there's really nothing I need to do. And then I go to this external ATEM Mini Pro and here I name the bridge whatever I want the server is defined. The key, by the way, this key here, whenever I want to refresh it, I just go into here and, uh, hello, where'd it go? There you go. I go in here and I hit refresh. You know, hit this button. It just generates a new key. So there's a key, RY2F, right? That's the current key. That key shows up here. I can choose a quality that I want as a default in the preset that I'm building, but Gary will be able to change that. Whoever's got it will be able to change it. I'll set it to streaming high as the default, and then I click save. And this is going to generate a simple little XML file. That's it, it's just an XML file. And it's tiny, so teeny, teeny, tiny little text file. I then email that to whoever I want, so I email that to Gary. Gary then you know, downloads that file, and then he goes into his, uh, his ATEM, and now I have to switch back over to the ATEM Extreme here. He goes into his ATEM, and under streaming, he says load streaming settings, and he selects that file, and then it shows up under Oops, under output, uh, live stream, it'll just show up under here and you'll see that output. So that's it, that's literally all it takes. And then as soon as he hits on air, he shows up in my feed. And it's, it's brilliant, it's so, so useful. I've done the, the big live show that I did where we were kind of playing with the whole thing. I had, I think one caller was from Portland, one was from, I think, the Bay Area, and then it's someone from Sweden. I think that's how we had that set up. So I, you know, it was coming from all over the world. It was really cool. It's really cool that you can do this. So, so that's what the streaming bridge does. A relatively inexpensive little box. No, I don't remember. 500? I don't remember. I don't remember the pricing. I'm terrible at prices. Um, but relatively inexpensive for what it is, and it gives you the ability to bring a stream in. And it, it can be a caller. It can be anything, right? Anything that you want to feed into your ATEM, you can stream to a, a point elsewhere in the world for them to include in their live show. So that's how that 
works. Um, yeah, I guess there's not much else to say about that. So let's see if there's any questions about it. But that one's pretty straightforward. I don't imagine there's going to be going to be much. Right. Um, uh, just <laughs> trying to switch modes here. Um, <laughs> Sorry. I did check on the HyperDeck um, HD Studio um, HD Mini, and it does not support the four 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 for output. Okay, um, so you need sorry the bigger that. one. Okay. It's would be nice if it did, but um, uh, it does not support that. Um, okay, can you uh, recommend specific wired or wireless mics that plug in directly into the ATEM? Oh gosh. Um, okay, sure. And just before, so I don't forget. By the way, the price is two forty five for the the streaming bridge. I knew it was very affordable, so I wanted to make sure I. I said it was like 500, so that was double that. So it was 245. Okay, specific wired mics. Oof. Um, I would say, I don't have a specific model number, but I would say go to Rode, R-O-D-E, Rode's website. They, they make great mics, very affordable, very good quality mics, and they absolutely have wired mics on there. Um, that would be the first place that I would send you. There's, I don't have it. That's right. I gave it away. I had a wired mic from another company. I'm trying to remember the name of the company that was quite good, but I gave it away because I didn't need it. Ooh. Oh, darn it. I'm mm, totally blanking on the name, but I'm just going to say start with Rode. Rode is good for a inexpensive wired mic that is going to be very good. That would be my baseline starting point. As you grow on beyond that, you know, Rode makes great mics. Sennheiser makes great mics. In fact, Sennheiser is what I'm using. Sennheiser and Rode are what I have everywhere in the studio. The Shotgun mic that I use in my office. It actually no, I guess that's not a Sennheiser Rode. That is a darn. What is that one? Um, I'll try to remember to talk about it when we go in there because we are going in there in a little bit, and I'll, I'll have to look at it. I always forget the name of that one. But I've got a. I'm not using it right now for this because I'm on the lav. But I've got a Sennheiser shotgun mic over there. This mic is a Sennheiser AVX. That's the digital mic system. Um, and then my little on-camera mics are all Rode mics. So those are the two companies I mostly work with. Uh, but anyway, they're all, they're all great. I mean, they're really good quality. So here's a good one, actually. Uh, is there a way to use the ATEM streaming bridge to control a Blackmagic camera remotely over the internet? No, unfortunately, no, because it's a one-way communication. So you can't take control of that Blackmagic camera across the internet that way. That'd be cool if you could. It is a it is a good idea. Um, okay, let me see. I had one. Um, okay, uh, what is the best, most price reasonable solution for streaming um, from the A10 Mini Extreme ISO, or basically uh, the A10 Minis, to both YouTube and Facebook at the same time? Um, any difference uh, if you only do it once in a while and if you do it often, is there a downside to streaming to both channels at the same time? Okay, so technically the way that you would do it is using a Restream service. So there's one called Restream.io and their, uh, their service works great. I've used it a whole bunch and you can stream to a ton of destinations at once and they handle everything, right? So you basically, you get your Restream.io key, which you saw Restream.io is now built in natively to these. So you get your key for your stream, paste it in there, and then on the Restream website, you say you know where you want it to go to and you choose, check all the boxes where you want it to go to. They, pricing-wise, they, they have monthly plans and I believe they also have per stream plans. I could be wrong on that. A while ago, I bought a lifetime license for them, so it was on some crazy sale, and it was it cost very very little for what it was. It's I, think I look back and I go, I can't believe I got it for that cheap. But um, but I've got a you know lifetime license to stream to a whole bunch of destinations at once. Now, if you need more destinations than what's included in your plan, you can also add on additional streams per stream. So there's a lot of flexibility in it. But Restream.io is definitely the place that I would go to check that out. If that's not enough or good enough. Amazon has a whole system in place. You get a hardware box from them that you're streaming directly through that box to their servers and then they can redistribute. But that's like, you know, really high level. Um, Restream.io works great and it's a great price. There was a second question in there, wasn't there? We may have talked a little bit on this yesterday. Wasn't there a second question in there? Uh, a second part of that that I missed? Uh, I, I think it was based on um, whether or not they were going to do it often or um, okay. 
just once in a while if there was a difference. Okay. Yeah, do restream. Check that out. So can you talk about, I think we did yesterday, the, the best way to integrate professional balanced audio signals from an outside mixer um, or microphone uh, into the uh, dual unbalanced audio jacks of the ATEM minis with a minimum of distortion, cable interference, latency, other artifacts? Uh, this is a great question. Um, uh, talk about both line and mic. I mean, yeah. I can help a little bit. Um, it may take more than that. Okay, so let me show you. If I go back to the computer, so I'm looking in the ATEM settings right now um, under the audio tab and under general, and each mic input can be switched between line level or microphone level, and then the newer ATEMs have microphone with plug-in power. And so you've got these options of where you want to set your level. So that's critical. If you're coming off a mixing board, you got to set it to line level. Let's get that nice and close. you got to get that to line level. That is super, super important to do. Um, other than that, it just comes down to quality cables. You know, like any other audio setup, you want good cables, shielded cables, don't have any longer than you, than you need, don't run them next to power lines, all that good stuff. Um, but that's all just, you know, kind of audio basics. But in the ATEM, switching it to line level, that's critical if you're coming off of a mixer. If it's okay, I'll um, just say a few words about this because it's kind of an area I'm, I'm interested in a lot. Um, one of the problems is uh, from balanced to unbalanced that people often wire this wrong. And I want to say that it is incorrect to take a balanced um, audio source, you know, the two signals plus ground, and wire them to the tip ring and sleeve of the unbalanced jack going in uh, because the end result that you'll get is um, uh, out of this audio left and right, and anybody listening in mono will hear nothing. And I can guarantee that there are many, many users out there that, that say uh, some iPhones won't hear their, um, their podcast or whatever, and other iPhones will, not iPhones particularly, some brands of phones won't hear the audio and other brands of phones will. And it's strictly because they wired the microphone incorrectly going into the ATEM Mini. Um, if you're going from a professional audio console, the output level is a plus four dBU. Uh, that's a certain voltage. It's quite high um, compared to hi-fi levels. The A10 Mini input is minus 10, and it's unbalanced. There are devices out there. There's active devices and passive devices, and I can't name brands and things, but you can kind of look them up on the Internet. Um, I recommend a transformer always. Um, a transformer-based device will let you take unbalanced to balanced in either way, um, and it will always, generally always eliminate any noise, hum, interference, and things like that that can happen from, uh, from various sources. Uh, there are some really good ones out there. I think he's got one in his hand um, that, you know, they could cost under $100 easily. Um, oh, uh, <laughs> anyway, let me, let me, let me talk then. you. Um, there are some good ones out there that, um, that you can get from under, under $100. You can even get really inexpensive um, for under $10 that will you know, work in a pinch sometimes. I use a bunch of those around here just to get rid of noise be going between unbalanced to unbalanced because um, cables and grounding always causes this kind of a problem. So it's always best to come up with some solution to eliminate this. But um, uh, I, I recommend a transformer-based product, if possible, to um, to go from a professional audio console to uh, to the mini. Go ahead. Okay, I want to add something about the the ground or tell a story. He's talking about the interference and grounds and so on. I very recently on my recorded shows, which are often done here. Um, there was a, an audio buzz that got introduced into my signal and I was having a hell of a time figuring out where it came from. And I finally, just before we went live yesterday, I tracked it down, which is good. Otherwise you guys would have been hearing it right now. And I, there was, so I've got a mix pre that is my audio interface that my current wireless lab is routed into. So this is a, an, like I said, a digital AVX system, Sennheiser AVX. It's got a little thumb size, and here I can actually show you what this looks like. So I got a second one here. Um, it's got a little thumb size receiver that plugs into the, uh, into the mixer. So that's this guy right here. Where's my close up? There we go. So it's this little guy here, right? A little XLR. Well, this thing is, it has a battery, right? It's battery powered, but it also has a USB port to charge it. Well, because it's sitting in the rack, I just have it plugged into USB power all the time. Well, it turns out the USB power brick that I was plugged into was a, this is little like, I thought I was being clever. I bought these ones that have two USB ports on them, um, you know, two five volt ports so I can charge two iPhones or whatever at once. Well, that little piece of crap brick 
was introducing buzz into the signal. As soon as I unplugged that, it went away. I was like, you got to be kidding me. So even, yeah, it, it took me a while to find because even when this was muted, I was still getting the buzz. So I didn't think this had anything to do with it. But then I unplugged this entirely and the buzz went away. And I go, oh, this is causing it. Well, hold on, plugged it back in, pulled out the power and it went away. Okay, tracked it, checked the port that I plugged, the wall thing that I plugged it into. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. It's this. So there's that. So buzz can come from all kinds of places. Real night. Remember yesterday I said audio is harder than video? Yeah, definitely. Okay, so so Gary's talking about transformers and so on. Um, I don't know if this qualifies as a transformer or not, but this is what I have used. And this is a Zoom F6. Let's uh, get close up again. So this is not really, there we go. This is the Zoom F6 um, multi-track field recorder. This has six XLR inputs, and then it has a line out, which you see that's not the line outside. Somewhere over here, there is, there it is, a line out. You can see that on there. So what this does is if I'm working, and I've used this in live broadcasts that I've done for clients, where I'm getting an audio feed from the mixing board. So I'm going XLR into this. From here, I can adjust levels if I need to and then send the line out. Plus, this gives me the ability to record natively in here, uh, which is super awesome. So that's, that's how I use this. And I don't know, does this qualify as a transformer, what you were talking about, Gary? Oh, shoot. And I just realized, darn it, my bad. Sorry. I didn't have Gary on for when he was saying that. And so you guys are just listening to silence because I have his, uh, his audio set to audio follows video. So he's only on when he's on screen. My bad. But, um, but do you want to, could you repeat? I'm sorry, Gary. Could you just repeat that real quick? Yeah, I, I was basically saying um, that the, the transformer um, that I'm used to is it's an old school type thing where basically you totally isolate the ground from one system to the other and so only the audio passes and it passes via an, uh, an air gap so to speak um, so um, those are always the best methods of I to isolate of course good quality transformers are important or you you miss the high end or the low end sometimes but um, uh, the the other thing, uh, like in the case of the example that you had, the plugging in the USB caused the ground of the USB system, whatever it was connected to, to connect to the same ground as uh, the other end, the mini or whatever device you're plugged into. And those two grounds are not going to be exactly the same, especially with computer buses and all that kind of stuff going around. So anytime you connect two grounds that are not exactly precisely the same, you're going to get current flow and that's going to always cause no hum, buzz on an unbalanced circuit. So, so because the, the ground and unbalanced is actually part of the audio system. Uh, in a balanced system, the ground only shields um, uh, interference of the audio. The audio is actually totally isolated from ground, or at least it's supposed to be in a, in a balanced type system. So um, I, would, I would always have handy a, a good transformer blocking device. Um, and I've even used these really cheap um, $10 um, unbalanced devices. They've got a 3.5 millimeter in and out. Um, you could plug that on the input of an ATEM Mini and feed just about anything into it. I, they're not the best thing, but in an emergency, they can get you out of a bind sometimes just to get rid of some noise and stuff like that. So that's what I would recommend. Um, and uh, it's up to you now. Cool. Um, Gary, if you could send later on, and I'll include it when I do the link list of all the external hardware, um, a, an example of these transformer devices you're talking about. That'd be great. Sure. Okay, cool. Thank you. All right. So, um, all right. I just realized it is almost noon. So we're supposed to be two hours with an hour of wiggle room in there. Um, and we haven't gotten into, we've like practically halfway through. So I'm going to hit the web presenter really quickly. That's the next part. And then we're going to get into the software stuff because that's, that's where it's, that's where the really cool stuff is um, that I want to go to next. So uh, let's see here. So, uh, slides. Here we go. So web presenter HD slash 4K is what's next. Um, all I'm going to do right now is just show you the interface for that. So, and explain what it basically is. And I'm going to do this by opening up the settings for this. Let me get it fired up and then I'll switch over to this screen. Um, oh, I already had it. There we go. And what just happened? Okay, I don't have no idea why this is white in the background, but that's okay. So this is the control panel for this, WebPresenter HD, and you can see that it's been streaming for two and a half hours. It's streaming to YouTube at about six megabit stream. If I go into this, you can see the settings of this. It's I can set my um, my size and bit rate, uh, sorry, size and frame rate, and set the quality on here. And I can actually change it while live if needed. And that's the key of the current YouTube stream. I probably shouldn't show that, but there you go. So 
all this is doing is a very, very simple device. It is the web encoder that is built into this in a standalone piece of hardware with its own inputs and outputs. It's not a switcher. It's got you know one input and then an output for monitoring, and I'm going to show you that in a second. But this allows you to take, you could take a single camera. If you just wanted to go live with one camera, no switching, you could plug one camera into that and off you go. It also can act as a webcam interface. So just like the ATEM has a USB out, plugs in your computer, and the computer sees the ATEM as a webcam. Same thing with the Stream Deck, um, sorry, with the, uh, the web presenter. It will, has a USB out that the camera uh, computer can see as a, as, as a webcam. It also has a USB input to connect to a mobile device, which is something we didn't talk about with the ATEMs, but you can do this with the ATEMs as well, where you can use a cellular connection to go live. Obviously, you know, you're at much higher risk of losing a connection that way, but you have it. Primarily, it's there for backup. So if I had a mission critical live event and I wanted to have a backup that was over cellular, I could plug that in and have it default over to the uh, just fail safe switch over to that, which is really, really cool. And you can do that in the in the ATEMs and you can do that in the web presenter as well. Um, the web presenter, one of the really cool things about it is it has this monitor that you can watch to see what's going on. So I have this queued up here. Oh, man. I swear, you know, I had all some, somehow I broke. Right before we went live, oops, let's definitely turn that off. There we go. I'm going to try one more time. Nope. Okay, I broke something. I'm sorry. I had this perfectly set up, and then I added something last minute this morning, and it really botched things, and I don't know what happened. But anyway, you get this great interface that shows you the status of your stream, the status of your audio, everything. Tons of data that's really, really cool to see. And I'm sorry that doesn't work. It's The reason this is complicated to show up is because it will show what is being streamed live, and I am using it right now to stream this show to YouTube. And so if I just bring it up normally, then the window of what's being streamed is that, and so you get the infinite mirror effect. And so I have a super source set up where it, where it overlays this video that you're looking at right now on top of it, and I broke something in my last minute scramble to add something else. So darn it. That's why you test everything before you go live, unlike me. Okay, so that's that. That's all I wanted to say about that. Really cool product. Um, now we're going to get into the last part of this, which is um, super fun. The BitFocus Companion. So Companion is the software. Elgato Stream Deck. That's the hardware. And we're also going to hit Mimo Live and Ultra Studio 4K Mini. That's the, the Ultra Studio is a black magic hardware. We're going to hit all of this at once because it's all kind of ties together in how I'm using it. So let me just start with a high level of what each of these four things are, and then we're going to head into the other room where I've got it all set up and we're going to play with it in there. So one at a time, the uh, BitFocus Companion. BitFocus is the company, Companion is the product. This is free open source software that allows you to control IP-based devices. Tons of different devices, and I'll show you the list. Yeah, I'll show you the list when we get in there. Um, tons of different devices, including the A10 Mini. So, or all the ATEMs. And there are a string of, of commands that are built into it. So what you do is you build in Companion a button, a action that does one thing or a whole series of things. And so you can have one button, just like on the ATEM that switches you know, to camera one, right? So basically this switching right now you're seeing is actually running through Companion. It is a single command, switch to camera B, switch to camera A, that's it. But because it's in the software companion, I can pull up those buttons on the Stream Deck. So the Stream Deck is the physical part of this separate product, separate company, Elgato Stream Deck. They make a um, little, little tiny one, and then this is the biggest one here. So let me go back to the overhead view. So this is the biggest one. And you can see that all these buttons are their little LED interfaces, so I, or LCD interfaces. So I can customize these to say whatever I want. You can even put pictures on them. I just didn't bother with this setup. You can even have pictures on them. Really neat. And that gives you that whole tactile feedback. So the companion app allows you to tie in all these commands together, kind of like macros, but it's a more visual interface. Now it doesn't do everything that you can do in the ATEM, so you often still need macros, but then you can combine them. So you can build a macro to do this and a macro to do that, and then build a command in companion that does this, this, and this, and then it calls up this macro, and then it does this and this, and then it calls up this macro, all stringed out. And you can add delays in there, so you can have it do something after a time. So one button can kick off a whole bunch of events. As an example, the most complex one that I have built for my regular live shows that I do, is um, I have it set up where one button to start the show and what it does, and I wait until my countdown goes to zero and the countdown at zero and I'm ready, I'm like, mm -mm, okay, ready to go. I hit the button. This will, 
so cool. <laughs> Starts recording in my HyperDeck, so it's controlling that. Hits record on the HyperDeck. Um, plays an animation through Mimo Live. We'll talk about that in a moment. It switches all the audio, so it um, it turns off the house audio. You know, before the show came on, there was house audio, just music playing, so that's playing during the countdown. So switches that off. It switches the audio to the animation that's playing. That animation is, I don't know, let's say 10 seconds or 15 seconds long, I think 10 seconds long. So it plays through that. As it gets towards the end of that, it fades up my microphone. So it doesn't just turn it on, it fades it up so there's no like harsh cut for the live audience. It fades up uh, my audio at the end of the animation, which is a 4444 animation with transparency. As that animation f whizzles out and does its thing on screen, you see me revealed behind it. So it has loaded me into screen in the meantime. And um, let's see here, what else? Uh, and then after like two seconds, it brings up this lower third. Yep, see, that, oh man, I'm really worried about what else I broke and it's not gonna work when I go in there. But it brings up a lower third that comes up and it has my name and brand on it. So all of this stuff is triggered with one button. It's really cool. And then at the end of the show, I have another one that ends the show. It goes to an end screen and stops the recording. So that's just an example of what you can do. So that's companion. The Stream Deck already mentioned physical hardware. Then there's Mimo Live. So Mimo Live is a very powerful, very robust app. It's Mac only that allows you to do all kinds of switching, overlays, graphics titles, um, picture in picture type layout. Think of it like uh, like OBS for those who know OBS. But OBS that's not open source is a you know company behind it that is quite a bit more powerful. It's um, MIMO stands for multiple in, multiple out. And the idea is that you can bring in multiple streams in from video sources, things that are on your computer that you play back, um, RTMP sources, whatever. You just bring all this stuff in, mix it up however you want, and then it can go out multiple ways. You can use it to stream directly to somewhere. You can feed a, a video feed to a, an ATEM, which is what I do. You can feed a video feed out to the Ultra Studio 4K Mini, which is also what I do. We're gonna look at all this uh, simultaneously. So it's the multiple outs. You have it go out wherever you want. So you can use it as a live stream production on its own, but when you combine that software with hardware, the ATEM, then you get the best of everything. And so this is the kind of best of both worlds scenario. You have all the reliability of the hardware, the quality of the hardware with the uh, flexibility of software. So you get the best of both combined together. And then finally, the last piece on that list is the Ultra Studio 4K Mini, which is an interface for the computer that has dual SDI outs. That's what I'm using it for. So that allows me to, just like we talked about earlier from the HyperDeck, playing out 4444 video, where I've got a video and an alpha. I can do that from the computer playing out, but I have to have those dual SDI outputs. So that 4K Mini gives me those dual SDI outputs. So in my setup, those dual SDI outputs are feeding into my big ATEM for all the switching. So. That, those are the four things. Let's go into the other room. I really hope that everything still works when I get in there, but here we go. We're going to switch over. And you stopped hearing me once I walked in because uh, once I hit the button because it switched microphones for me. So again, that was a switch that happens automatically. Uh, it happens when I hit that button, switch camera angles and switch the microphone. So here we are. Uh, give me a second here to rearrange some things on screen. Then I'm going to hit my screen share button and I have a feeling this is broken. <sighs> okay. I got to figure out what it is. So give me a second here. I'm just going to pull up my, my ATEM and figure out where this is broken. Why? How, where's this transparency coming from? Oh, pre-multiplied key. Nope. That wasn't it. Ah, there we go. Aha. <laughs> See, okay. This is a failure of... <laughs> Perfect. This is a failure of building enough things into the macro. So I had these macros set up before where I was using a DVE key for my upstream key. Then last minute, I added something that used a Luma key. And when, because I had last left it as a Luma key for that, I didn't have built into the macro to switch to the DVE key. And so that's why it broke. So that's why a bunch of things broke earlier. So which means I can probably now show you, I might even be able to do it from here. Um, go back to this view and then go to web presenter. Yes, there we go. So now that works. So let me just real quickly bring that back up. So this is the web presenter view that I wanted to show you earlier. Um, so this is what that looks like. So now you can see all the different pieces for that. So you get your, you can see the status of your cache. Um, you can see your data rate that's being transmitted and so on and so on. So uh, that's, it's awesome. This is great. Okay, let's go back over there. 
try not to break things again. Set that back, <laughs> turn that key off, uh, back to the office. Voila, here I am. Okay, so again, the importance of building a macro that has everything you need in it and obviously testing things before you go live. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go to the screen. Excellent. And um, let me just show you the desktop video hardware first, the Ultra Studio 4K Mini. This is the hardware that I was talking about that has the, um, the output. So this is, the, this is their own software that controls it. So you can see um, this is all the hardware that is currently connected to my Mac. So like I said, it's a Mac Pro. So this is a, a Thunderbolt device. And then I've got in here a, um, a DeckLink Mini monitor, which gives me a 4K HDR capable output. So I plug that into my reference monitor. And then I have another PCI card that has four HDMI inputs. So this allows me to feed video into my computer. And I think that's everything. Yep, it shows that's everything there. But this little guy right here has the dual SDI out. All right, and then behind there is Mimo, but we're gonna start with, um, we're gonna start with the companion. So let me find that web page. I know I have it set up in here. Oop, wrong browser. Where's Safari? Where's Safari? There it is. And too many things open. Let's get this, let me hide everything else. Hide everything else, there it is, and bring up that screen. Okay, so this is, this is Companion. So here's how this works. You have these things called instances. This is what connects to your hardware. So these are all the different pieces of hardware that are currently connected to Companion that I can control from here. So we've got you know the ATEM Mini, Mimo Live as an app is connected, my big ATEM 2ME, also, um, the XR16, which is my Behringer audio interface, the all six hyperdex my pearl which is another hardware live streaming thing um and then more minis so the, uh, more atoms there's a lot of atoms on the network here and if i go add by manufacturer you can see all the different companies that have products in here it's a ton of stuff in here um oh look elgato key light so if i oops if i go elgato where'd that go so if you have a key light or a ring light you can actually control that from here right i mean that's so cool um if I go into search, I can do, let's see, if I do like projector, Barco projectors, Christie projectors that are controlled, Panasonic projectors that are controllable in here. It's just wild. Go by category. And there's just a ton of stuff in here that can be controlled. There's certain microphones that you can control. It's just amazing. Uh, amazing. A bunch of AJA hardware, a bunch of stuff in here. So this is what this interface does. And it's open source. So you've got engineers who are kind of in their spare time, just for giggles, making new modules. And here's what's really cool. As an open source community, you go to the, um, uh, the GitHub page and you can request modules. If you have something you can request and if someone knows how, has the time, wants to, they'll do it. And if you need it, you can offer to pay. You know, people are like, hey, I'll, you know, it's worth a thousand bucks for me to have this thing. Someone will do it for you. So pretty cool setup. So that's the kind of base of it. Uh, now let's go in and look at some of these configurations. So this is currently set up, we're looking at the one that is actively running. So if I look at my buttons, these are the buttons that you saw on this, on my HyperDeck, right? So if I click any of these buttons here, it is going to actually do the switch. So um, I'll just do it. I'll go ahead and I'll switch. I'll hold down the shift key, it turns it into active mode. I'll hit A and, um, and it, oh, right. And I still have the US key, the key on. So there you go, I didn't have that manually set. So we'll switch back to this, <laughs> but um, this gives you there we go. This gives you the ability to control whatever you want in here. So here I can do it by software. This is the setup page. I'll get into how to set this up in a moment. So this is the setup page, but I can go over here to a web button version. It opens up a web browser version of this, or let me close that. There's also the mobile buttons, which is basically the same thing, but it's a slightly different feel to it that works better on a mobile interface. And so this is what you would have on an iPad or um, any touch-based you know, anything with a browser, basically. So you could load that up in there. It's just, it's just a URL, right? Go to web buttons. I just copy and paste that URL into any browser anywhere on the local network, and I have control. Um, and if you really wanted to get fancy, you could even set up a VPN and have somebody extra, oops. Um, there we go, and have somebody externally. Um, I just realized you were listening to me on the other mic, but you could hear me. The, sorry. Um, like I said yesterday, you could set up a VPN and have somebody outside of your network even controlling it through here as well if you wanted to. Wild. So let me just show you some of the setup in here because it is really, really cool. Uh, let's look at a very simple one. The switch to camera B. All it's doing, it's 
telling the ATM2ME to set the input on the program to camera B. So the way that I would do this, uh, if I wanted to delete it, I'll make a new one. So I go in here, add key down actions. So you see all the different commands in here. So you start typing to narrow it down. So I'll say um, program. And so there's the commands ATM2ME, set input on program. So I go on the 2ME, set the input on program. Oops, I missed. Set input on program on the 2ME, send input on program. There it is. Okay, brilliant. Now it's just breaking. Why does everything break in a demo? Refresh this, please. Back to the buttons, back to the B. Program, set input on program, 2ME. Okay, seriously, what is actually happening right now? You've got to be kidding me. Why is this not working? <laughs> seriously. <laughs> you know, you know, it's just how things are, right? And now I've broken that button. So let me refresh this again. Try one more time. That is so bizarre. If that doesn't work, I have a way around this. Program, set input on program, select it. Oh, for the love of, okay. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to delete that button. I'm going to copy button C over to here. And I'll rename that. That is my B, uh, oops, B tight. Is that what I called it? B tight. And then here's the program that should have been added. I don't know why it wasn't, I don't know why it wasn't adding. But then I go over here and I say, switch that to the right camera. So there's there's a very simple, that's all it does. I have no idea why this thing isn't working right now. Um, that adds it to it. Okay, so each one of these has that. So if I go to something that's a little bit more complex, like um, this Mac MultiView one. So this is running a macro from the ATM2ME. So I built a macro called Mac Plus Extreme that does a bunch of the layout. And then this one, let's see, atm ISO run macro. This is setting a second macro. Uh, oh, what's the multi-view output is. So I'm doing two things on two different ATEMs, on the ATEM2ME and the ATEM Mini Extreme simultaneously with this one button. So that's where these things all come in. So that's that's effectively at its core what it is. Um, if I, let's see here, if I load up the, give me a second here, I'm gonna, I'm on the other screen right now. I know you can't see what I'm doing. I'm going to launch the GUI for the other instance of this that's currently running. Here we go, let's bring this over here. And here's my, for my regular live shows. This is a different button set. I hit pre-show and this sets up my faders, turns off the audio on the mic, turns on the audio for the, the pre-show, the pre-roll, um, brings up a slide, cues some music. All of this stuff is happening with one button. And then here's the show open where it you know, turns off one of the keys. It uh, sets a different key on, it runs a macro. It sets up a cue, it cues up my video. Oh no, it sets up, it cues up a color for the um, uh, for the preview for part of the transition. It sets the transition style. So all of these things get done. There's the hyperdeck, um, it sets the format to H.264 and then it starts recording it with the name photo moment live. And then it'll append the date and time after that. It All of this stuff happens at once and it takes, you know, like a minute or something to run through the whole thing because it's playing a video and there's delays. So you delay millisecond delays, 100 millisecond delay. And then we down here, quarter of a second delay here, wait for a full second before executing, wait five seconds before executing wait seven seconds before executing, all these different pieces are in there with the delay. So this is this is awesome. And this layout right here that you're looking at, this is designed, so let me go back to the one that I'm actively on, here we go. Um, this is designed to go with the, the Stream Deck. So let me go to a blank one, totally blank page, there we go. So see the little gray boxes behind it? It's representational of, I think the smallest Stream Deck is just these number of eight buttons, I think that's right. And then that gray box represents another size. And then these, all of them represent another size. So depending on which stream deck you have, you just build your buttons into the right size in there. And as you saw, you have multiple pages in here. So you can, you can do that. So this is really, really, really awesome and powerful. Okay, so now let's talk about Mimo Live. Let me switch over to that and show how this is being integrated. And then you'll see how that all ties together. So this is Mimo. The, the method that I'm using to share the screen with you right now is actually through Mimo. So instead of <clears throat> out in the main studio, when I was sharing my screen, I had my Mac basically feeding directly into the switcher. Um, yeah, it's going from Thunderbolt into HDMI, and then it has to get converted to SDI because my SDI switcher, but it goes into the switcher as an input. And I that means that I have to mirror my screen to... Uh, well, either I can two choices. I can mirror my screen 
which means I have to set my screen resolution on my Mac that I'm looking at at 1920 by 1080. And you might have noticed that there's times where I'm like you know, looking in close because it's a really small MacBook Air screen. And at that resolution, it's kind of hard to see some things. Or I can set up as dual screen layout, right? And then that screen can be whatever it wants, but the ATEM has to be 1920 by 1080, right? it has to be. When I'm streaming, when I'm using Mimo to share, it'll take whatever I want at whatever size I want and scale it to output over the, over using the, um, using the, uh, we'll go back here, using the Ultra Studio, it'll scale it to whatever resolution I've set on the Ultra Studio, which is currently 1080p. So it'll scale. So I can tell it to share this whole screen or share part of the screen or whatever and scale it however I want to. So that's the inputs. Um, Actually, I guess we should go through. Let me start at the end here and then I'll go back. Starting at the end here is the outputs. <clears throat> excuse me. At the outputs, we have output destinations. So a Mimo call, I can send this out. It's a lot of different things. But anyway, here's the one I want to show you. Here's sending out to the Ultra Studio 4K. And you see it's currently on air. It's red. If I wanted to add another A10 piece of hardware, I go in here or another Blackmagic hardware. There's a whole category of Blackmagic design hardware. I select that. And then on the video, on sorry, on the device output, I can choose where it's going to send the video. And then what is it going to send? Is it going to send the program out or is it going to send a dedicated one of the other layouts or stacks that I have set up in here? I can send anything that I want out to that. So I can have multiple video interfaces. Let's say, so I showed you the, let me see here, go back to this for a second. I showed you this card, right? This is for HDMI inputs. Blackmagic makes one of these that is for HDMI outputs. I'm actually really considering putting one in here because it would just be fun. But then back over here in Mimo. I would have access to each one of those outputs and I could send any separate video out any one of those outputs, even simultaneously. It's really, really powerful stuff. Okay, so let me get rid of this thing before I forget what I've done and mess something up. So I am currently outputting to the Ultra Studio. It is outputting uh, the video format. I have to set that right to match the ATEM 1080p 2398. And then there's the keying mode. So I've set the key to what's called external. And that means that the software is going to send a separate key channel out over the Ultra Studio so that both the video and the key get sent to the ATEM. Okay, so that's the kind of back end of how it works. Now we're actually going to set something up and that'll be the final part of, of this demo. So let me go back to this. Um, in here, you'll see there's all these different video sources. Where do I want video to come in from? I can bring it in from the ATEM. Um, I think there's that Inogeny that I talked about, right? I've got that coming in as a separate as a separate input for various things. I can bring in iPads and iPhones directly. So all that I can bring into here. So that's cool. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, Mimo Caller is just a way to bring in live callers over the internet. Um, desktop capture, this is what you're actually looking at right now. So there's my BenQ screen right here. So this is how you're seeing my screen. It's this output. And um, there's a bunch of other stuff in here, but I have this one here, a video to play. This is the one we're going to play with. So this is a little subscribe animation that I've loaded in. It's just a little 4444 graphics file. So now let's add this to the show. So there's there's multiple steps to get this involved. So this is the source. Then I have these things here called layer stacks. A layer stack could be all kinds of different things. This is what will actually get sent to air. So this is just the media. Nobody can see this yet until I add it to this stack here. And what, depending on what type of media it is, I choose the layer stack. And you know I can generate things from here. I can generate clocks and I can generate, um, I don't know, scores. If you're doing scores, you can generate all kinds of stuff. But in this case, all I need is this video to come in. So I'm just going to add this to the bottom of the stack in here. Um, there we go. Add it to the bottom of the stack. And I'm going to rename this. It's just called a placer. I'm going to call this my sub button. And this is now playing up here. Now we can see what this looks like up here. So this, if I click live right now, we're not going to see anything because it is under my current desktop stack. So let's actually move it to the top of that. I'm going to scroll all the way to the top, move it to the top. Now, if I hit live, we should see it. There you go. You see the animation flying in. So that's the what you saw on top of that was the actual animation. So once again, there's that animation coming in. Okay, so now I, will, I don't want it just sitting there. It's kind of a weird place for it. So let's position it. So I go down here to geometry. It's set to full screen, but I'll go to custom. And now I can just go in here. I can drag this and I can scale it. Let's make it a little bit smaller. Set it off to the side in there. Okay, let's preview that again. And there's that animation coming in. Okay, so now I've got this set up. If I'm just doing a live show and I want to have a, a keyboard shortcut, forget about the um, um, forget about using companion for a moment. I'm just using this. I want to set up a keyboard shortcut to trigger that. I go down here to triggers, layer, um, 
type in a shortcut. Okay, so to try try that up, I'm gonna do I don't know uh, Control Shift uh, S for subscribe. Okay, so I just said that keyboard shortcut. Now I hit Control Shift S and that triggered it, and there it goes. So you saw it come in. Okay, so that's one way to do it. However, let me get rid of that so I don't mess it up. What I if I want to include this in a companion setup, then I go to this next level of setting up a layer set. Now you can think of a layer set almost like a macro or almost like a companion series of events, a layer set can activate and deactivate multiple layers at once. And so if I want to have a layer set that turns on this background video, turns on that animation, this sound, whatever, I build that as a layer set. So it's one click to do that. So what I do here is I go in and I add a new layer set and creates at the bottom. We're going to call this um, sub layer and I open this up and it shows me everything, every single layer stack is showing up in here. Now, as I said, it can do, it can either, well, for each layer, it can either do nothing, no action. It can bring that layer live. It can set that layer off or if it can do what's called a force off. The difference there is if you, for a lot of layers, you can have the off command have an animation. So like when I turn it on, it comes into screen and then I turn it off, it goes out of screen. So if I, use as part of the layer command off, then when I hit it, it'll do, 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 do out of screen. But I can also enable force off, which means no matter where it is, it just immediately disappears. It's just immediately off. There's no animation. It ignores the animation, it just cuts it off. So you can go either way. Um, all right. So what I want is I don't want it to do anything for, well, I'm sorry, I want it to make it live for the sub button, but then I don't want it to do anything to anything else. So I'll just hit no action for everything else. For this particular thing, the sub button, all I want it to do is activate that sub button. Okay, so now you're thinking, well, hold on, why do this? If you're, why build a layer set that does one thing that I could do up here? Well, here's why. Is if I right click on these little three buttons, there's this thing here, it says copy layer sets API endpoint to the clipboard. This now allows me to integrate this into, my browser back up, into companion, which totally failed to work for us earlier. So we're gonna see if it, if it breaks. And if it doesn't, I've already got one. If it does break, I've already got one set up. So let's go here and create a new button. Set button type, regular button. We're going to call this sub. And the action is going to be a get command from Mimo Live. And it's totally not doing it. I cannot for the life of me imagine why this isn't working. But it would create a get command from Mimo Live. And then I paste that URL into this. So that's what the URL looks like. Here's the kind of gnarly part of this. You have to type slash recall at the end of it. I you'd think the integration would be better. It isn't. So you literally have to physically type slash recall at the end of that command for it to do. Effectively, what this is doing, you notice that this says this is a, um, this is just an, an, a URL. It's just a website, right? It's all it is, but it's not a website. It's an API command. And this call is calling Memo Live. And this recall is the final command that says do it, I guess. So this command right here will trigger the animation. This command right here is part of the button will turn on the upstream key that is needed to make that animation be visible. So wait a minute, what's going on here? Well, remember, right now when you see it, you're seeing it through the MIMO interface, right? You're seeing it on here. And the only reason that you can actually see it on your screen where you're sitting right now is because I'm sharing this screen through MIMO as a, um, through, sorry, through the Ultra Studio, which is then showing up in the ATEM as an upstream key. When I, if I hit this button right now, you go away. See, gone. Hit it again, and you're back. So this has to be turned on for that animation to come up. So to make sure that it actually works, I make sure that it actually turns it on. So let's go back to the right page. Here we go. So I make sure that it actually turns it on. So now if I hit test button here, we should see, yeah, of course, and now you know, I broke something. So <laughs> but you should see that come on to play and it should play up on top of that. I don't have no idea why I broke it, but something I broke is breaking it. So that is effectively how that would work. So let me see, did I, that works there. Oh, duh, because I deleted, <laughs> I deleted the one that was here. That's why it wasn't working. So let me copy that API endpoint, go back to here, go to the one that does work. Let's put in the new API endpoint. So everything minus the recall, there it is. And now, oops, now when I hit test, voila, there it is. And now it works. So that's how that all ties together, which is crazy. It's a huge amount of stuff to tie together, but it is so 
powerful when you get all this sorted out. It is there's so much that you can do in here. All right, let me go back out to the other room. I'll be right back with you. Okay, that's that. I could spend a week showing you Mimo Live. There's so much you can do in there, integrating with the ATEM through the Blackmagic hardware. It's just an incredible, incredible setup immense flexibility and power embedded in that thing. And when you start putting all these pieces together, it's just wild what you can do. So that's the stuff that I wanted to show you. I would love to show you a lot more in there, but um, you know, at some point I gotta go eat lunch. So let's see if there's any final questions and then we're gonna wrap this thing up and call it a day or a day and a half or whatever it has been. Um, Gary, where are we? How, oops, I'm waiting for my switcher to come back. There we go. There it is. Gary, how are we doing? Any questions that came up? So um, uh, I, we're pretty clear with questions. I'm just typing a couple of things. Um, hold the stream on uh, for a little bit after you uh, after you close it, just uh, so I can finish um, finish up here. Otherwise, it goes away. Um, but yeah, there aren't any more questions that I can see. Um, the uh, uh, couple of um, really good uh, contributions uh, from some of the the viewers have listed some links for the. Uh, uh, isolation devices and things like that. So there's been a lot of contribution in here that's uh, pretty useful. I hope people have been taking note of that. Awesome, please make sure you send all those to me because I'm not, I'm not looking at the chat stream so I won't see any of that. Now hold the, um, uh, you can do your close. Can you hold the stream on long for a little bit so, yeah. so I can start, you know, kind of cutting of stuff off because otherwise yeah, absolutely. it's gone. Okay, cool. We'll do that. All right, folks. So um, you heard the man. We will. I'm going to leave the Zoom call open just on my end screen for a while here, so that he can answer your questions. And um, and then I guess I'll give. He has the power to shut it down, so I'll let him shut it down when it's done. The YouTube stream will go away as soon as I go off the air here. Um, thank you, everybody, for attending. I hope this was fun and awesome and educational and informational and all that good stuff. This is. It's been a rock in two days. There's so much that we've covered, and it's as with everything. I'm just scratching the surface. So. Uh, just to remind you yet again, I'm, I have a YouTube channel where I have a bunch of videos on, on this stuff. I've done a ton of ATEM videos in the past, and I have a series, an ongoing series called ATEM Mini Tips. Kind of a play on words there, but it's little ATEM Mini Tips dedicated to the ATEM Mini and its surrounding hardware. And each new video is just some other little particular tip in there. Um, if there's ever a tip that you want, you're like, how do I do this? Ask me in a comment there and I'll add it to my list of tips that I will, I will do. I've got a massive list of them to do. I just wish I had more time in the day and the week and the month and the year to do more of these. But, um, you know, there's only one of me here, so I do what I can. Uh, thanks again, everybody, for attending. This video will be re-uploaded to YouTube, to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash photojoseph, later in the, or next week. And, um, and yeah, that's the plan. I guess that's everything. So if any questions that you didn't get answered, Gary's going to stick around and try and do those via text for you. And... Um, Anything you think about afterwards, go ahead and drop it into one of the comments on my YouTube videos, or feel free to, to hit me up on Twitter as well. Just you know, publicly post a question on Twitter, Photo Joseph on Twitter, and um, I'll do my best to get to you. I guess that's it. Okay, hey guys, thanks again. This was super awesome. I hope you had as much fun as I did. I'm signing off. I'm gonna go eat lunch. Gary's gonna answer your questions. We'll see you later. Bye bye. I'm gonna find my page where I put the end thing. Here it is, end screen. Bye.